Preface of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kath Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Preface. The first edition of this book appeared in 1905. That edition is exhausted, an evidence of the great present-day interest in the woman's rights movement. This new edition takes into account the developments since 1905, contains the recent statistical data, and gives an account of the woman's suffrage movement, which has been especially characteristic of these later years. Wherever the statistical data have been left unchanged, either there have been no new censuses or the new results were not available. The facts contained in this volume do not require of me any prefatory observations on the theoretical justifications of the woman's rights movement. From the remotest time man has tried to rule her, who ought to be comrade and colleague to him. By virtue of the law of might, he generally succeeded. Every protest against this law of might was a woman's rights movement. History contains many such protests. The modern woman's rights movement is the first organized and international protest of this kind. Therefore, it is a movement full of success and promise. Leadership in this movement has fallen to the women of the Caucasian race, among whom the women of the United States have been foremost. At their instigation were formed the World's Christian Temperance Union, the International Council of Women, and the International Woman's Suffrage Alliance. In many lands, even in those inhabited by the white race, there are, however, only very feeble beginnings of the woman's rights movement. In the Orient, the Far East, and in Africa, woman's condition of bondage is still almost entirely unbroken. Nevertheless, in these regions of the world, too, woman's day is dawning in such a way that we look for developments more confidently than ever before. In all countries, the woman's rights movement originated with the middle classes. This is a purely historical fact, which in itself in no way implies any antagonism between the woman's rights movement and the working women's movement. There is no such antagonism either in Australia or in England or in the United States. On the contrary, the middle class and non-middle class movements are sharply separated in those countries, whose social democracy uses class hatred as propaganda. Whether the woman's rights movement is also a working women's movement, or whether the working women's movement is also a woman's rights movement or socialism, depends therefore in every particular case on national and historical circumstances. The international organization of the woman's rights movement is as follows. The International Council of Women consists of the presiding officers of the various national councils of women. Of these latter, there are today 27, but the Servian League of Women's Clubs has not yet joined. To a national council may belong all those women's clubs of a country which unite in carrying out a general program. The programs as well as the organizations are national in their nature but they all agree in their general characteristics, since the woman's rights movement is indeed an international movement and arose in all countries from the same general conditions. The first national council was organized in the United States in 1888. This was followed by organizations in Canada, Germany, Sweden, England, Denmark, the Netherlands, Australia, with five councils, Switzerland, Italy, France, Austria, Norway, Hungary, etc. As yet, there are no statistics of the women represented in the International Council. Its membership is estimated at seven or eight millions. The National Council admits only clubs, not individuals. The chairman of the various national councils forming the International Council of Women, solely in their capacity of presiding officers. This International Council of Women is the permanent body promoting the organized international women's rights movement. It was organized in Washington in 1888. 
the woman's suffrage movement a separate phase of the woman's rights movement has likewise organized itself internationally though independently woman's suffrage is the most radical demand made by organized women and is hence advocated in all countries by the radical woman's rights advocates the greater part of the membership of the national councils have therefore not been able in all cases to insert woman's suffrage in their programs the international council did sanction this point however june ninth nineteen o four in berlin a few days previously there had been organized as the international woman's suffrage alliance likewise in berlin women's suffrage leagues representing eight different countries the leagues which joined the alliance represented the united states victoria england germany sweden norway denmark and the netherlands since then the woman's suffrage movement has been the most flourishing part of the woman's rights movement the international woman's suffrage alliance which was pledged to hold a second congress only at the end of five years has already held three congresses between 1905 and 1909 1906 copenhagen 1908 amsterdam 1909 london and has extended its membership to 21 countries the united states australia south africa canada great britain germany sweden norway denmark the netherlands finland russia hungary austria bulgaria italy switzerland france belgium serbia and iceland the first president is mrs carrie chapman Catt. the chief demands of the women's rights movements are the same in all countries these demands are four in number one in the field of education and instruction to enjoy the same educational opportunities as those of man two in the field of labor freedom to choose any occupation and equal pay for the same work three in the field of civil law the wife should be given the full status of a legal person before the law and full civil ability in criminal law the repeal of all regulations discriminating against women the legal responsibility of man in sexual matters in public law woman's suffrage four in the social field recognition of the high value of woman's domestic and social work and the incompleteness harshness and one-sidedness of every circle of man's activity monervelt from which woman is excluded a just and happy relationship of the sexes is dependent upon mutuality coordination and the complementary relations of man and woman not upon the subordination of woman and the predominance of man woman in her peculiar sphere is entirely the equal of man in his the origin of the international woman's rights movement is found in the worldwide disregard of this elementary truth the subject which i have treated in this book is a very broad one the material much scattered and daily changing it is therefore hardly possible that my statements should not have deficiencies on the one hand and errors on the other i shall indeed welcome any corrections and authoritative information of a supplementary nature the authoress paris june third nineteen o nine end of preface section one of the modern woman's rights movement this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Johnsrud. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kata Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Chapter 1. The Germanic Countries. The woman's rights movement is more strongly organized and has penetrated society more thoroughly in all the Germanic countries than in the Romance countries. There are many causes for this. Women's greater freedom of activity in the Germanic countries, the predominance of the Protestant religion, which does not oppose the demands of the woman's rights movement with the same united organization as does the Catholic Church the more vigorous training in self-reliance and responsibility, which is customarily given to women in Germanic Protestant countries, 
the more significant superiority in numbers of women in Germanic countries, which has forced women to adopt business or professional callings other than domestic. Their inferiority in numbers in Australia and in the western states of the United States has, however, often served their cause in just the same way. The women's rights movement in the Germanic Protestant countries has been promoted by moral and economic factors. End of section 1. Section 2 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Johnsrud. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Keita Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. The United States of America, Part 1. The United States of America. Total population, 91,972,267. Women, about 45 million. Men, about 47 million. The General Federation of Women's Clubs. The National American Women's Suffrage Association. North America is the cradle of the women's rights movement. It was the War of Independence of the Colonies Against England, 1774 to 1783, that matured the women's rights movement. In the name of freedom, our cause entered the history of the world. In these troubled times, the American women had by energetic activities and unyielding suffering entirely fulfilled their duty as citizens, and at the convention in Philadelphia in 1787, they demanded as citizens the right to vote. The Constitution of the United States was being drawn up at the time, and by 1789 had been ratified by the 13 states then existing. In nine of these states, Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia, Maryland, New Jersey, North and South Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, the right to vote in municipal and state affairs had hitherto been exercised by all freeborn citizens or all taxpayers and heads of family, the state constitutions being based on the principle, no taxation without representation. Among these freeborn citizens, taxpayers, and heads of families, there were naturally many women who were consequently both voters and active citizens. So women's right to vote in the above-named states were practically established before 1783. Only the states of Virginia and New York had restricted the suffrage to males in 1699 and 1777. Massachusetts and New Hampshire following their example in 1780 and 1784. In view of this retrograde movement, American women attempted at the convention in Philadelphia to secure a recognition of their civil rights through the constitution of the whole Federation of States. But the convention refused this request. Just as before, it left the conditions of suffrage to be determined by the individual states. To be sure, in the draft of the Constitution, the Convention in no way opposed woman's suffrage. But the nine states, which formerly as colonies had practically given women the right to vote, had in the meantime abrogated this right through the insertion of the word man in their election laws, and the first attempt of the American women to secure an expressed constitutional recognition of their rights as citizens failed. These proceedings gave to the women's rights movement of the United States a political character from the very beginning. Since then, the American women have labored untiringly for their political emancipation. The anti-slavery movement gave them an excellent opportunity to participate in public affairs. Since the women had had experience of oppression and slavery, and since they, like Negroes, were struggling for the recognition of their human rights, they were amongst the most zealous opponents of slavery and belonged to the most enthusiastic defenders of freedom and justice. Among the Quakers, who played a very prominent part in the anti-slavery movement, 
man and woman have the same rights in all respects in the home and church. When the first anti-slavery society was formed in Boston in 1832, 12 women immediately became members. The principle of the equality of the sexes, which the Quakers held, was opposed by the majority of the population, who held to the Puritanic principle of woman's subordination to man. In consequence of this principle, it was at the time considered monstrous that a woman should speak from a public platform. Against Abby Kelly, who at the time was one of the best anti-slavery speakers, a sermon was preached from the pulpit from the text, This Jezebel has come into the midst of us. She was called a hyena. It was related that she had been intoxicated in a saloon, etc., when her political associate, Angelina Grimke, held an anti-slavery meeting in Pennsylvania Hall, Philadelphia, in 1837, the hall was set on fire. And in 1838, in the chamber of the House of Representatives in Massachusetts, a mob threatened to take her life. The mob howled, the press hissed, and the pulpit thundered. Thus the proceedings were described by Lucy Stone, the woman's rights advocate. Even the educated classes shared the prejudice against woman. To them, she was a human being of the second order. The following is an illustration of this. In 1840, Abby Kelly was elected to a committee. She was urged, however, to decline the election. If you regard me as incompetent, then I shall leave. Oh no, not exactly that, was the answer. Well, what is it then? But you are a woman. That is no reason. Therefore, I remain. In the same year, an anti-slavery congress was held in England. A number of American champions of the cause went to London, among them three women, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Elizabeth Peace. They were accompanied by their husbands and came as delegates of the National Anti-Slavery Society. Since the Congress was dominated by the English clergy, who persisted in their belief in the inferiority of woman, the three American women, being creatures without political rights, were not permitted to perform their duties as delegates, but were directed to leave the convention hall and to occupy places in the spectators' gallery. But the noble William Lloyd Garrison silently registered a protest by sitting with the women in the gallery. This procedure clearly indicated to the American women what their next duty should be, and once when Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton came from the gallery to the hotel, Mrs. Stanton said, The first thing with which we must do upon our return is to call a convention to discuss the slavery of women. This plan, however, was not executed till eight years later. At the time, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, on the occasion of a visit from Lucretia Mott, summoned a number of acquaintances to her home in Seneca Falls, New York. In giving an account of the meeting at Washington in 1888 at the Conference of Pioneers of the International Council of Women, see Report, pages 323-324, she states that she and Lucretia Mott had drawn up the grievances of women under 18 headings with the American Declaration of Independence as a model, and that it was her wish to submit a suffrage resolution to the meeting, but that Lucretia Mott herself refused to have it presented. Nevertheless, in the meeting, Elizabeth Cady Stanton herself, burning with enthusiasm, introduced her resolution concerning women's right to vote, and as she reports, the resolution was adopted unanimously. A few days later, the newspaper reports appeared. There was, relates Elizabeth Cady Stanton, not a single paper from Maine to Louisiana which did not contain our Declaration of Independence and present the matter as ludicrous. My good father came from New York on the night train to see whether I had lost my mind. I was overwhelmed with ridicule. A great number of women who signed the Declaration withdrew their signatures. I felt very much humiliated, so much the more since I knew that I was right. For all that, I should probably have allowed myself to be subdued if I had not soon afterward met Susan B. Anthony, whom we call the Napoleon of our women's suffrage movement. Susan B. Anthony, the brave old lady who in spite of her 83 years did not dread the long journey from the United States to Berlin, and in June 1904 attended the meetings of the International Council of Women and the International Woman's Suffrage Alliance, 
was in her early life a teacher in Rochester, New York, and participated in the temperance movement. She had assisted in securing 28,000 signatures to a petition, providing for the regulation of the sale of alcohol, which was presented to the New York State Legislature. Susan B. Anthony was in the gallery during the discussion of the petition, and she saw how one speaker scornfully threw the petition to the floor and exclaimed, "'Who is it that demands such laws? They are only women and children!' She vowed to herself that she would not rest content until a woman's signature to a petition should have the same weight as that of a man. And she faithfully kept her word. After a life of unceasing and unselfish work, Susan B. Anthony died March 13, 1906, loved and esteemed by all who knew her. At the commemoration service in 1907, $24,000 was subscribed for the Susan B. Anthony Memorial Fund to be used for women's suffrage propaganda. Susan B. Anthony was Honorary President of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. It is to be noted that a number of European women, such as Ernestine Rose of Westphalia, imbued with the ideas of the February Revolution of 1848, were compelled to seek new homes in America. These newcomers gave an impetus to the women's suffrage movement among American women. They were greatly surprised to find that in republics also political freedom was withheld from women. This was strikingly impressed upon the women of the United States in 1870. At that time, the Negroes, who had been emancipated in 1863, were given political rights throughout the Union by the addition of the 15th Amendment to the Federal Constitution. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In this way, all power of the individual states to abridge the political rights of the Negro was taken away. The American women felt very keenly that in the eyes of their legislators, a member of an inferior race if only a man, should be ranked superior to any woman, be she ever so highly educated. And they expressed their indignation in a picture portraying the American woman and her political associates. This represented the Indian, the idiot, the lunatic, the criminal, and woman. In the United States, they are all without political rights. Since 1848, an energetic suffrage movement has been carried on by the American women, Today, there is a woman's suffrage society in every state, and all these organizations belong to a National Woman's Suffrage League. In recent years, there has arisen a vigorous woman's suffrage movement within the numerous and influential women's clubs, with almost a million members, and among college women, the College Equal Suffrage League, the movement extending even into the secondary schools. The National Trades Union League, the American Federation of Labor, and 19 state federations of labor have declared themselves in favor of women's suffrage. The leaders of the movement have now established the fact that the Constitution of the United States does not contain a word or a line which, if interpreted in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, denies women the right to vote in state and national elections. The preamble to the Constitution of the United States reads as follows. We, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Women are doubtlessly people. All the articles of the Constitution repeat this expression. The objects of the Constitution are 1. The establishment of a more perfect union of the states among themselves. 2. The establishment of justice. 3. The insurance of domestic tranquility. 4. The provision of common defense. 5. The promotion of the general welfare. 6. The securing of the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. All of these six points concern and interest women as much as men. Supplementary to this is the Declaration of Independence. Here are stated as self-evident truths. 1. That all men are created equal. 2. That they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Three, that to secure, not to grant, these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. On this last passage, the Americans comment with a special emphasis. They say their right to vote is their right as human beings. They possess it as a natural right. The government cannot justly take it from them, cannot even grant it to them justly. So long as the government does not ask the women for their consent, it is acting illegally according to the Declaration of Independence, for it is nowhere stated that the consent of one half, the male half, will suffice to make a government legal. On the basis of this Declaration of Principles, the American women have made it a point to oppose every individual argument against women's suffrage. For this purpose, they frequently use small four-page pamphlets which are issued as the Political Equality Series by the American Women's Suffrage Association. They say, It is generally held that, 1. Every woman is married, loved, and provided for. 2. Every man stays at home every evening. Three, every woman has small children. Four, all women, when they have once secured political rights, will plunge into politics and neglect their households. What is the exact state of affairs in these matters? One, a great many women are not married. Many are widows who must educate their children and seek a means of livelihood. Thousands have no other home than the one they create for themselves, and they must often support relatives in addition to themselves. Many of the married women are neither loved, provided for, nor protected. 2. Many men are at home so seldom in the evening that their wives could quietly concern themselves with political matters without being missed at all. And such men, seconded by bachelors, clamor most about the disillusion of the family through politics. 3. The children do not remain small indefinitely. They grow up and hence leave their mother. It may be true that the mother, instead of participating in political affairs, prefers to sew flannel shirts for the heathen or prefers to read novels. But one ought at least to permit her the freedom of making the choice. 4. The right to vote will not change the nature of woman. If she wished to leave the home as her sphere of activity, she would have found other opportunities long ago. Further fears are the following. 1. The majority of women do not wish the right to vote at all. To this we must answer that we cannot yet come to a conclusion concerning the wish of the majority in this respect. The petitions for women's suffrage always have a greater number of signatures than any other petitions to Congress. Two, women will use the right to vote only to a limited extent. The statistics in Wyoming and Colorado prove the contrary. Three, only women of ill repute will vote. Thus far, this has been nowhere the case. The men guard against attracting these elements. Moreover, the right to vote is not restricted to the men of good repute either, etc., etc. The American women can obtain the political franchise by two methods. One, at the hands of every individual legislature, which would occasion 52 separate legislative acts, 48 states and four territories. Two, through the adoption of a 16th Amendment to the National Constitution by Congress, composed of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Let us consider the first method. The franchise qualifications in the United States are generally the following. Male sex, 21 years of age, American citizenship through birth or by naturalization after five years residence. Amendments to the state constitution must be accepted by the state legislature, consisting of the lower house and the Senate, in many states by two consecutive legislatures, and then be accepted in a referendum vote by the male electorate. To secure the adoption of such an amendment in a state legislature is no easy task. In the first place, the presentation of a woman's suffrage bill is not received favorably. The Republicans and Democrats struggle for control of the legislature, the majority one way or the other never being large. 
Therefore, the party leaders usually consider women's suffrage not on the basis of party politics. Matters are decided on the basis of opportuneness. Especially is this the case in those states where the bill must be passed by two successive legislatures. In this case, between the time of the first passing of a bill and the referendum, there is a new election, and the opponents of woman suffrage can defeat the adherents of the measure at the polls before the women themselves can exercise the right of suffrage. Changing the national constitution through the adoption of a 16th Amendment has difficulties equally great. The amendment must pass the House of Representatives and the Senate by a two-thirds vote and then be ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures or specially called conventions. To the present time, only two of the presidents of the Union have publicly expressed themselves in favor of women's suffrage, Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt. In 1836, Lincoln addressed an open letter to the voters in New Salem, Illinois, in which he said, I go for all sharing the privileges of the government who assist in bearing its burdens. And he was in favor of admitting all whites to the right of suffrage who pay taxes or bear arms, by no means excluding females. Garfield, Hayes, and Cleveland gave their attention to the question of woman's suffrage, the last two supporting motions in favor of the movement. Theodore Roosevelt, in 1899, as Assemblyman in the New York State Legislature, spoke in favor of woman's suffrage. I call the attention of the Assembly to the advantages which a general extension of woman's right to vote must bring about. In order to attain their end, political emancipation, the American women use the following means of agitation, petitions, the submission of legislative bills, meetings, demonstrations, the distribution of pamphlets, deputations to the legislatures of the individual states and to the Congressional House of Representatives, the organization of working women, requests to teachers and preachers to comment on patriotic memorial days on woman's worth and to preach at least once during the year in favor of woman's suffrage. To the present time, four states of the Union have granted full municipal and political suffrage to women, active suffrage, the right to vote, passive suffrage, eligibility to office. The states in question are Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho. Wyoming and Utah inaugurated women's suffrage in 1869 and 1870, respectively, when they were still territories, and in 1890 and 1895, when they were given statehood, they retained women's suffrage. Colorado granted it in 1893 and Idaho in 1896. The political emancipation of women in the state of Washington is close at hand. Footnote. On November 8, 1910, an amendment providing for women's suffrage was adopted by the voters of Washington. End footnote. In South Dakota, Oregon. Footnote. On November 8, 1910, both South Dakota and Oregon rejected amendments providing for women's suffrage. End footnote. And Nebraska, it seems assured. In Kansas, since 1887, women have possessed active and passive suffrage in municipal elections. In the state of Illinois, they are about to secure it. Footnote. In October 1911, California adopted women's suffrage by popular vote. End footnote. All of these are Western states, with a new civilization and a numerical superiority of men. Practical experience with women's suffrage shows the following. Everywhere the elections have become quieter and more respectable. The wages and salaries of women have been generally raised, partly through the enactment of laws such as laws regulating the salaries of women teachers, etc., partly through the better professional and industrial organization of working women who are now trained in political affairs. A comparison of the salaries of women teachers having women's suffrage with salaries in states not having women's suffrage shows the value of the ballot. The public finances have been more economically administered, intemperance and immorality have been more energetically combated, 
candidates with immoral records have been removed from the political arena. Inasmuch as women have full political rights in the four states named, six including Washington and California, they also vote for presidential electors and thus exercise an influence in the national presidential elections. It is the woman with good average abilities that is most frequently the successful candidate in political campaigns. But as yet, the number of women who devote themselves to a political life is not large. The women in Colorado seem to have a special ability for this. Without any consideration for party affiliations, they secured the re-election of Judge Lindsay of the Juvenile Court. Generally speaking, they have devoted their efforts everywhere to the protection of youth. At the present time, the establishment of a special bureau for the protection of youth is being advocated, and a national conference to discuss the welfare of children is to be held in Washington, D.C. Footnote. This conference on the care of dependent children was called by President Roosevelt and met January 25th and 26th, 1909, in the White House. 220 men and women, experts in the care of children from every state in the Union, met and proposed, among other things, the establishment of a federal children's bureau. Thus far, the Congress has done nothing to carry out the proposal. End footnote. Because the English anti-woman suffrage advocate Mrs. Humphrey Ward expressed the familiar fear that the immoral vote would drown the moral vote, the Reverend Anna Shaw declared at the Women's Suffrage Congress at London, May 1909, that she openly challenges Mrs. Humphrey Ward to produce one convincing proof for her assertion. She herself had carefully investigated the recent elections in Denver, Colorado, to ascertain how many, if any, of the immoral women voted, and received as answer that these women, who naturally are in a minority, generally do not vote at all. First, because they pursue their trade under false names. Secondly, because most of them are not permanently domiciled, and for both reasons are not entered in the voting lists. These women vote only when an influence is exerted on them from above or by persons around them. In the state of Utah, where women's suffrage has existed since 1870, the women have quietly begun and continued without a break the exercise of that power which from the remotest time had been their right. They have concerned themselves with political and economic questions, and if they have committed any errors, these have not yet come to light. They have been delegates to county and state conventions, they have represented the richest and most populous electoral districts in the state legislature, and they serve as heads of various state departments, state treasurer, supervisor of the poor, superintendent of education, etc. In Colorado, with women's suffrage since 1893, the women have organized clubs in all cities, even in the lonely mining towns. Colorado is in the Rocky Mountains and have informed themselves in political affairs to the best of their ability. In the capital city, Denver, a club has been formed in which busy women can meet weekly to inform themselves on political affairs. In Colorado, parental authority over children prevails now, in place of the exclusively paternal. In Idaho, with women's suffrage since 1896, the women voters exerted a strong influence against gambling. The enfranchised women, who had a right to vote in the little town of Caldwell, had supported a mayor who was determined to take measures against gambling. The barkeepers, toppers, gamblers, and ne'er-do-wells were against him. The women presented the magistrate with a petition, which was read together with the signatures. During the reading of the names of the unobtrusive housewives who were rarely seen beyond their own thresholds, the countenances of the men became serious. For the first time, they seemed to grasp what it really meant for a city to have woman's suffrage. The barkeepers and the gamblers got the worst of it and disappeared from the town hall. An old municipal judge said, When have our mothers ever demanded anything before? Footnote. The mothers hold special congress in the United States to discuss educational and public questions. Mothers' congresses. End footnote. 
In the same way, the women of Kansas have employed their municipal suffrage since 1887. Concerning an election in which women voted, the women's rights movement reports the following. Almost all the women, about one-third of the population in Wyoming, voted. 7,000 votes of 23,000. In Boise, Idaho, it was one of the quietest election days in the annals of the city. Everywhere, the women came to the polls in the early part of the day. In Salt Lake City, Utah, there was no interruption of traffic, no disturbance of any kind. The women came alone without having their husbands accompany them to the ballot box during the noon hour. Because of the unsatisfactory experiences which America has had with universal suffrage, here universal male suffrage is meant, as such, the women's rights movement had suffered also and has been retarded, but owing to the proceedings of the English suffragettes during the past three years, it has been given a new impetus. In the state legislatures throughout the various parts of the country, legislative bills have, during this time, been introduced. On these occasions, the women presented their demands in the so-called hearings, which take place before the legislature. This took place in 1908 in Rhode Island, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois, South Dakota, Kansas, Oklahoma. Footnote. In November 1910, an amendment in favor of women's suffrage was defeated by a referendum vote in Oklahoma. End footnote. Maine, Massachusetts, California, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, and Washington. In the latter state, the House has just passed a woman's suffrage amendment. If the Senate passes it, the amendment will be submitted to popular vote. Footnote. The amendment passed the state Senate and was adopted in November 1910 by popular vote. End footnote. A very active woman's suffrage campaign in the state of Oregon, 1906, failed, owing to the opposition of the Friends of the Liquor Interests and the Brothels. Footnote. In November 1910, a woman's suffrage amendment was again defeated, as was the amendment prohibiting the sale of liquor. End footnote. It is both significant and gratifying that the woman's suffrage movement is spreading to the eastern states. An example of this is the great demonstration of February 22, 1909, in Boston. The women's suffrage societies of the various states are formed into a national league, the National Women's Suffrage Association, with about 100,000 members. The president is the Reverend Anna Shaw. This association has recently drawn up an enormous petition to Congress in order to secure women's suffrage through federal law and has established headquarters in Washington, the federal capital. During 11 weeks, 6,000 letters and 1,000 postal cards were written, and 100,000 petition blanks were distributed. End of Section 2 Section number 3 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alex Q.S. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kete Schirmacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. The United States of America, Part 2. To the present time, only a small number of women have sought state legislative offices. Women members of city councils are rather numerous. At the present time, there is a woman representative in the legislature of Colorado. The former governor, Mr. Alva Adams, alluded to her as, quote, a bright, efficient woman, end quote, who has introduced many bills and secured their passage. For, says the governor, quote, it must be a pretty miserable law which a tactful woman cannot have enacted, since the male legislators are usually courteous and kindly disposed, and disregard party interests in order to accept the measure of their female colleague. From which we conclude that the women legislators strive especially for measures which are for the general good. Footnote. In November 1910, four women were elected to the House of Representatives of the Colorado Legislature. End footnote. In the United States, there is also an association opposed to women's suffrage. 
Its chief supporters are found among the saloon keepers, the habitual drunkards, and the women of the upper classes. But the American women believe that, quote, if every prayer, every tear can be supported by the power of the ballot, mothers will no longer shed powerless tears over the misfortunes of their children, end quote. Footnote. Mrs. Ida Husted Harper, in collaboration with Susan B. Anthony, has written a History of W. Suffrage, which deals with the subject so far as the United States are concerned. End footnote. The American women had to struggle not only for their rights as citizens, but they encountered great difficulty in securing an education. At the beginning of the 19th century, the education of girls in the United States was entirely neglected. The secondary, as well as the higher institutions of learning, were as good as closed to them. Woman's, quote, physical and intellectual inferiority, end quote, was referred to, just as with us, in Germany, woman's, quote, loss of her feminine nature, end quote, was feared. And it was declared that, quote, within a short time, the country would be full of the wrecks of women who had overtaxed themselves with studies, end quote. To all these fears, the American women gave this answer. Women, you say, are foolish? God created them so they would harmonize with man. As for the rest, they awaited developments. As early as 1821, the first institution for the higher education of women, Troy Seminary, was founded with hopes for state aid. In 1833, Oberlin College, the first co-educational college, was opened with the express purpose, quote, of giving all the privileges of higher education to the unjustly condemned and neglected sex, end quote. Among the first women students was the youthful woman's rights advocate, Lucy Stone. She wished to learn Greek and Hebrew, for she was convinced that the biblical passage, quote, and he shall rule over thee, end quote, had not been correctly translated by the men. In 1865, with the founding of Vassar College, the first woman's college was established. Today, both sexes have the same educational opportunities in the United States. The four oldest universities, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Johns Hopkins, established on the English model, still exclude women and do not grant them academic degrees. However, the latter point is of comparatively minor importance in its relation to the educational opportunities of women. Most of the Western universities are co-educational. In the East, there are special women's colleges. In the colleges and universities, the number of women students is a little over one-third of the number of men students, but in the high schools, the girl students outnumber the boys. The removal of all restrictions to women's instruction in the secondary and higher institutions of learning is furthering the activity of the American women in the professions. As teachers, they are employed chiefly in the public schools, in which they constitute 70% of the total staff. So the majority of the, quote, freest citizens, end quote, in the world are educated by women. The number of women teachers in the public schools is 327,151. In the higher institutions of learning, there is nothing to prevent their appointment. Among university teachers, professors, and those of lower rank, there are about 1,000 women. Their salaries are equal to those of the men, which is not always the case in the elementary schools, since the tendency is to restrict women to the subordinate positions. Footnote. Equal pay has been established by law in the states having women's suffrage. End footnote. The women who teach in the women's colleges must, in every case, possess a superior individuality. Thus a woman president of a college must possess academic training in order to control her teaching force. She must possess a deep insight into human nature in order that her educational relations with the public may be successful. She must have a knowledge of business in order to administer the property of her institution satisfactorily and command the respect of the financiers of her governing board. 15,000 American women are students in women's colleges and 20,000 in co-educational colleges and universities. In the latter, the women have distinguished themselves through application and ability so frequently they have taken all the academic honors and prizes to the exclusion of the men. Since they can no longer be excluded on the ground of their inferiority, their superiority is now the pretext for their exclusion. But a suspension of co-education in the United States is not to be considered. The state universities, supported with public funds, are all co-educational. The existence of non-co-educational colleges and universities in addition to state institutions is regarded as a guarantee of personal freedom in matters pertaining to higher education. Since the public school system in the United States is in great part co-educational, 
the exclusion of women from conferences pertaining to school affairs and their administration would indicate that an especially great injustice were being committed. This was indeed recognized, and women were given the right to vote on school affairs not only in the five women suffrage states, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Idaho, and Kansas, but also in 23 other states, in which women are without political rights in other respects. The famous deaf-blind woman, Helen Keller, was appointed to serve on the state committee on the education of the blind. In Boston, trained nurses are employed to make visits to the homes of the school children. An agitation is on foot to have women inspectors of schools. In all women suffrage states, special attention is devoted to educational matters. Thus, the state of Ohio appropriated $2,500 for the establishment of a lectureship in domestic science. From 1872 to 1900, the number of women students has increased 148.7%, while the number of men students increased 60.6%. Among women, there are also fewer illiterates, drunkards, and criminals. In other words, women are the more moral and better educated part of the American population, and it is these who are excluded from active participation in political affairs. The number of women lawyers is estimated at 1,000. In 23 states, they may plead in the Supreme Court. Women lawyers have their own professional organizations. In Ohio, women are employed in the police service. In Pennsylvania, they are appointed as tax collectors. In the city of Portland, a woman was appointed as inspector of markets with police power. Women justices of the peace are as numerous as women mayors. In Oregon, a woman is secretary to the governor, for whom she acts with full authority. In all women suffrage states, women act as jurors. Besides these states, only Illinois permits women to serve as jurors, and then only in a juvenile court. There are said to be about 2,000 women journalists. Their writings are often sensational, but in the United States, sensationalism is characteristic of the profession. Of women preachers, there are 3,500, belonging to 158 different denominations. Among these women preachers, there are also negresses. The women study in theological seminaries, are ordained and devote themselves either to the real calling of the ministry, social rescue work, or to the women's rights propaganda, as does the excellent speaker, the Reverend Anna Shaw. The women preachers who devote themselves to social rescue work usually study medicine also, so that they can first secure confidence as persons skilled in the cure of the body, and then later the cure of the soul is less difficult. There are 7,000 women in the medical profession, more than in any other profession. The first women who studied medicine were American, Elizabeth Blackwell having done so as early as 1846. Only the University of Geneva, New York, would admit her. In 1848, she graduated there. Then she continued her studies in Paris and London, returning in 1851 to New York in order to practice. Her first patients were Quakers. Elizabeth Blackwell and her sister Emily Blackwell then founded in New York the Hospital for Indigent Women to which the medical schools in Boston and Philadelphia sent their graduates to obtain practical work. Footnote. It is worth mentioning that in the Spanish-American War, Miss McGee filled the position of assistant surgeon in the medical department, doing so with distinction. End footnote. A large number of women lawyers, preachers, and doctors are married. In 1900, the total number of women in the professions, exclusive of teaching, was 16,000. In 1900, 14.3% of the female population were engaged in industries. Since 1880, the number of women engaged in the professions and industries increased 128%, while that of men increased 76%. Most of the technical schools admit women. There are 53 women architects. The Woman's Building of the World's Exposition in Chicago, 1893, was designed by Sophia Hayden and erected under her supervision. It is not unusual for women who are owners of business enterprises to take technical courses. Thus, Miss Jones, as her father's heir, became, after a careful education, manageress of her large steelworks in Chicago. The Cincinnati Pottery, Rookwood, founded by women, is also managed by them. There are five women captains of ships, four women pilots, and 24 women engineers. During 25 years, women have had 4,000 inventions patented. The women of the South produced fewest inventions. But in these fields, women still meet with prejudice and difficulties. In increasing numbers, women are becoming bankers, merchants, contractors, owners or managers of factories, shareholders, stockbrokers, and commercial travelers. About 1,000 women are now engaged in these occupations. 
As office clerks, women have stood the test well in the United States. They are esteemed for their discretion and willingness to work. They are paid $12 to $20 a week. According to the most recent statistics on the trades and professions, 1900, there were 1,271 women bank clerks, 27,712 women bookkeepers, and 86,118 women stenographers. In the civil service, we find fewer women. They are not voters. In 1890, there were 14,692, of whom 8,474 were postal, telephone, and telegraph clerks, and 300 were police officials. In 1900, the total number of women engaged in commerce was 503,574. The prejudice against the women of the lower classes is still evident. Here, at the very outset, there is a great difference between the wages of men and women, the wages of the latter being from one-third to one-half lower. This is caused partly by the fact that women are given the disagreeable, tiresome, and unimportant work, which they must accept, not being given an opportunity to do the better class of work, frequently because they have not learned their trade thoroughly. A further cause for the lower wages of women is that they are working for, quote, pocket money, end quote, and, quote, incidentals, end quote, and thus spoil the market for those who must pay their whole living expenses with what they earn. Among the women workers of the United States, there are two classes, the industrial class and the amateurs. The latter make the existence of the former almost impossible. Such a competition is unknown to men in industrial work. Mrs. V. Vorst proposes a solution. To make the industrial amateurs become special artisans by means of a longer apprenticeship, thus relieving the industrial slaves from injurious competition. Office work and work in the factories enables the American women of the middle and lower classes to satisfy their desire for independence. Those who are not obliged to provide for themselves wish at least to have money at their disposal. That is a thoroughly sound aspiration. These girls became factory employees and not domestic servants, one, because work in their own home is not paid for, the general disregard of housework drives the women striving for independence away from the house, Two, because of the absence of regularity in housework. Three, because the domestic servants are not free on Sundays. Four, because they must live with the employers. These facts are established by answer to inquiries made by Miss Jackson, factory inspector of Wisconsin. The women employed in the stores and factories are in general paid about the same wages, four to six dollars a week. A saleswoman, upon whom greater demands are made as to dress and personal appearance, finds it more difficult to live on these wages than would the woman employed in the factory. As pocket money, however, this sum is a very good remuneration, and this explains why the girls of these classes, in imitation of the bad example set them by the members of the upper ranks of society, manifest such an extraordinary taste for costly clothes and expensive pleasures. In 1888, an official inquiry showed that 95% of the women laborers lived at home. In 1891, another official inquiry showed that one-third of the women laborers earned $5 a week, two-thirds from $5 to $7, and only 1.8% earned more than $12, while the men laborers earned on the average $12 to $15 a week. Women laborers are organized as yet only to a small extent, 1%, while 10% of the men are organized. There are separate social democratic organizations of women formed through the Federation of Labor. The working women especially will be helped by the right to vote. In the Political Equality series appears a pamphlet entitled, Why Does the Working Woman Need the Right to Vote? In the first place, she needs the right to vote in order to secure higher wages. Just suppose that the members of the typographical union were tomorrow deprived of their right to vote. Only their full political emancipation could again restore them to their former position of prestige among the working classes. This is exactly the case with the women, and they have not even reached the highly developed organization of the typographers. A politically unfree laboring class is also unable to maintain its vocation against the laboring class possessing political rights. If the vocation is remunerative, the unfree class will be deprived of it or be kept from it altogether. The oppression of the working women has its effect also on men through its tendency to lower wages. Therefore, at the present time, the trades unions have recognized that to organize women is in the interests of all working men. And while the women were refused organization 40 years ago, the Federation of Labor is today paying trades union organizers to induce women to become members of trades unions.
the introduction of a low rate of wages in one branch of a trade, pursued by both men and women, is always a menace to the branches that survive the reduction. The number of women engaged in the industries in 1900 was 1,315,890. The number of married women engaged in industrial pursuits is small. In 1895, an official investigation showed that in 1,067 factories, 7,000 working women out of 71,000 were married. The chief industries in which women are employed are the textile industry, cotton, laundering, the manufacture of ready-made clothing, corsets, carpets, millinery, and fancy goods. Women work alongside the men in wool spinning, in book binding, and in the manufacture of shoes, mittens, tobacco, and confectionery. The inability of working women to exercise political rights makes minors of them when compared with working men, and this decreases their importance as human beings. Women cannot protect themselves against injustice, and these things put them at a great disadvantage. The American women became involved in a lively conflict with President Roosevelt, otherwise favoring women's rights, concerning his gift to a father and mother for bringing 20 children into the world. The women declared in the Woman's Journal that it is wrong to encourage an immoderate procreation of children among a population 70% of which possesses no property. Footnote. Those who cannot pay an annual tax of $2. End footnote. Above all, this encouragement is not only a menace to the overworked and oppressed working women, but it is inhuman and really lowers the woman to the position of a machine for bearing children. The institution of factory inspection does not as yet exist in the whole union. According to the report of Mrs. V. Vorst, the factories and the homes of laborers in the southern states are extremely unsatisfactory. Child labor is exploited there, a matter which is now being dealt with by the National Child Labor Committee. According to this same work, the inquiry of Mrs. V. Vorst, the living conditions in the north and central states are better, and the moral menaces to the young girl are inconsiderable. The women of the property-holding classes are attempting to do their duty toward the women of the factories and stores by founding clubs, vacation colonies, and homes for them. Within recent years, the great department stores have appointed social secretaries who look after the weal and woe of the employees. It would be well to have such secretaries in the factories and mills also. Since 1874, the working week of 60 hours for women in industry and commerce has spread from Massachusetts to almost the entire Union. Since 1890, night labor has been prohibited by law. The working girls have been provided with seats while at work, partly as a result of legislation and partly by the voluntary act of the employers. In agriculture, women find a profitable field of activity. Of course, they are never field hands, but are employers and laborers in the dairy business, in poultry farming, and in the raising of vegetables and fruit. Women have introduced the growing of cress, cranberries, and cucumbers in various regions, and have cultivated the famous asparagus of Oyster Bay and the, quote, improved New York strawberries, end quote. In 1900, there were 980,025 women engaged in agriculture, as compared with 9,458,194 men. The number of women domestic servants in the United States amounts to 2,099,165. 50% of the families dispense with servants since they cannot afford to pay $15 to $20 a month for a servant, or $30 for a cook. Educated women, called visiting housekeepers, undertake the supervision of some of the households of the better class, aided, of course, by help in the house. The legal status of the American woman is regulated by 52 sets of laws, corresponding to the number of states and territories. The civil code is unfavorable to women in most of the states. In the National Trade Union League, New York, the Reverend Anna Shaw declared recently that in 38 states the property laws made, quote, joint property holding, end quote, legal, as a result of which the wife has no independent control of her personal earnings or her personal effects, e.g. her clothes. In 38 states, the wife also has no legal authority over her children. For full particulars, the reader is referred to Volume 4 of The History of Woman's Suffrage. To an increasing extent, the women are using their right to administer their property independently, and the men are usually proud of the business ability and success of their wives. A legal regulation of prostitution, such as prevailed formerly in England and as now prevails in Germany, does not exist in the United States. Cincinnati is the only city which, in the European sense, has police control of prostitution. Public opinion has successfully resisted all similar attempts. Woman's Journal, July 1904. 
The American Commission, which went to Europe to study the regulation of prostitution, declared that the American woman cannot be expected to sanction such an agreement, and that, moreover, the system had not stood the test. In the police stations, police matrons are employed. The law protects the woman in the street against the man and not, as in Europe, the man against the woman. In order to combat the double standard of morals, the Social Purity League was formed. The membership is composed of those men and women who are thoroughly convinced that there is only one standard of morality for both sexes, since they have the same obligations to their offspring. Founded in 1886, this organization has spread since 1889 throughout the entire Union. The World's Women's Christian Temperance Union, the second largest international women's organization, originated in America. It was founded in 1883 by Frances E. Willard. Her father was Hilgard from the Palatinate. The Union has 300,000 members in the United States at the present time, and 450,000 members in the whole world. In 1906, it met in Boston. It is the determined enemy of alcohol, and gives proof of its convictions through the work of its Soldiers and Sailors Department, its committees on railroads, tramways, police stations, cab drivers, etc. This union, as well as the Social Purity League, is a firm advocate of women's suffrage. The emancipation of the American woman is promoted through sports. If on the one hand they appreciate an elaborate toilette, on the other hand they recognize the advantages of bloomers, the walking skirt, and the divided skirt. In these costumes they play basketball, polo, tennis, and take gymnastic exercise, fence, and row. The women's colleges are centers of athletic life. There, the girls now play football in male costume, the public being excluded. In all large cities, there are athletic clubs for women, some extremely sumptuous, with a hundred dollar fee, as well as very simple clubs for working women of sedentary life. We have seen that the legal status of women in many states is still in need of reform. All the more instructive is the survey of laws concerning women and children in the woman suffrage states, published by Mrs. C. Waugh McCulloch, a woman lawyer of Chicago. The wife disposes of her wages and her dowry in Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho. Men and women receive equal pay for the same work. All professions and public offices are open to women. Women act as jurors. They have the same right of inheritance as men. Divorce is granted to either party under the same circumstances. The claims of the wife and the children under age are given a decided preference over those of the creditors. Education from the kindergarten to the university is free and is open to women. The labor of women in mines is prohibited. The maximum working day for women is eight hours. All houses of correction and institutions for the protection of women and children must have women physicians and overseers. The age of consent is 18 years. Gambling and prostitution are prohibited. Both father and mother exercise parental authority. The surviving husband is guardian of the children. The sale of alcoholic liquors and tobacco to children is prohibited. No child under 14 years of age may work in the mines. Pornographic literature and pictures are prohibited. In conclusion, I shall take several points from the lecture which Professor F. Laurie Poster held before the Political Equality League in Chicago, after the women of Chicago had waged a vigorous campaign for the right to vote in municipal affairs. Why is the value of woman placed so low? Merely because she is more helpless than man. Children are valued even less than women because they surpass the women in helplessness. Only animals have less power of defense, therefore they have the lowest value placed upon them. In the United States, it has now been demonstrated that whoever possesses the right to vote is esteemed more highly than he who does not have that right. We see this in the women's suffrage states. Here the women have made provisions not only for themselves, but for the children as well, for it is one of the fundamental instincts of woman to protect her little ones. In most of the states of the Union, however, women can help directly neither themselves nor their children. That women should be forced to struggle for these ends against the opposition of man is one of the most unfortunate phases of the whole movement. When woman became property, a possession, the overestimation of her sexual value began. Her sex was her weapon, and her capabilities became stunted. This overemphasis of the sexual causes a great part of the most flagrant evils among civilized peoples. Today we have reached a stage where we despise him who sells his vote. Unfortunately, it is still permitted to sell one's sex. In this roundabout way, woman attains most of the good things in life. Her economic successes depend almost entirely on the resources of the man to whom she belongs. Both sexes suffer as a result of this attitude of society.
woman's uncertain feeling that she must concentrate her interests and responsibilities in the one who provides for the family has created exceedingly peculiar customs and a wholly absurd code of honor for both man and woman. Thereby woman is directed to a roundabout way for everything she wishes to obtain. Whatever she wishes for herself must appear as a domestic virtue, if possible as a sacrifice for the family. Man thinks it very natural that he should do what he desires, that he should pursue his pleasures and gratify his passions. For he is indeed the one who possesses authority and does not need first to stamp his wishes as virtues. But it seems just as natural to him that the women of the family should be endowed with a double portion of piety, economy, and willingness to make sacrifices, virtues in which he is so lacking. Women are created especially for that. By nature they are better, and indeed they make great efforts to cover the faults of the offending one and forgivingly accept him again. In fact, they do it gladly. It gives them pleasure, and man certainly does not wish to deprive them of the opportunity for such great joys. Therefore man is instantly at hand to warn woman when she shows any inclination toward adopting masculine habits. But he certainly would be more conscientious and more moral if woman no longer assumed these virtues vicariously for him. Woman must make her demands of man. For that, she must be free. Footnote. The organ of the National American Women's Suffrage Association is Progress and is published in Warren, Ohio. There, one can also secure Perhaps and Do You Know, two valuable propaganda pamphlets written by Mrs. Carrie Chapman Catt. Other literature on women's suffrage can be obtained from the same source. End footnote. End of section 3. Section 4 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kathy Shearmacher, translated by Carl Conrad Eckert. Australia. Total population, 4,555,662. Women, 2,166,318. Men, 2,389,344. An association of women's clubs in each of five colonies. The Australian Women's Political Association, embracing six colonies. It is a rare thing for Europeans to have a definite conception of the Australian Commonwealth. This is the more to be regretted since this federation of republics is among the countries that have made the greatest progress in the women's rights movement. In no other part of the world has such a radical change in the status of woman been effected in so short a time and with such comparatively insignificant struggles. Till 1840, Australia had been a penal colony. Since then, after the discovery of the first gold fields, a multitude of fortune seekers, gold miners, and adventurers joined the population of deported convicts. The good middle class element for a long time remained in the minority. Certainly nobody would have believed that there existed at that time in Australia all the conditions necessary for the growth of a flourishing and highly civilized commonwealth. Nevertheless, such was the case. There were formed seven democratic states whose people were not bound by any traditionalism or excessive fondness for time-honored inherited customs. These people wished to have elbow room and were determined to establish themselves on their own soil in their own way. This all took place the more easily since England gave the growing commonwealth in general an exceedingly free hand, and because the inhabitants were by nature independent. Australia was colonized by those who, having come into conflict with the laws of the old world, found their sphere of life narrow and restricted. Because Australia today has only about five million inhabitants, the country is confronted only in a limited way with the problem of dealing with congested masses of people, a condition which is favorable to all social experimentation. Those in authority believe they can direct and eventually mold the development of the Commonwealth. 65% of the population are Protestant, the Germanic element predominates. The women constitute not quite 50% of the population. Thus, in many respects, the Australian colonies possess conditions similar to those prevailing in the western states of the American Union, and the results of the women's rights movement are in both regions approximately the same. Mrs. M. Donahue, one of the delegates from Australia declared at the London Woman Suffrage Congress that her country had brought about the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Naturally, the Australian governments had originally a series of material problems to solve, real problems of existence, as, for example, 
to find a satisfactory agricultural policy in a predominantly farming and cattle raising country. When the economic basis of the country seemed sufficiently secure, the intellectual interests were given attention. A country which never had slavery or a feudal regime, a Salic law, or a code Napoleon, a country which has no divine right of kings and is not oppressed with militarism, a country which judges a man by his personal ability and esteems him for what he is, such a country certainly could not tolerate the dogma of woman's inferiority. Between 1871 and 1880, the school systems of the various colonies were regulated by a series of laws. Elementary instruction, which is free and obligatory, is given in public schools to children of both sexes between the ages of 5 and 15. But in most cases, the sexes are segregated. In the public schools of the whole continent, about 20,000 teachers are employed, 9,000 men and 11,000 women. The men predominate in the leading, well-paid positions. The secondary school system, as in England, is composed largely of private schools, and is to a great extent in the hands of the Protestant denominations and the Catholic orders. The government subsidizes these institutions. Girls and boys enjoy the same educational opportunities in the schools, part of which are co-educational. The four Australian universities, Sydney, New South Wales, Melbourne, Victoria, Adelaide, South Australia, and Auckland, New Zealand, are today open to women who can secure all academic degrees granted by the philosophical, law, and medical faculties. The number of students in the universities is as follows. In Sydney, 1,054, of whom 142 are women. In New Zealand University, 1,332, of whom 369 are women. In Melbourne, 853, of whom 128 are women. The total number of students in Adelaide and Hobart is 626 and 62 respectively, but the number of women students is not given. The educational problem is thus solved for the Australian woman in a favorable manner. She has equal and full privileges in the universities. What are the conditions in the occupations? All occupations are open to women is stated in a report which I have used, but that is not entirely correct. Women are teachers, but they are not lecturers and professors in the universities. As preachers, they are admitted only among the nonconformists. There are women doctors and dentists, and in four colonies, New Zealand, Tasmania, West Australia, and Victoria, women are permitted to practice law, but they are confronted with a certain popular prejudice when they attempt to enter medicine, law, technical science, and a teaching career in the universities. The state employs women in the elementary schools and the postal and telegraph service as registrars, permitting them to perform marriage ceremonies, and as factory inspectors. But the salaries and wages in Australia are not always the same for both sexes. Thus, for example, in South Australia, the male headmasters of the public schools draw salaries of 110 to 450 pounds sterling, while the women draw 80 to 156 pounds sterling. Since school affairs are not affairs under the control of the Commonwealth, the federal law, equal wages for equal work, cannot be applied in this particular. In Tasmania, where the women have voted since 1903, women are teachers in the public schools, employees in the postal, telegraph, and telephone systems, supervisors of health in the public schools, and assistants to the quarantine and sanitary boards. They are registrars in the parishes, superintendents of hospitals, asylums, prisons, etc., Public offices in the army, the navy, and the church alone remain closed to them. It is to be noted here that Mrs. Dobson of Tasmania was the official representative of the Australian government at the International Women's Suffrage Congress held in Amsterdam in 1908. The official yearbook of the Australian Federation gives the following industrial statistics for 1901. State and municipal office holders, 41,235 women, 69,399 men, Domestic servants, 150,201 women, 50,335 men. Commerce, 34,514 women, 188,144 men. Transportation, 3,429 women, 118,730 men. Industry, 75,570 women, 350,596 men. Agriculture and forestry, fisheries and mining, 38,944 women, 494,163 men. In all fields, with the exception of domestic service, the men are in a numerical superiority. Therefore, the matrimonial opportunities of the Australian woman are favorable. 
For every 100 girls, 105.99 boys were born in 1906. The statistics for 1906 showed a greater number of marriages than ever before, 30,410. The difference in the ages of the married men and women is 4.5 years on the average. The number of children per family is about 4, 3.77. Five Australian colonies, New Zealand, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia, and New South Wales, have enacted the following laws for the protection of working women. 1. Maximum working time, 48 hours a week. 2. The prohibition of night work, except in Queensland. 3. Higher wages for overtime. The eight-hour day is necessitated throughout Australia by the climate. The other provisions are perhaps not stringently enforced. Children under 13 years cannot be employed in the factories. Socialistic regulations, such as fixing the minimum wages in certain industries and the establishment of obligatory courts of arbitration, have been instituted in several colonies, Victoria, New South Wales, etc. In the beginning, the English common law regulated the legal status of the Australian women. During the past 50 years, this law has undergone many modifications. Each colony acted independently in the matter, and therefore there is no longer uniformity. In all cases, separate ownership of property is legal. However, joint parental authority is legally established only in New Zealand. The divorce laws are prejudicial to women in almost all respects. In the field of legislation, the influence of women's suffrage has already made itself definitely felt. Each colony has its state legislature, which consists of a lower house and a senate. Every Australian who is 21 years old is a voter in both states and municipal elections. There is a property qualification only for those voting for the Senate. In 1869, the women's suffrage movement began in Australia, in Victoria. The right to vote in school and municipal affairs was given to women as a matter of course. The right to vote in state affairs was granted to women first in New Zealand in 1893, in South Australia in 1895, in West Australia in 1899, in New South Wales in 1903, in Queensland in 1905, and in Victoria in 1908. When the six Australian colonies, excluding New Zealand, formed themselves into a federation in 1900, an Australian federal parliament was established. The women of all of the six colonies voted for the parliamentary officers on an equality with men. Here was a curious thing. The women of the four conservative colonies voted for the members of the federal parliament, but could not vote for the state legislature. On the basis of the documents dealing with Victoria, I shall give a more detailed account of the history of woman suffrage in this colony. The greatest statesman of Victoria, George Higginbotham, in 1873, introduced the first woman suffrage bill before parliament. This met with no success. A number of similar attempts were made until 1884. In this year, there was founded the first Woman Suffrage Society in Victoria. The movement then spread rapidly, and in 1891, 30,000 women petitioned Parliament for the suffrage and state affairs. For the time being, this attempt likewise met with failure. But the political organization of the women was strengthened through the formation of the United Council for Woman Suffrage. Every year after 1895, this council gave advice to the lower house concerning the framing of women's suffrage bills, and thus enlarged its influence. Hitherto the passing of the suffrage bill had been prevented by the opposition of the upper house, which was not chosen by universal suffrage. On November 18, 1908, the bill was finally passed by the House of Obstruction, and thus the women who had worked for the suffrage were finally emancipated. Since 1893, the year of the emancipation of women in New Zealand, the opponents of woman suffrage put off the women with the request to wait and see how the plan worked in New Zealand. In 1896, the women were asked to wait and see how the plan worked in New South Wales. In 1902, they were asked to see how woman suffrage worked in the federal elections. In 1908, it was possible to secure only 3,500 signatures against woman suffrage. In New Zealand, the women have exercised active suffrage since 1893. There also, the gloomiest predictions were made when this unprecedented measure was adopted. There were, of course, women opponents of woman suffrage. Such, for example, was Mrs. Seddon, the wife of the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She said, It seemed to me that the women ought to remain away from the tumult and the riotous scenes of the polling booths. But I gave up this view. With us, the women benefited the suffrage, and the suffrage benefited the women.
The elections have taken place more quietly, and women have indicated a lively interest in public affairs. Woman suffrage has not caused family dissensions. It has frequently happened that whole families have voted for the same candidate. In other cases, different members of one family voted for different candidates. But this has not disturbed domestic tranquility, for nowhere have family feuds been engendered by one member or another of the family boasting of the success of his candidate. The fear that the women would vote largely for conservative candidates, through the influence of the clergy, was not realized. Already, the women have twice contributed to the re-election of a liberal minister. Neither the Protestant nor the Catholic clergy endeavored to influence the votes of the women anywhere. The Countess Wachtmeister, a Californian traveling in Australia, confirms this opinion. Thanks to woman suffrage, the respectable elements that formerly often remained away from the political arena have now again stepped to the front. They have presented successful candidates and have begun to play an important part in the political life of the country. Since women have exercised the right to vote in New Zealand, the following legal reforms have been enacted. 1. Divorces are granted to the wife and to the husband upon the same grounds. 2. The husband can no longer deprive the wife and children of their inheritances by means of a will. 3. The conditions of suffrage in municipal elections were made the same for both women and men. 4. The saloons are closed on election days. 5. Women are admitted to the practice of law. 6. The age of consent for girls was raised to 17. Similar reforms were enacted in South Australia. There, Mrs. Mary Lee is the leader in the woman suffrage movement and founder of the Women's Suffrage Society. When the woman suffrage bill was passed in 1895, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Public Instruction, and the Lord Mayor gave Mrs. Lee an impressive reception in the town hall. They thanked her for the untiring efforts which she had devoted to the cause, and the Prime Minister said, Mrs. Lee is the originator of the greatest reforms in the constitutional history of Australia. What enlightened views the ministers in the antipodal countries do have? Are they really our Antiscians to such a degree? Since 1896, the following reforms have been effected by the South Australian Parliament. 1. A modification of the marriage law. The husband must provide for the wife and children if his brutality leads to a divorce. An enlargement of woman's sphere in the business world. Separate property rights. 2. Greater strength was given to the law compelling the father of illicit children to fulfill his pecuniary duties. 3. A severer penalty for trafficking in girls. 4. The increasing of the age of consent to 17. 5. Improved laws providing for the care of dependent children. 6. A maximum working week of 52 hours for children engaged in industry. 7. Laws suppressing pornography. 8. Laws prohibiting the sale of liquor and tobacco to children. 9. Women were appointed to the positions of inspectors of schools, prisons, hospitals, etc. In West Australia, where women have voted since 1899, the women were admitted to the practice of law, the age of consent was raised to 17 years, and the conditions on which divorce are granted were made the same for man and woman. In Europe, people still question the practical value of woman suffrage. Following the establishment of woman suffrage in New South Wales and Tasmania, juvenile courts were introduced. New South Wales adopted a very stringent law regulating the sale of liquor. Local option. No barmaids under 21 years could be employed. The sale of liquors to children under 14 years was prohibited. Since women have voted in the elections for the federal parliament, they have formed the Australian Women's Political Association. The president is Ms. Vida Goldstein of Victoria. To the association belong women's suffrage leagues, women's trade unions, temperance societies, women's church clubs, and other organizations. For the present, the women will not ally themselves with any of the existing parties, since the principles of none of them correspond exactly to the program which the women have set up. The Political Equality League is satisfactory in one respect, equal rights for both sexes, but goes too far in its socialistic demands. The women have succeeded in having federal laws enacted providing that all state employees be paid the same wages for the same work, and that the legal provisions for naturalization permit women to retain her right of self-government and her individuality. The government will propose a federal law securing uniformity in the marriage laws, 
laws in regard to marriage, property, divorce, and parental authority. In all the Australian colonies, women have active suffrage, but not in all cases the passive. Wherever they possess the latter, they have laid little claim to it. 1. Because a part of the capable women believe they can work more effectively and achieve more if they are not attached to a political party. 2. Because the established party programs very frequently embody the demands of the women. 3. Because for this reason the political parties expect no special advantage from the women and it is difficult to secure the support of the great party papers for the women candidates. 4. Because the Australian elections also cost money and the capable women are not always well to do. In 1903, Miss Vita Goldstein announced her candidature for the federal parliament and was defeated. In the federal elections of 1906, on an average, 58.36% of the registered men and 43.30% of the registered women voted, against 53.09 and 30.96% in 1903. In two pamphlets, Woman Suffrage in New Zealand and Woman Suffrage in Australia, the leading men of the youngest region of the world have given their written testimony on the practical workings of woman suffrage. These men are prime ministers of the colonies, public prosecutors, the ministers of the various state departments, members of the lower houses in the parliaments, high dignitaries of the church, the editors of large political newspapers. They all make the most favorable statements concerning woman suffrage. The women have demanded nothing unreasonable from their representatives and have always placed themselves on the side of clean politics and clean politicians. Woman suffrage has brought about neither the millennium nor pandemonium, and the New Zealanders do not understand why it is that in other countries people can still become agitated over anything so inherently reasonable as woman suffrage. All who wish to have the right to participate in a discussion on woman suffrage must first study these two books of testimonials. A mere knowledge of these facts will cause much insipid discussion to cease in public meetings. From the French consul in Danzig, Count Dufoy d'Abance, one familiar with Australian conditions, I learned the following isolated facts concerning woman suffrage. It has a salutary influence throughout. Women show a lively interest in political and municipal questions. For the sake of their political rights, they neglect their specifically feminine duties so little that they come to the parliamentary sessions with knitting, embroidery, and sewing. They also engage in these feminine activities while attending the night sessions. On election days, there is certainly often a cold dinner or supper. But that occurs on washing days, too, and no one has yet wished to deny women the privilege of doing the washing. It is safe to say that the Australian women's rights movement will not fail because of this obstacle. End of section 4. Section 5 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bertha Mason. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Cathy Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Great Britain Total population 41,605,220 Women 21,441,911 Men 20,163,309 English Federation of Women's Clubs Women's Suffrage League England is the storm centre of our movement declared the president of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance in the Amsterdam Congress. This was the conviction of the Congress, which therefore resolved to hold the next International Women's Suffrage Congress in London in April 1909. The fact is undisputed that the English suffragettes, whether one favours or opposes their actions, have made Great Britain the centre of the modern women's rights movement. England is a European country, an old country with rigid traditions, which nevertheless are the freest political traditions that we have in Europe today. For 50 years, the English women have struggled for the right to vote, in spite of the fact that their country has neither Salic law nor continental militarism. Two of the greatest obstacles to all women's rights movements. The English women have not as yet attained their ends. 
This is an indication of the tenacity of the prejudices against women in the countries of older civilizations. The opposition offered to the political emancipation of women in England is all the more remarkable since the English women were able to exercise the right to vote on an equality with men in national elections till 1832 and in municipal elections till 1835. To that time, we find the same conditions prevailing in England as prevailed in the nine American commonwealths previous to 1783. This parity of circumstances is explained by the English principle of representation, no taxation without representation. In 1832 and 1835, however, the English women, who as taxpayers were qualified to vote, had the right to vote in national and municipal affairs taken from them. For the word persons, the expression male persons was substituted in the election law. When this disenfranchisement took place, none of those concerned cried out against it. For 200 years, the women had made no use worth mentioning of the right to vote, but a part of the women, especially those of the liberal and cultured circles, saw the significance of this retrograde step. The political struggles of general concern during the following period, such as the anti-slavery movement and the anti-corn law movement, furnish these women an opportunity to educate themselves in political affairs. And, like the American women of that time, they in many cases learnt their political ABC by means of the same questions. Such men as Cobden, Pease, Biggs, Knight and others were the advance guard of the political woman in England. The earliest pamphlet on women's suffrage preserved to us appeared in 1847. This is a small leaflet and says, among other things, as long as both sexes and all parties are not given a just representation, good government is impossible, which is a paraphrase of the American principle. Every just government derives its power from the consent of the governed. The contrary view has been stated in the Encyclopedia Britannica as early as 1842 by the father of John Stuart Mill. It is self-evident that all persons whose interests are identical with those of a different class are excluded from political representation without injury. Certainly, from such an arrangement, the representatives will suffer no injury. That select group of intellectual women who train themselves politically during the anti-slavery movement and the struggle for free trade consisted of the mothers, the sisters and daughters of liberal politicians and academically trained men. Many of these women were themselves students and teachers. No antagonism ever existed in England between the woman's suffrage movement and the movement favouring the education of women. Such were the conditions in 1866 a new election law was to be introduced in Parliament. A new class of men was to be granted the right of suffrage by the lowering of the property qualification. The women decided to present a petition to the House of Commons requesting the right to vote in national elections. The women had decided to act thus publicly because of the presence of John Stuart Mill in the House of Commons and because of an utterance of Disraelis. In a country in which a woman can be ruler, peer, church trustee, owner of a state, guardian of the poor, I do not see in the name of what principle the right to vote can be withheld from her. Four petitions, one signed by 1,499 women, one by 1,605 taxpaying women, and two more signed by 3,559 and 3,000 men and women, were sent to the House of Commons, and on May the 20th, 1867, John Stuart Mill, after he had presented the petitions, moved that the right to vote be given to the qualified women taxpayers. His motion was rejected by a vote of 196 to 73. Thereupon, there were formed for systematic propaganda women's suffrage societies in London, Edinburgh, Manchester, Birmingham and Bristol. These cities are still the centre of the movement. The new election law gave women a further advantage. The expression male person was replaced by the generic word man. Since an Act of Parliament, 13 and 14 Vict, circa 21, declares that in all laws, 
The masculine expression also includes the feminine, unless the contrary is expressly stated. The Friends of Women's Suffrage believed they could interpret this expression in favour of women. The attempt to do this was now made. A number of qualified women demanded that they be registered with the voters. They were determined to have recourse to the law if the government commission refused to register their votes. At this time, the first public meeting of women in England was held in the famous Free Trade Hall in Manchester, but the courts and the Supreme Court interpreted the law against the women. They are disqualified, neither intellectually nor morally, but legally. Then, a methodical propaganda by means of public meetings was begun. The first victory was won as early as 1869. The women taxpayers were given the right to vote in municipal affairs in England, Scotland and Wales. Between 1870 and 1884, the political organisation of the women was strengthened. The women of the aristocracy, Lady Amberley, Lady Anne Gore Langton and others, were won over to the cause of women's suffrage. A central committee for women's suffrage was formed and a number of excellent women speakers, Biggs, McLaren, Becker, Fawcett, Cragen, Kingsley, Todd and others, spoke throughout the country. A further success was achieved when the Parliament of the Isle of Man, House of Keys, gave qualified women the right to vote. In 1884, the property qualification was again reduced through a new election law. The Friends of Women's Suffrage took advantage of this opportunity to present a motion in Parliament favouring women's suffrage, in support of which the following statements were made. Two million men, many of whom are ignorant and uneducated and possess only a small plot of ground, are to be given political rights. On what principle is the same right withheld from 300,000 women? who are educated and who are landowners. This motion was lost also. In 1885, the English women, in order to make their influence felt in political affairs, formed the Primrose League, which supported the Conservative candidates in the election campaigns, and in 1887 was formed the Women's Liberal Federation, which supported the Liberals in a similar manner. The next attempt to secure women's suffrage was made in 1897, but it was unsuccessful. During the Boer War, women's suffrage receded into the background and not until March 14th, 1904, was a women's suffrage bill again introduced. This bill did not become law. At that time, the women's suffrage movement was lifeless and in a thoroughly hopeless condition. All the usual means of propaganda had been exhausted. Meetings, petitions and personal work during campaigns made no impression either on the members of Parliament, the government or on public opinion. It was no longer possible to adduce arguments against the right of qualified women to vote. It was not a question of universal suffrage, but just as in the case of the men, it was a matter of granting the franchise to women holding property in their own name and earning their own living. Governments, however, wished to be coerced into granting the franchise, and the representatives of the women's suffrage movement were not determined enough to exercise the necessary coercion. Therefore, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies transferred the leadership of the movement to the National Women's Social and Political Union, whose members are known by the name of suffragettes. This transference of leadership took place during the autumn of 1905. The suffragettes then adopted militant tactics, making the government their point of attack. This was a good stroke, for in 1905 England has had a Liberal cabinet and several of the ministers and over 400 of the 600 members of the House of Commons have declared themselves as friends of women's suffrage. Then why don't you grant us our political freedom, asked the suffragettes. The women are heads of families. They pay rent and taxes, just as the men. All their conditions of livelihood are as dependent upon the laws as are those of the men. A liberal government and liberal members of parliament ought to be liberal towards women and grant them the suffrage. Many of those ministers and many members of parliament owe their political careers, their election and their influence to the practical campaign activities of women or to the women's suffrage movement, which they supported in order to enlarge their political influence. They have made use of the women's suffrage movement and now wish to do nothing in return. The fate of all women's suffrage bills introduced since 1870, 
13 in number, proves that it is hopeless to have such bills introduced by private members. Women must turn their hopes to a bill introduced by the government. The present Liberal government needs only to treat the matter seriously, then a woman's suffrage bill will be passed. But the government has not treated the matter seriously. Hence, the suffragettes have declared war. It is their determination to fight every ministry which is not kindly disposed towards the suffrage movement. The struggle is carried on by the following means. Organisation of societies, meetings throughout the country, street parades and open-air meetings. Especially significant are those of June the 13th and 21st, 1908. The employment of first-class speakers who make concise, clear, ingenious and stirring speeches. The raising of large sums of money, £20,000, i.e. $100,000 annually. There is a reserve fund of £50,000, i.e. $250,000. The publication of a well-managed periodical, Votes for Women. The leaders are Mrs. and Miss Pankhurst, Mrs. Drummond, Annie Kenny, Mr. and Mrs. Pethick Lawrence. These, and the most determined of their associates, undertake to send deputations to the Liberal Prime Minister, Mr. Asquith, and to ask the question in all public meetings in which members of the Cabinet speak, when will you give women the right to vote? The deputations go to Parliament because women as taxpayers have the right to speak to the Prime Minister, who continually receives deputations from men. Since the Prime Minister does not wish to grant women the right to vote, the deputations of women are prevented from entering the Houses of Parliament by strong squads of police, both mounted and on foot, and if the women do not desist from their attempt to make known to the Prime Minister the resolutions of their meeting, they are arrested for the disturbance of the peace. The interruption of traffic or the instigation of tumult and riot. They are arraigned in the police court and are sentenced to imprisonment in the ordinary prisons. The Liberal government stubbornly refuses to regard these women as political offenders and to punish them as such. The women's suffrage advocates who ask the cabinet members questions in public meetings direct their questions to both friends and opponents of women's suffrage. For they inquire, of what use are our friends to us if they do nothing for us? The members of the English cabinet have a joint responsibility for their political programme. If the Friends of Woman's Suffrage treat the matter seriously, they must either convert their colleagues or resign. As long as they do not do that, they are merely playing with woman's suffrage and the women think it necessary to heckle them. The women who ask the questions are often ejected from the meeting in a very rough way. Footnote C. E. Robin's novel, The Convert. End of footnote. The suffragettes give the government conclusive proof of their political power when they oppose Liberal candidates at all by-elections and contribute to the defeat of the candidates or cause a reduction of their votes. To the present, this has occurred in 14 cases. It is due to the success of these tactics that the whole world is today speaking about women's suffrage, which has become a burning political question in England. All along, the people and the press are giving greater support to the suffragettes who have the courage to brave the horrors of the London prison and there become acquainted with the distress of the poor, the destitute and the helpless. During the last three or four years of the activity of the suffragettes, a great number of women's suffrage organisations were founded. The Women's Freedom League, Mrs Despard, the Men's League for Women's Suffrage, the Artists' Suffrage League, the Conservative and Unionist Women's Franchise Association, the Actresses' Franchise League, the Writers' League, etc. Scotland and Ireland have their own women's suffrage associations. In opposition, there have been formed the National Women's Anti-Suffrage Association and a Men's League for Opposing Women's Suffrage. Those are supported chiefly by the aristocratic circles. They declare that woman does not need the right to vote since she exercises an enormous indirect influence. That woman does not wish the right to vote, that her subordination is based on natural law, since brute force rules the world. Woman's suffrage would result in England's destruction if a majority of women voters, England has a majority of women, 
were permitted to decide questions concerning the Army and Navy. The leader of the suffragettes, Miss Fawcett, recently established the fact that the newly formed association has a considerably smaller number of prominent names amongst its members than the organisation formed two years ago, which soon came to an inglorious end. She emphasised the fact that two important women, who at that time still favoured the anti-suffrage movement, Mrs Louise Crichton and Mrs Sidney Webb, have since gone over to the suffrage advocates. On the occasion of Mrs Fawcett's public debate with Mrs Humphrey Ward, the leader of the anti-suffragists, in February 1909, it happened that 235 of those present favoured woman suffrage and 74 were opposed. The argument against the brute force statement was treated in three excellent articles in Votes for Women under the title The Physical Force Fallacy. The most influential of the English women together with the women in the industries, the students of both sexes, the working women, in short, the intellectual and professional women, are in favour of the suffragettes, and the women suffrage advocates have the spiritual certainty that moves mountains. Let no one believe that the appeals made on the streets, the parades of the women as sandwich men, or the noisy publicity of their tactics are gladly indulged in by the women. These actions are entirely opposed to woman's nature, but the women have recognised that these tactics are necessary and they act accordingly because it is their duty. Such movements have always been successful. Women do not possess the right to vote in parliamentary elections, but if taxpayers, they can vote in municipal affairs in the whole of Great Britain and Ireland. The married women of England and Wales have a restricted right of suffrage, however, they are persons, and therefore voters in parochial elections. In the election of poor law administrators, and of urban and rural district councillors, but they are not regarded as persons, and are not voters, in elections for the borough and county councils. In one single case, in the county of London, by the law of 1900, married women were given almost the same rights as those exercised, by married women in Scotland and Ireland. The right of single or married women to hold office, passive suffrage, has prevailed in England and Wales since 1869 in respect of the offices of guardians of the poor, overseers, way wardens, church wardens, and since 1870, the Education Act, in respect to school boards. At the very first school elections, women were elected which induced women to have themselves presented also as candidates for the offices of poor law administrators. In 1875, the first unmarried woman was elected to that office, the first married woman in 1881. In the discharge of their duties in both classes of offices, the women have acted admirably. Nevertheless, the Reactionary Education Act of June 1903 took away from the women the right to hold office as members of school boards in the County of London. They can still secure administrative offices by governmental appointment, but no longer by an election. In 1888 were created the County Councils for England and Wales. The County Councils were at the same time organs for the self-governing municipalities. Since this law, like those of 1869 and 1870, did not specially exclude women from the right to hold office, two women, Mrs Cobden and Lady Sandhurst, presented themselves as candidates for the office of county councillors of London. They were elected. Thereupon, Mrs Beresford Hope, whom Lady Sandhurst had defeated, contested the legality of the election. In 1889, the Court of Appeals declared that women were eligible to public office only when this is expressly stated. This decision of the court, which was in conflict with the English Constitution, also brought about the loss of the right of the women of Scotland and Ireland to hold office as county councillors. As a result of this judicial decision, when the new Local Self-Government Act for England and Wales was enacted, 1894, it was necessary expressly to state the eligibility of women, unmarried and married, to hold the minor local offices, 
parish, urban, rural, district councillors, poor law guardians, etc. Article 22, however, in spite of historical precedents, excluded women from the Office of Justice of the Peace. In 1894, the same thing occurred in Scotland and in 1898 in Ireland. In 1899, the attempt to secure the eligibility of women to the Metropolitan Borough Councils, for London only, failed, owing to the opposition of the House of Lords. The law of 1907, known as the Qualification of Women Act, grants unmarried women the right to hold office in the borough and county councils, councillor, alderman, mayor. Married women have this right only in the County of London. Elsewhere, they can merely vote for these officers. On the occasion of the first elections, under this Act, 12 women presented themselves as candidates. Six were elected, one as mayor. Hitherto, the women had been elected only in small places and then, owing to exceptional circumstances. Whoever investigates the struggle of the women to secure their rights in the local government and studies the attitude of the men towards these exceedingly just demands will comprehend the exasperating circumstances under which the women are today struggling for the right to vote in the English parliamentary elections. In questions of power and gaining a livelihood, Macht and Brotfragen, the nobility of man can really not be depended upon. The woman's suffrage movement has led to the consummation of a number of legal reforms. The property laws now legalise the separation of the property of husband and wife. In the United Kingdom, the wife administers her own property and disposes of it and has full control over her earnings. The remainder of the laws regulating marriage are still rather rigorous, in England at least. The wife has no hereditary right to her husband's property. If she economises in the administration of the household, the savings belong to the husband. The wife cannot demand any pay in money for performing her domestic duties. The mere expenses of maintenance are sufficient remuneration, etc. In normal cases, the father alone has authority over the children. It is made very difficult for a woman to secure a divorce, etc. The women that have laboured so untiringly in political affairs have very naturally made it a point to promote the educational opportunities of their sex. Since 1870, the elementary school system has been regulated by the school boards, which have introduced obligatory public instruction. In these institutions, the boys and girls are segregated, except in the rural districts, On an average, there is one male teacher to every three women teachers in these institutions. The secondary schools are private, as in Australia. Hence, it was not necessary for the English women to wrest every concession from a reluctant government, as was the case in Germany. But private initiative, combined with the devotion of private individuals, made possible in a few years the full reorganisation of England's institutions of learning for girls. This reorganisation began in 1868 and led to the following results. The establishment of higher institutions of learning in all English cities. These are called girls' public day schools, most of them being day schools. They are governed by committees consisting of the founders, the principals and the qualified advisors. Latin and mathematics are obligatory studies in the curriculum. The schools are in close relationship with Oxford and Cambridge universities. The universities inspecting the schools and supervising the various examinations, including the examinations of the students upon leaving the schools. In England, these schools are for girls only. In Scotland, girls attend similar schools which are co-educational. The number of women teachers is estimated at 8,000. Admission to the universities was secured with difficulty by the women. At first, a number of women requested the privilege of attending lectures in the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. Since these universities are resident colleges, it was necessary to provide boarding places for women. This was done in 1869 and 1870 in both places, through the work of Miss Emily Davies and Miss Anna Clough. Both of these beginnings developed into the women's colleges of Girton and Newnham. Since then, St. Margaret Hall, Somersville Hall and Holloway College have been established for women. 
These institutions correspond to the German philosophical faculties, the Colleges of Literature and Liberal Arts in the United States. An entrance examination is necessary for admission. The course of study is three years. The final examination, called Tripos, embraces three subjects. It corresponds to the German Oberlehrer's examen. Examinations given to candidates for the position of teachers in the gymnasiums, the Real Gymnasiums, Oberreal Gymnasiums, etc. Theology, medicine, and law cannot be studied in these women's colleges any more than in the American women's colleges. Part of the teachers live in the women's college buildings, part of them belong to the faculties of Oxford and Cambridge. The former are women, tutors, and professors. The English colleges for women are maintained by private funds. Many women, not wishing to take the tripos examinations or to become teachers, attend the university to acquire a higher education. Others prepare themselves for the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts, or Doctor of Philosophy. These examinations are accepted by Oxford and Cambridge universities, but the women are not granted the corresponding titles because the use of such titles would make the women fellows of the university, which would entitle them to the use of the university gardens and parks, and to live in one of the colleges. All other universities in England, Scotland and Ireland, with the exception of Trinity College Dublin, admit women to all departments, accepting their examinations and granting them academic degrees. The women's colleges are centres of sport. Incidentally, they possess their own fire department, To arouse an interest in political affairs and to develop facility in speaking, debating clubs have been organised. More than 1,300 women have graduated from Cambridge and more than 1,200 from the University of London. When Mary Putnam wished to study medicine in 1868, she had to go to Paris. Jex Blake, who attempted the same thing in Edinburgh in 1869, was driven out by the students. She went to London and was there at first given instruction by the noble Dr. Ansey. As early as 1870, there was formed in London a special school of medicine for women, to which a hospital for women was later attached, being directed and supported entirely by women physicians. Today, 553 women doctors are practising in Great Britain. Of these, 538 have expressed themselves in favour of, and 15 against, woman suffrage. In England, women were first permitted to take the public examination in dental surgery as late as 1908, while the Edinburgh, Glasgow and Irish Royal Colleges of Surgeons had admitted them long before. Women can study law in England, but as yet they have not been admitted to the bar. If this privilege were granted to women, they would have to affiliate with the London Lawyers' Associations, such as the Inner Temple, the Middle Temple, Gray's Inn, etc. Members of these organisations must several times a month attend the dinners or banquets of the lawyers. These corporate customs of the English bar are said to exclude women from the legal profession, just as similar customs have excluded them from tutorship and professorships in Oxford and Cambridge. In spite of this, Miss Cave recently sought admission to Gray's Inn, but was refused because she was a woman. She appealed her case to the Lords of Appeal in ordinary, but they declared they had no jurisdiction. The matter will be pursued further. The first woman preacher in England, a native of Germany, Miss V. Petold, studied theology in Germany and graduated there. After her trial sermon in Leicester, she was elected in preference to her male competitors. Later, she accepted a call to Chicago. The Congregationalists have four women preachers, the Salvation Army, over 3,000. Except in those callings where personal ability is determinative, the salaries of English women are lower than those of the men. The women have a large field for their efforts in the public schools, where there are three women teachers to one man teacher. In the secondary schools for girls, instruction and control are entirely in the hands of women. Their salaries are quite sufficient, the minimum being £100 sterling, about $500. As we have seen, The higher institutions of learning also offer the women well-paid positions, the tutors being paid $2,000 with board and lodging, the principals 
two thousand five hundred dollars. End of section five, Great Britain, part one. Section 6 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Cathy Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Great Britain, Section 2. The well-paid civil offices are reserved for the men. Although there are more women teachers and more female students in the schools than males, there are 244 male inspectors in public schools and 18 women inspectors. The male inspector general is paid £1,000 sterling annually. The woman inspector general, £500. In the secondary schools, there are 20 male inspectors and three women inspectors with annual salaries of £400 to £800 and £300 respectively. The women teachers of the elementary schools of whom there are approximately 111,000, draw on an average two-thirds the salary of men teachers, though they have the same training and do the same amount of work. In spite of the fact that there are two million women uh, engaged in industry, there are 900 male factory inspectors and hardly 60 female factory inspectors. Here again, the men are paid £1,000 and the women only £500 a year. In the postal and telegraph services, the same injustice exists. The men begin with a minimum wage of 20 shillings a week, while the women are paid 14 shillings. The men increase their salaries to 62 shillings a week, the women to 30 shillings. The main telegraph operator begins with 18 shillings and is finally given 65 shillings a week. The woman telegraph operator begins with 16 and reaches 40 shillings. The male clerks of the second division of the civil service are paid £250 and the women £100 annually. In 1908, the number of women employees in the postal and telegraph service of Great Britain was 13,259. The number of women supernumeraries, 30,476. Total number, 43,735. The highest positions heads of departments, staff officers, have been attained by four women and by 178 men. In recent years, many new callings have been open to women living in the cities. They are engaged in the manufacture of confectionery. Prominent and wealthy women have established businesses of their own, in which fine confections are produced, in many cases by destitute, nervous and overworked women music teachers. Women are active as bookbinders, stockbrokers, bills of exchange agents, auditors, teachers of domestic economy, instructors in gymnastics, ladies' guides, wardrobe dealers. The costly robes of the women of fashion are sold on commission through agents, paperers and decorators, etc. The Woman's Institute has published a complete handbook on the occupations of women. This book does not admit the occupation of explorer in which Mrs. French Sheldon has distinguished herself by exploration in the interior of Africa. In London, the number of women engaged in gainful pursuits is naturally very large, many of the women being alone in the world. The women journalists and authoresses in London have been numerous enough to organise a club of their own, the Writers' Club, in the Strand. The number of women employed in commercial houses is very large, 450,000. The weekly wages, especially the wages of the saleswomen in the shops, are often quite moderate, 20 to 25 shillings, where exceptional demands are made as to attractive dress and appearance. The women have organised the Shop Assistants Union for women with this weekly wage, the securing of good rooms and board at a reasonable price is a vital question. There are three apartment houses for working women, the Sloan Garden Houses, and the apartments for women in Cheney Street and in York Street. Women teachers, designers, artists, bookkeepers, cashiers, secretaries and stenographers obtain room and board here at varying rates. There are bedrooms, with two beds, for four and a half to five shillings a week for each person, furnished rooms for ten to fourteen shillings. The dining room is a restaurant, 
Only the evening meal, dinner, served from six to seven, is served to all at once. This meal costs ten pence, twenty cents. In Cheney Street, living expenses are somewhat higher. Six pence for breakfast, nine pence for luncheon, one shilling for dinner, which is about fifty-five cents a day for board. For suites of two to four rooms, $15 to $30 a month is charged. The Alexandra House in Kensington offers women artists similar privileges. The Brabanson House, under the protection of the Countess of Meath, accommodates employees of the shops only. Since the English women are, fortunately, independent in spirit, these institutions lack the scholastic, monastic or tutelary characteristics that are unfortunately found in many similar institutions in the continent. Very few of the English women have become industrial entrepreneurs. However, they have directed their attentions to agriculture as a means of earning a livelihood and have organised agricultural schools for women. Here, the women engage especially in poultry raising, vegetable and fruit growing, which in England are very lucrative. England annually imports £41 million worth of milk, eggs, poultry, vegetables and fruits. The councils of London, Berkshire, Essex and Kent counties support the Horticultural College for Women in Swanley, Kent, which was founded privately by wealthy and influential persons. In England, 100,000 women are engaged in agriculture. The demand for trained women gardeners today still exceeds the supply. Trained women gardeners are frequently engaged for long term of years to teach untrained gardeners. Women are employed in the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew and in Edinburgh. Holloway College has a woman gardener. In 1898, a model farm for women was founded by Lady Warwick in Reading. The institution began with 12 women students who cultivated two acres of land. Within a year, the number of students was quadrupled and then 11 acres were cultivated, instead of two. The woman that wishes to learn stock feeding and dairying is sent to a special farm. The course requires two years. The Agricultural Association for Women, founded by Lady Warwick, aids the women agriculturalists and finds positions for the pupils. In Great Britain, there are eight public schools in which women can learn agriculture and gardening. Many county councils have established courses in gardening, to which women are admitted. Agriculture is encouraged in England because the migration from the country to the city has increased extraordinarily. Agriculture is restricted in favour of stock raising, which gives employment to fewer labourers than agriculture. In spite of the great increase in population, the number of agriculturalists has steadily decreased since 1851. On the other hand, the industrial population, and it is predominantly urban, has increased significantly. Every industrialization means a pauperization to a certain extent. It produces the army of unskilled labourers, the victims of the sweating system, who in a destitute condition are left to eke out their wretched existence in the east ends of the large cities. There is no corresponding misery in the country districts. A marked industrialisation, therefore, causes a degree of general pauperism, such as is unknown in the agricultural regions of Western Europe. The pursuit of gardening among women has a social-political significance. The English labouring population is estimated at 4 million people, among whom the trade union movement has made considerable progress. The English trade union statistics of 1904 show 148 trade unions having women members. There are altogether 125,094 female members, i.e. 6.7% of all organised labourers. The greatest number of these are in the textile industry, almost 100,000. The total number of women labourers in this industry is 800,000. In the cotton industry, men will earn 29.6 shillings a week, women 18.8 shillings a week. In the woolen industry, men will earn 26.1 shillings a week, where women earn 13.1. In the lace industry, 
men will earn 39.6 shillings a week and the women will earn 13.5. In the woven goods industry, men will earn 31.5 shillings a week, whereas the women will earn 14.3 shillings a week. In the linen industry, men earn 22.4 shillings a week, whereas the women earn 10.9 shillings a week. In the jute industry, men earn 21.7 shillings a week, whereas women earn 13.5. In the textile industry, in which women are better organised than elsewhere, there being 96,000, there existed in 1906 the preceding difference between the wages of men and women. The organisation of women labourers was first advocated by Mrs Patterson and Miss Simcox at the Trade Union Congress held in Glasgow in 1875, but this organisation is confronted with the same difficulties as exist elsewhere. The women believe that they are engaged in non-domestic work only temporarily, therefore they are interested in the improvement of labour only to a slight degree, and in addition are burdened with housework while the male labourer is free when the factory closes. In almost all industries, women are paid lower wages than men, partly because those who are poorly equipped are given the lower grades of work and are not given an opportunity to do the more difficult work, partly too because they are women, i.e. people of the second order. Weekly wages of five to seven shillings are common. Naturally, the working woman who is all alone in the world cannot exist on such a sum. In one industry, only the women are given the same pay as the men for doing the same work. This is the textile industry in Lancashire. Since 1847, this industry has been protected by a law prohibiting night work for women. In this industry, men and women labourers are organised in the same trade union. The standard of living of the whole body of workers is very high. There can be no doubt that the legislation for the protection of labourers in this industry in which the exploitation of women and children had been carried to the extreme previous to 1847, has caused the raising of the general standard of living. Without the intervention of law, exploitation would have been pursued further in this industry. So the English women have before them an example of the salutary effect of legislation on the protection of the labourers of the textile industries. Nevertheless, there is in England a faction among the women's rights advocates which vigorously resists every movement for the protection of women labourers. It has organised itself into the League for Freedom of Labour Defence. It acts on the principle that every law for the protection of women labourers signifies an unjustifiable tutelage, that the working women should defend themselves through the organisation of trade unions, that the laws for the protection of women labourers decrease women's opportunities for work and drive them from their positions which are filled by men who can work at night. These fears are based purely on theory. In practice they are realised only in entirely isolated cases. The truth is that legislation for the protection of women labourers, prohibition of night work and the fixing of maximum number of work hours a day, is entirely favourable to an overwhelming majority of working women. It protects them against a degree of exploitation that they could not resist unaided because the majority of them are not organised and have no power to organise themselves. They will secure this power only through laws protecting women labourers. A comparative international study of laws for the protection of women labourers published by the Belgian Department of Labour shows that the number of women labourers is nowhere decreased and that wages have not declined as a result. Concerning this point, Mrs. Sidney Webb says, In most cases, women cannot be replaced by men, either because the men are not sufficiently dexterous or because their labour is too expensive. What employer will pay a man 20 to 30 shillings a week when a woman can accomplish just as much for 5 to 12 shillings a week? We shall return to this subject in discussing France. Those women that are members of trade unions persistently demand the right to vote. Many of them intimate that through the, this right they expect to secure an increase in wages. Naturally, the wishes of women labourers possessing the franchise will be considered very differently from the wishes of those not possessing this right. Proof of this has been given by the American woman suffrage states. Previous to the debates on woman suffrage in Parliament in 1904, a deputation of working women from the potteries in Staffordshire 
presented the Member of Parliament from that district with a petition having 4,000 signatures, requesting the introduction of a woman's suffrage bill, so that women might not continue to be excluded from all well-paid positions on account of their political inferiority. On this occasion, the Honourable Mr A. L. Emmett, Member of Parliament from the Oldham District, declared that the salary of the women employees in the postal savings banks had been reduced from £65, with an annual increase of £3, to £55, with an annual increase of £2.10. shillings. This would have been impossible if women had had the right to vote. Domestic servants are as yet organised only to a small extent, but they are well trained. They number 1,331,000. In none of the Anglo-Saxon countries of the world is there a schism between the women's rights movement of the middle class and the social democrats, such as is found in Germany. In each of the Anglo-Saxon countries, there is a socialist and even an anarchist party, but these parties do not antagonise the women's rights movement. The republican constitutions in America, the more democratic institutions of society, in general moderate the acute opposition. The absence of historical obstacles has a conciliating influence everywhere in these countries. In England, where history, monarchy and traditional class antagonism seem to give socialism favourable conditions of growth, socialism has for a long time been hampered by the trade unions. In other words, the English working men, the first to organise in Europe, had already improved their conditions greatly when the socialistic propaganda commenced in England. In their trade unions, they confined themselves to the economic field. They avoided mixing economics with politics. They worked with both parties. They stood clear of class hatred, and it was difficult to influence them with the speculative ultimate aims of social democracy. It has been only in the last decade that social democracy has made any progress in England. Therefore, the women's rights movement, middle class women and working women work together peaceably. Of all the women in Europe, the English women first became conscious of their duty toward the lower classes. In this atmosphere, clubs and homes for working girls and the London College for Working Women, institutions such as we on the continent know only in isolated cases, flourished readily. These institutions devote their attention to the girls of the lower ranks of society. The oldest club is the Soho Club and Home for Working Girls in Soho Square, London founded in 1880 by the Honourable Maud Stanley. It is open from 7 in the morning till 10 at night, and also on Sunday. Tea can be obtained for 2.5 pence, 5 cents, and dinner for 6.5 pence, 13 cents. The admission fee is 1 shilling. The annual dues are 8 shillings. The members have a library at their disposal, and they publish a club magazine. The London Girls Club Union Magazine. Members of such clubs including those outside London, have formed themselves into a union. The members of the committee, composed of wealthy and influential women, concern themselves personally with the affairs of the clubs, giving not only their money, but their time and influence. The College for Working Women has existed in Fitzroy Square for more than 25 years. Here are taught English, French, history, geography, drawing, arithmetic, reading, writing, singing, cooking, sewing, wood turning and other subjects. The quarterly fee is one shilling, for use of the library, attending lectures, etc. The fees for the courses range from one shilling and three pence to two shillings and sixpence, 31 to 62 cents, quarterly. The commission gives examinations. The institution grants scholarships and gives prizes. The number of such clubs in the whole of Great Britain is estimated at 800. The English woman is developing a considerable activity in the sociological field. Florence Nightingale, who organised a regular hospital service on the field of battle during the Crimean War, 1854, upon her return to England took steps to secure the training of educated women for the nursing profession, in which the English nurse has been the model. The most important training college for nurses not connected with religious orders is in Henrietta Street in London. Still, this distinguished profession, which is represented in the International Red Cross Society, has not yet attained state registration of nurses, i.e. an officially prescribed course of study concluding with a state examination. 
The English midwives are vehemently complaining because the new Midwives Act will be deliberated on by a commission having no midwife as a member. The superintendent of the London Institute for Midwives has protested against this on behalf of 26,000 midwives. Another woman, Octavia Hill, participated in the official inquiry of the living conditions of the London East End, which led to a systematic campaign against the slums. This work is at present continued in London by 31 or more women sanitary officers. They supplement the work of the factory inspectors, since they inspect the conditions under which women home workers live. In the whole country there are more than 80 such women sanitary officers. The home workers are mostly women. Half of the 900,000 or more English women engaged in the manufacture of ready-made clothing are permitted to work at home. Their wages are wretchedly low. The government, which pays the men of the Woolwich Arsenal trade union wages, is one of the worst exploiters of women who do not have the right to vote. In the army clothing works, the government employs women either directly or indirectly, as home workers through sweaters. The urgent need of widening women's field of labour and improving her conditions of labour is clearly stated in a lecture which Miss B. L. Hutchins delivered before the Royal Statistical Society. According to the census of 1901, there were 1,070,000 more women than men in Great Britain. In 1901, of every 1,000 persons, 516 were women. In 1841, only 511 were women. The longevity of women is higher than that of men, 47.77 to 44.13. When the old age pensions were introduced, 135 women to every 100 men applied for aid. Only half of the adult women, 5,700,000, are provided for through marriage, and then only for 20 or 30 years of their lives. Previous to marriage and afterward, most of the women are dependent on their own work for a living, because English women know from experience that their conditions of labour can be improved only through the exercise of the suffrage. They have adopted their militant tactics. In the field of poor relief, England again has taken the lead, inasmuch as she has permitted women to fill honorary posts in the municipal administration of the poor law. At the present time, 1,162 women are engaged in this work, 147 of whom are rural district councillors. The chief reform efforts of the women are directed to the care of children and to the workhouses, through which channels private aid reaches the recipient. Still, among the 22,000 guardians of the poor, the number of women hardly reaches a thousand. The old prejudice against women asserted itself even in this field. A society for promoting the return of women as poor law guardians is endeavouring to hasten reform. The Englishman has the valuable characteristic of forming organisations that strive to achieve very definite, though often temporary, ends, thus giving private initiative great flexibility. Such an organisation, with a limited purpose, is the Woman's Cooperative Guild. Formed in 1883, its purpose is to promote the cooperative movement, as far as consumption is concerned, among women, and to show them their enormous social and economic power as consumers. Women are the chief purchasers, as they purchase the housekeeping supplies. It is to their interest to purchase through the cooperative associations that exclude the middleman and at the end of the year pay a dividend to the members of the associations. These associations can exercise an important social influence, inasmuch as they create model conditions of labour for their employees. Short working day, high wages, early closing of the shops, no work on Sundays or holidays. Opportunity to sit down during working hours, insurance against sickness, old age insurance, sanitary conditions of labour, etc. The Guild organises women into cooperative societies and by theoretical as well as practical studies informs the women of the advantages of the cooperative system. The movement today numbers 26,000 members. In England, a marked increase in the use of alcoholic liquors among women was noticed, whereupon legal and medical measures were taken to curb the evil. The most effective measure would be an attack on the drunkenness of the husband which destroys the home. The official report 
of the first English school for mothers, located in St Pancras, London, has just appeared. This report shows that the experiment has been entirely successful. Of all measures to decrease the death rate among children, the establishment of schools for mothers is the best. During the course of instruction, the young married women were recommended to organise mothers' clubs in order to secure the necessaries of life more cheaply. The School for Mothers also attempts to give the young mothers nourishing meals, which can be furnished for the low sum of two and a quarter pence, about six cents. In the field of morals, English women have achieved a success which might well excite the envy of other countries, viz. the repeal of the law of 1869 concerning the state regulation of prostitution. The law had hardly been accepted by an accidental majority when public opinion, under the leadership of members of parliament, doctors and preachers, protested against the measure. Nothing made such an impression as the public appearance of a woman on behalf of the repeal of this measure concerning women. In spite of all scorn, all feigned and frequently malicious pretensions not to comprehend her, in spite of all attempts frequently brutal to browbeat her, Josephine Butler, from 1870 to 1886, unswervingly supported the view that the regulation was to be condemned from the legal, sanitary and moral viewpoint. Through the tireless work of Mrs Butler and her faithful associates, Parliament in 1886 repealed the Act providing for the regulation of prostitution. Since 1875, Mrs Butler has organised internationally the struggle against the official regulation of prostitution. On December the 30th, 1906, death came to the noble woman. Conditions in England are an evidence of how much more difficult it is for the women's rights movement to make progress in old countries than in new. Traditions are deeply rooted, customs are firmly established. The whole weight of the past is blocking the wheels of progress. In countries with older civilizations, the woman's question is entirely a question of force. End of section 6 Section 7 of the Modern Women's Rights Movement This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski The Modern Women's Rights Movement by Kathy Schermacher, translated by Carl Conrad Eckert. Section 7. Canada. Total population, 5,372,600. Women, 2,619,578. Men, 2,751,473. Canadian Federation of Women's Clubs, Canadian Women's Suffrage Association. Politically, Canada belongs to England. Geographically, it is part of North America. The Canadian women take a keen interest in the women's rights movement of the United States, which is setting them an excellent example. The last Congress of the International Council of Women met in Toronto, Canada, under the presidency of Lady Aberdeen, the present president and the wife of the former Governor General of Canada. Canada is a large, young, agricultural country with large families and primitive needs. Therefore, the progress of the women's rights movement is less marked in Canada than in the United States and England. Throughout Canada, the working woman is paid less than the working man, partly because she is more poorly trained, partly because she is kept in subordinate positions, partly because, in order to find work at all, she must offer her services for less money. Even when teaching, or doing piecework. Woman is paid less than man. In Canada, there is as yet no political women's rights movement strong enough to rectify this injustice by means of organizations and laws, as has been done in Australia. As yet, there are no women preachers in Canada. Women lawyers are confronted both with popular prejudice and legal obstacles. The study and practice of medicine is made very difficult for women, especially in Quebec and Montreal. In New Brunswick and Ontario, as well as in the Northwest provinces, there is a more liberal attitude toward women's pursuit of higher education. No Canadian university excludes women entirely, but not a few of the higher institutions of learning 
refuse women admission to certain courses, and refuse to grant certain degrees. The prevailing property laws in the eastern part of Canada legalize joint property holding, and we know what that means for women. In the western part, there is separation of property rights, or at least separate control over earnings, the wife having full control of her wages. The male Canadian, when 21 years old, becomes a voter and has full political rights. Footnote. In Canada, there are municipal elections, provincial parliamentary elections, and elections for the Dominion Parliament. End footnote. But the Canadian woman has only restricted suffrage rights. Unmarried women that are taxpayers exercise only active suffrage in municipal and school elections. Each province has its own laws regulating these conditions of suffrage. The Copenhagen Congress, 1906, of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance promoted the cause of women's suffrage in Canada very considerably. At a public meeting in which the Canadian delegate, Mrs. Macdonald Dennison, gave a report of the work of the International Congress, a resolution favoring women's suffrage was adopted, and this was used very effectively in propaganda. This propaganda was carried on among women's clubs, students' clubs, debating clubs, etc. The intellectual elite is today in favor of women's suffrage. In 1907, the Canadian Women's Suffrage Association, supported by the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the Women Teachers, the Medical Alumni, the Progressive Thought Association, the Toronto Local Council of Women, and the Progressive Club, sent a delegation to the mayor and council of the city of Toronto to express their support of a resolution which the council had drawn up favoring the right of married women to vote in municipal elections. Thus supported, the resolution was presented to the authorized commission. But here it was weakened by an amendment granting the suffrage only to married women owning property. The author of this amendment, a member of the Toronto City Council, received his reward for this kindness to the women in the form of a defeat at the next election. Organizations favoring women's suffrage have been founded throughout the country. Halifax, Nova Scotia, St. John, New Brunswick. Women's suffrage advocates speak in mass meetings and in men's clubs, etc. A demand for women's suffrage made by the Women's Christian Temperance Union was answered evasively by the Prime Minister, Sir Wilfrid Laurier. The provincial parliaments must take up the matter first, then the Dominion Parliament can consider it. In the spring of 1909, the City Council of Toronto sent a petition favouring women's suffrage to the Canadian Parliament, and at the same time, 1,000 women's suffrage advocates called on the Prime Minister. The 1909 Congress of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance will undoubtedly help the Canadian women's suffrage movement. End of Section 7 Section 8 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kata Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. South Africa. Natal and Cape Colony. Total population, 1,830,063. Transvaal. Total population, 1,354,200. Women's Suffrage Association for all three countries. In South Africa, Natal was the leader in the women's rights movement. In 1902, through the work of Mr. and Mrs. Onkatil, the Women's Equal Suffrage League was organized, which endeavored primarily to interest and educate its members. Later, in 1904, public propaganda was begun. In June, a petition was presented to the lower house by Mr. Onkatil. When he presented the matter in the form of a motion, it was not put to a vote, owing to the newness of the subject. The agricultural population opposes women's suffrage. The urban population favors it. The women's rights movement is made difficult in South Africa by the following circumstances. 
an enervating climate that makes people languidly content with things as they are. The lack of educated and independent women. Women teachers are state employees. The lack of a numerous class of working women. Difficult housekeeping, owing to the untrustworthiness of the natives as domestic servants. The peculiar position of men as taxpayers. Men only pay a poll tax. And as arms bearers. All men must serve in the army. In Cape Colony, similar conditions prevail. The Women's Enfranchisement League was formed in 1907, and in July 1907, there took place the first women's suffrage debate in Parliament. The women's suffrage societies of Natal, Cape Colony, and the Transvaal have formed an association and have joined the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. In Natal and Cape Colony, Women taxpayers exercise the right to vote in municipal affairs. The regulation of the suffrage qualifications for the federal parliament is being considered. The South African delegates in London, 1909, expressed the fear that women would not be given the federal suffrage. End of section 8. Section 9 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Sofia Andersson. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Käthe Schirmacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Section 9 The Scandinavian Countries. Sweden, total population, 5,377,713. Women, 2,751,257. Men, 2,626,456. Finland, total population, 2,712,562. Women, 1,370,480. Men, 1,342,082. Norway, total population, 2,240,860. Women, 1,155,169. Men, 1,242,000. Denmark, total population, 2,588,919. Women, 1,331,154. Men, 1,257,765. Sweden, Finland, Norway and Denmark will be grouped together since they are so closely connected by race and culture. Repetition will thereby be avoided and clearness promoted. All four countries have the advantage of having a population largely agricultural, a population scattered in small groups. Clearly, the problem of dealing with congested masses of people is here absent. Everywhere there is an eagerness for education. The educational average is high. The position of a woman is one of freedom for here have been kept alive the old Germanic traditions which we, the Germans, know only from reading Caesar or Tacitus, an external factor in hastening the solution of the question of woman's rights was the very unusual numerical superiority of women. The foreign wars which took the majority of the men away from home for long periods of time first in the Middle Ages and then again in the 17th and 18th centuries, and the fact that the Scandinavian countries themselves were afflicted with wars only to a small extent explained the freedom of the Scandinavian women. Like the English women, they had for centuries not known the significance of a war for women. In the absence of the men, women continued the transaction of business and industrial enterprises, 
in the name of the feudal law and as heads of families they administered affairs exercising rights that were elsewhere denied to women end of section 9《Section 10 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Sofia Andersson.《The Modern Woman's Rights Movement》by Käthe Schirmacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Sweden. Total population. 5,377,213 Women 2,751,257 Men 2,626,456 Swedish Association of Women's Clubs Women's Suffrage Society in Sweden, the women's rights movement is closely connected with that of the United States. The founder of the Swedish women's rights movement was Fredrika Bremer, who in 1845 visited the United States, studying the conditions of the women there. Upon her return, she encouraged the Swedish women through her novel Herta to emancipate themselves. This took place in 1856. The government, being unable to disregard the free traditions of the past, was thoroughly in favour of the demands of the women's rights movement. As early as 1700, women owning property exercised the right of voting in the election of ministers. In 1843, this right had been extended to all women taxpayers. In 1845, the daughter's right of inheritance had been made equal to that of the sons. In 1853 was begun the custom of appointing women teachers in the small rural schools. In 1859, women were admitted as teachers in all public institutions of learning. Since 1861, women have been eligible as dentists, regimental surgeons and organists, but not as preachers. In 1862, every unmarried woman or widow over 21 years of age and paying a tax of 500 crowns, about $135, was granted active suffrage in municipal affairs. The municipal electors, inasmuch as they elect the members of the Landsting, county council, and the members of the town councils, exercise a political influence. For the members of the Landsting and the town councils elect the members of the two chambers of the Riksdag, the national legislative body. On February the 10th, 1909, all tax-paying women, unmarried, widowed and married, were granted the passive suffrage, except for the office of county councillor. Here is a curious fact. Married women that do not possess the right to vote in municipal affairs can still hold office. In 1866, the art academies were opened to women. In 1870, the universities. Later, women were permitted to enter the postal and telegraph service. In peculiar contrast to these reforms are the old regulations concerning the guardianship of women. Woman never reaches her majority. She must always have a male representative, which has been especially supported by the nobility and conservatives and has been used chiefly to maintain the subordination of married women. Against this condition, the association to advocate the right of married women to possess property has struggled since 1873. It secured in 1874 the right of women to make a marriage contract providing for the separation of property. The husband still remains the guardian of the wife. Today the wife controls her personal earnings, but merely as long as they are in cash. Whatever she buys with them falls into the control of the husband. This association now undertook the political education of the women voters in municipal elections. 
Hitherto they had made little use of their right to vote. In 1887, of 62,362 women having the right to vote, only 4,844 voted. Thanks to the propaganda of this association, participation in elections is today quite general. The introduction of co-education in the secondary schools is also due to the activity of this association, supported by Professor Wallace, who had investigated co-education in the United States. But in the field of secondary education there is still much to be done for Swedish women. Their salaries as teachers are lower than those of men. In matters of advancement and pensions women are discriminated against though they are expected to possess professional training and ability equal to that of the men. In 1889, the Baroness of Adler Sparre succeeded, through untiring propaganda, in securing for women admission to school and poor law administration. To the Baroness is due also the revival of needlework as an applied art, as well as the revival of agricultural instruction for women. All of these ideas she had expressed since 1859 in her magazine For the Home, Fyrsheim. Since 1884, the centre of the Swedish women's rights movement has been the Fredrika Bremer League, founded by the Baroness of Adlersparre. This is a sort of women's institute and undertakes inquiries, collects data, secures employment organizes members of trades and professions, fixes minimum wages, organizes petitions, gives advice, offers leadership, gives stipends. In short, in various ways it centralizes the Swedish women's rights movement. In 1896, the Association to Advocate the Right of Married Women to Possess Property, affiliated with the Fredrika Bremer League, the following are the facts concerning the work of educated women in Sweden. The number of elementary school teachers is about double that of the men. In 1899 there were 9,950 women as compared with 5,322 men. The salaries of the women are everywhere lower than those of the men. In 1908 there were 12,000 women teachers in the elementary schools, their annual salary being 1,400 crowns, $375 or more. There are 35 women doctors in Sweden, most of whom practice in Stockholm. The Swedish midwives are well trained. Nursing is a respected calling for educated women. Also, kinesiatrics, hygienic gymnastics the latter being lucrative as well. The first woman doctor of philosophy was Ellen Fries, who received the degree in 1883. Sonja Kovalevska was a professor in mathematics in the Free University of Stockholm. Ellen Kay is also a teacher, her field being sociology. In Sweden there are two women university lecturers, one in law, the others in physics. As yet, there are no women lawyers and preachers. The Legislative Act of February 1909, which secures for women their appointment in all state institutions, educational, scientific, artistic and industrial, will greatly improve women's professional prospects. Sweden is not a land of large manufactories, Hence, there is no problem arising from the presence of large masses of industrial labourers. Since 1865, the wages of the agricultural labourers have risen 85% for women and 65% for men. There are 242,914 women engaged in agriculture, 57,053 in industry, 3,400 of the latter being organized. There are 15,376 women employed in commerce. They are throughout paid lower wages than the men, 400 to 1,200 crowns, i.e. 
$107 to $321. The organization of working women is not connected with the women's rights movement. It is affiliated with the working men's movement. In this field, Ellen Kay has been quite active as a national educator. She is a supporter of the laws for the protection of women laborers, and on this point she has frequently met opposition among the women's rights advocates of Sweden, an opposition similar to that offered by the English Federation for Freedom of Labor Defense. In 1907, an exposition of homework was held in Stockholm, similar to the German expositions. The right to vote in national elections. See the report of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance Congress, Amsterdam, 1908. In Sweden is exercised by landowners and taxpayers, however, only by men. Therefore, there is a Swedish National Women's Suffrage Society which in recent years has grown very considerably, having over 10,000 members. In the autumn of 1906, a delegation from the society was received by the Prime Minister and the King, who, however, could hold out no promise of a government measure favouring women's suffrage. The society then tried to influence the Parliament with an enormous petition, having 142,188 signatures. This petition was presented February the 6th, 1907. In 1906 and 1907, the Labour Party and the Liberal Party inserted women's suffrage into their platforms and presented bills favouring the measure. Twice, in 1907 and 1908, Parliament rejected the clause providing for women's suffrage. On February the 13th, 1909, the Swedish males were granted universal suffrage, active and passive, in national elections. At the same time, Parliament tried to appease the women by granting them the passive suffrage in municipal elections. In the spring of 1909, the bill concerning women's right to vote in national elections, Staff Bill, was accepted by the Constitutional Commission by a vote of 11 to 9. The lower house also accepted it, but it was rejected by the upper house. The political successes of the Norwegian women have a stimulating effect on Sweden. Prohibition has influential advocates in Sweden and supporters in Parliament. At the request of the Swedish women's clubs, police matrons were appointed to cooperate with the police regulating prostitution in Stockholm, Helsingborg, Trelleborg and Malmö. At the present time, a commission is considering future plans for police regulation of prostitution in Sweden. In Sweden, where there are about half a million organized adherents to the cause of temperance, there are 77 daily papers that consistently print matter pertaining to temperance. Not only these 77 papers, most of whose editors are good templars, but at least 13 other dailies refuse all advertisements of alcoholic liquors. See the supplement, opposed to alcoholism. In One People, One School, for April 1909. In Norway, where similar conditions prevail, there are a quarter of a million temperance advocates and about 40 daily papers that favor the cause. End of section 10. Section 11 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Sofia Andersson. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Käthe Schirmacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Finland. Total population 2,712,562. Women, 1,370,480. Men, 
1,342,082. No league of a Finnish women's clubs. No women's suffrage league. The discussion of the Finnish women's rights movement will follow that of Sweden, for Finland was till 1809 politically a part of Sweden. The cultural tie still exists. In Finland also, the women's rights movement is of literary origin. Adelaide Enroth and Fredrika Runeborg preached the gospel of women's emancipation to an intellectual elite. Through the influence of Björnsson, Ibsen and Strindberg, the discussion of the social lie, Gesellschaftslüge, became general. In the 80s of the last century, the ideas and criticisms were turned into deeds and reforms. Above all, a thorough education for women was demanded. Since 1883, co-educational schools have been established through private funds in all cities of the country. These institutions have received state aid since 1891. They are secondary schools, having the curriculums of German Realschulen and gymnasiums. A Realschule teaches no classics, but is a scientific school emphasizing manual training. A gymnasium prepares for the university, making the classics an essential part of the curriculum. Not only is the student body composed of boys and girls, but the direction and instruction in these schools are divided equally between women and men. Thereby the predominance of the men is counteracted. Even before the establishment of these schools, women had privately prepared themselves for the abiturienten examen, examinations taken when leaving the secondary schools, and had entered the University of Helsingfors. In 1870, the first woman entered the university, in 1873 the second, in 1885 two more followed. Today, 478 women are registered in Helsingfors. Most of these women are devoting themselves to the teaching profession, which is more favorable to women in Finland than in Sweden. The first woman doctor, Rosina Hickel, has been practicing in Helsingfors since 1879. The number of women doctors has since risen to 20. In Finland, any reputable person can plead before the court, but there are no professional women lawyers and no women preachers. However, there are women architects and women factory inspectors. Since 1864, women have been employed in the postal service, since 1869 in the telegraph service and in the railway offices. Here they draw the same salary as the men when acting in the same capacity. Commercial callings have been opened to women, and there is a demand for women as office clerks. The statistical yearbook for Finland does not give separate statistics concerning working women. The total number of laborers in 1906 was 113,578. Perhaps one-tenth of these were women, engaged chiefly in the textile and paper industries, and in the manufacture of provisions and ready-made clothing. There are few married women engaged in industrial work. Women are admitted to membership in the trade unions. In a monograph on women engaged in the ready-made clothing industry by Vera Hilt, Statistics of Labour, 6. Helsingfors, 1908, are found the following facts, established by official investigation of 621 establishments employing 3,205 women laborers. 97.7% of the women were unmarried and 2.3% married. The minimum wages were 10 cents a day, the maximum $1.50. The women laborers living with their parents or relatives numbered 1,358. The sanitary conditions were bad. Home industry in Finland, as well as in Sweden and Norway, has recently shown a striking growth. 
it was on the point of succumbing to the cheap factory products. In order to perpetuate the industry, schools for housewives were established in connection with the public high schools in the rural districts. In these schools were taught, in addition to domestic science and agriculture, various domestic handicrafts that offered the women a pleasant and useful activity during the long winters. Not being carried on intensively, these handicrafts would never lead to exploitation and overwork. In 1864, the guardianship of men over unmarried women was abolished. Married women are still under the guardianship of their husbands. Since 1889, the wife has been able to secure a separation of property by means of a contract. She has control over her earnings when joint property holding prevails. The unmarried women, taxpayers and landowners have been voters in municipal elections since 1865. In the rural districts they have also had the right to hold local administrative offices. Just as in Sweden they have the right to participate in the election of ministers. And since 1891 and 1893 they have had active and passive suffrage in regard to school boards and poor law administration. Taking advantage of the collapse of Russia in the Far East, Finland in May 1906 established universal active and passive suffrage for all male and female citizens over 24 years of age. She was the first European country to take this step. On March the 15th, 1907, the Finnish women exercised for the first time the right to suffrage in state elections. Nineteen women were elected to the parliament, comprising 200 representatives. The women belonged to all parties, but most of them were adherents to the old Finnish party having six representatives, and of the Socialist Party, having nine representatives. Ten of the women representatives were either married or were widows. They belonged quite as much to the cultured property-owning class as to the masses. This parliament was dissolved in April 1908. In the new elections of July the 25th, women were elected as representatives. Here again most of the elected women belonged to the old Finnish party, with six representatives, and to the socialists, with thirteen representatives. Nine of the women representatives are married. Of the husbands of these women, one is a doctor, one a clergyman, one a working man, two are farmers, etc. Of the unmarried women representatives, six are teachers, two are tailors, Two are editors of women's newspapers, four are travelling lecturers, one is a factory inspector, and there is one doctor of philosophy. In both parliaments the women presented numerous measures, some of general concern, others bearing of women's rights. See the complete list of measures in Jus Suffragi, September the 15th, 1908. This is the organ of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. Some of the measures provided for the improvement of the legal status of illicit children, parental authority, the protection of maternity, the abolition of the husband's guardianship over the wife, the better protection of children, the protection of the woman on the street, the abolition of the regulation of prostitution, and the raising of the age of consent. This list of measures indicates that the Finnish laws regulating marriage are still antiquated, and that the political emancipation of a woman did not immediately effect her release from legal bondage. One of the Finnish woman's advocates said, our short experience has taught us that we may still have a hard fight for equal rights. Not only the antiquated marriage laws are inconsistent with the national political rights of women. In the municipal election laws too, woman is treated unjustly. Married women do not exercise the right of suffrage. 
and widows and unmarried women possess the passive suffrage only in the election of poor law administrators and school boards. Two women's suffrage organizations, Unionen and Finsk Kvinnoförening, have existed since 1906. They have no party affiliations. Two new women's suffrage societies, Svenska Kvinnoförbundet and Night Lutto, Young Finnish, are party organizations. The bill concerning the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution has meanwhile become law, replacing the former unsatisfactory and for Finland exceptional law. The law corresponding to the English Vagrancy Act, supplement to paragraph 45 of the Finnish Civil Code, provides that whoever accosts a woman in public places for immoral purposes shall pay a fine of $50. On October 31, 1907, the manufacture, importation, sale or storing of alcoholic liquors in any form whatever was prohibited by law. In recent years, the Finnish woman temperance lecturer Trig Helenius has carried on a successful international propaganda. External and internal difficulties have to the present made impossible the formation of Finnish women's clubs and a federation of the women voters. End of section 11《Section 12 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Sofia Andersson. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kette Schimacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Section 12. Norway. Total population 2,240,860. Women 1,155,169. Men 1,085,691. League of Norwegian Women's Clubs. Women's Suffrage Association. In recent years, the Norwegian women's rights movement has made marked progress. Just as in the other Scandinavian countries, women were freed as early as the middle of the 19th century from the most burdensome legal restrictions by a liberal majority in parliament. In 1854, the daughters were given the same right of inheritance as the sons, and male guardianship for unmarried women was abolished. However, the real women's rights movement, like that of Sweden and Finland, began in the 80s of the last century. Åsta Hansten, Clara Collett, Björnsson and Ibsen had prepared public opinion for the emancipation of women. Like Fredrika Bremer, Åsta Hansten had emigrated to America owing to the prejudices of her countrymen. And again, like Fredrika Bremer, she returned to her native land and could rejoice over the progress of the movement which she had instigated. In 1884, the Norwegian Women's League was founded. It has since 1886 published a semi-monthly women's suffrage magazine, Nylende. In 1887, the Norwegian women's rights movement won the same victory that Mrs. Butler had won in England in 1886. The official regulation of prostitution was abolished. Neither in Sweden nor in Denmark has a similar reform been secured thus far. As early as 1882, several university faculties had admitted women and in 1884 women were given the legal right to secure an academic training, and they were declared eligible to receive all scholarships and all academic degrees. In 1904 a law was enacted admitting women to a number of public offices. Paragraph 12 of the Constitution excludes them from the office of minister in the cabinet. They are excluded from consulships on international grounds from military offices by the nature of the offices, 
and from the theological field through the backwardness of the Norwegian clergy. But they were admitted to the teaching and legal professions and to some of the administrative departments of the government. The law made no discrimination between married and unmarried women. It is believed that the women can decide best for themselves whether or not they can combine the work of an administrative office with their domestic duties. Hitherto, the teaching profession had presented difficulties for women. Fewer women than men were appointed. The women were given the subordinate positions and paid lower salaries. The women had energetically protested against these conditions since the passing of the law of 1904. In 1908 they succeeded in having the magistrate of Christiania raise the initial salary of women teachers in the elementary schools from 900 crowns, $241, to 1,100 crowns, $295 and the maximum salary from 1,500 crowns, 402 dollars, to 1,700 crowns, 455 dollars. In Christiania, the women also demanded that women teachers be given the position of headmaster. There were many women in the profession, 2,900 in the elementary schools, and 736 in the secondary schools. The Women Shop Assistants Trade Union in an open meeting in Christiania has demanded equal pay for equal work. By a law passed in May 1908, women employees in the postal service were given the same pay as the men employees. As a result of this, the women telegraph operators, supported by the Norwegian Women's Suffrage Association, drew up a petition requesting the same concession as was made the women postal employees, and presented the petition to the government and the Storting. This movement favouring an increase of wages was strongly supported by the women's suffrage movement. The women taxpayers, including married women, have possessed active and passive suffrage in municipal affairs since 1901. The property qualification requires that a tax of 300 crowns, $80, must be paid in the rural districts, and 400 crowns, $107, in cities. In 1902, women exercised the suffrage in municipal affairs for the first time. In Christiania, six women were elected to municipal offices. The Norwegian League of Women's Clubs and the Women's Suffrage Associations protested to the government and to the parliament because suffrage in the national elections had been withheld from the women. The separation of Sweden and Norway, 1906, which concerned the women greatly, but in which they could exercise no voice, was a striking proof of women's powerlessness in civil affairs. Hence, the Norwegian Women's Suffrage League instituted a woman's ballot, in which 19,000 votes were cast in favour of separation, none being cast against it. In 1907, six election bills favourable to women's suffrage were presented to the Storting, and June 10, 1907, women taxpayers were granted active and passive suffrage in municipal elections, affecting about 300,000 women. 200,000 are still not enfranchised. This right of suffrage is accorded to married women, The next general elections will take place in 1909. Since the Norwegian men have active and passive suffrage in parliamentary elections, the women also made their demands to the Storting. The ministry resolved, in pursuance of this demand, to present the Storting with the requisite constitutional amendment. Article 52 the Storting requested that before the next municipal elections, 1910, the Ministry present a satisfactory bill providing for women's suffrage in municipal elections. At the present time, 142 women are city councillors, 122 in the cities. 
In the autumn of 1909, women will for the first time participate in the parliamentary elections. At two congresses of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance, Amsterdam in 1908 and London in 1909, Norway was officially represented by the wife of the Minister of State, Kwam. The emancipation of women legally and in the professions had preceded their political emancipation. Norwegian women first practiced as dentists in 1872. Since 1884, women have been druggists and have practiced medicine. They practice in all large cities. There are 38 women engaged as physicians for the courts, as school physicians, as university assistants in museums and laboratories, and as sanitary officers. Since 1904, there have been two women lawyers. Candidata juris Elisa Sam was the first woman to profit by this reform. The first woman university professor was Mrs. Matilda Schott in Christiania. Today, there are three such professors. There are 37 women architects. In 1888, married women were given the right to make marriage contracts providing for separate property holding. Even where there is joint property holding, the wife controls her earnings. In Norway, the law protects the illegitimate mother and her child better than elsewhere. The Norwegian law regards and punishes all accomplices in infanticide, all those that drive a woman to such a step, the illicit father, the parents, the guardians and employers who desert a woman in such circumstances and put her out into the street. Since 1891, women have been eligible to hold office as poor law administrators. Since 1899, they can be members of school boards. The number of working women is 67,000. Of these, 2,000 are organized. End of section 12. Section 13 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Sofia Andersson. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Käthe Schirmacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Section 13. Denmark. Total population, 2,588,919. Women, 1,331,154. Men, 1,257,765. Federation of Danish Women's Clubs, Women's Suffrage League. The origin of the women's rights movement in Denmark is also literary. To Fredrika Bremer in Sweden, Åsta Handsten and Clara Collett in Norway must be added as emancipators Matilda Fibiger and Pauline Worm in Denmark. The writings of both of these women in favor of emancipation, Clara Raphael's letters and Sensible People, date back as far as 1848. They were inspired by the liberal ideas prevailing in Germany previous to the March Revolution. An organized women's rights movement did not come into being until 25 years later. A liberal parliamentary majority in Denmark abolished in 1857 male guardianship over unmarried women and in 1859 established the equal inheritance rights of daughters thus following the example of Sweden and Norway. It was necessary first to secure the support of public opinion through a literary discussion of women's rights. This was carried on between 1868 and 1880 by Georg Brandes, who translated John Stuart Mill's The Subjection of Women, and by Björnsson and Ibsen. In 1871, Representative Bayer and his wife organized the first women's rights society, the Danish Women's Club, which rapidly spread throughout Denmark. 
At first, the club endeavoured to secure a more thorough education for women, and therefore laboured for the improvement of the girls' high schools, and for the institution of co-educational schools. In 1876, it secured the admission of women to the University of Copenhagen. In the teaching profession, women are employed in greater numbers and are better paid than in Sweden at the present time. There are 3,003 women elementary school teachers and 2,240 women teachers in the high schools. As yet, there are no women lecturers or professors in the university. In 1904, women were declared eligible by an official ordinance to hold university offices. Since 1860, women have filled subordinate positions in the postal and telegraph services, and since 1889, they have also filled the higher positions. There are in all 1,500 women employees. The subordinate positions in the national and local administrations are to a certain extent open to them. The number of women engaged in industrial pursuits is 47,617, the number of domestic servants 89,000. The domestic servants are organized only to a limited extent, 800 being organized. The women in the industries are better organized, chiefly in the same trade unions as the men. In 1899, the women comprised one-fifth of the total number of organized laborers. Since then, this proportion has increased considerably. The average wages of the women domestic servants are 20 crowns, 5.36 dollars a month. The average wages of the working women are from 2 to 2.5 crowns, 53 to 67 cents a day. Since 1880, the wife can secure separate property holding rights through a marriage contract. Where joint property holding prevails, the wife controls her own earnings and savings. In 1888, municipal suffrage was demanded by the Danish Women's Club, but the Riksdag rejected the measure. Since then, the question has occupied much attention. In 1906, the Congress of the Women's International Suffrage Alliance performed excellent propaganda work. New women's suffrage societies were organized and the older societies were enlarged. It might be well to mention Dansk Kvindesamfund, Politisk Kvindeförening, Landsförbund, Valgrättsföreningen of 1908, a Christian association of men and women. In the meantime, the bill concerning municipal suffrage was being sent from one house to the other. Finally, on February 26, 1908, it was adopted by the upper house, on April 14, by the lower house, and on April 20, signed by the king. All taxpayers 25 years of age were permitted to vote. All classes of women, widows, unmarried and married women were enfranchised. They have active and passive suffrage. In March 1909, they exercised both rights for the first time. The participation in the election was general. Six women were elected in Copenhagen. The women are now demanding the suffrage in national affairs. Immediately after the victory of 1908, the Women's Suffrage League organized strong demonstration in 40 cities in favor of this demand. Here it must be mentioned that the women in Iceland were granted in the autumn of 1907 active and passive suffrage in municipal affairs. In January 1908 they participated in the elections for the first time. In Reykjavik, the capital, 2,850 people voted, 1,220 of whom were women. Four women were elected to the city council one polling the highest number of votes. In 1909, the Icelandic Women's Suffrage League joined the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. A number of Icelandic women's suffrage societies in Canada have affiliated with the Canadian Women's Suffrage League. On March 30, 1906, official regulation of prostitution was abolished in Denmark, 
but a new law of similar character was enacted providing for stringent measures. End of section 13「Section 14 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Keita Schirmacher Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart The Netherlands Total population, 5,673,237. Women, 2,583,535. Men, 2,520,620. Federation of the Netherlands Women's Clubs. Women's Suffrage League. Although women are in a numerical superiority in the Netherlands, it is much less difficult for them to find non-domestic employment than it is for the German women, for instance. The Netherlands has large colonies and therefore a good market for its male workers. The educated Dutchman is kindly disposed toward the women's right movement, and in the educated circles, The wife really enjoys rights equal to those of the husband, which is less frequently the case among the lower classes. The marriage laws are based on the Code Napoleon, which, however, was considerably altered in 1838. The guardianship of the husband over the wife still prevails. According to paragraph 160 of the Civil Code, the husband controls the personal property that the wife acquires, but he administers her real estate only with the wife's consent. According to paragraph 163 of the Civil Code, the wife cannot give away, sell, mortgage, or acquire anything independently. She can do those things only with her husband's written consent. No marriage contract can annul this requirement, but the wife can stipulate the independent control of her income. According to paragraph 1637 of the Civil Code, the wife is permitted to control for the benefit of the family the money that she earns while fulfilling a labor contract. Affiliation cases, it is true, are recognized by law, but under considerable restrictions. The first sign of the women's rights movement manifested itself in the Netherlands in 1846. At that time, a woman appeared in public for the first time as a speaker. She was the Countess Mahrenholz Bülow, who introduced kindergartens or frugal system into the Netherlands. In 1857, Elementary education was made compulsory in the Netherlands. At that time, this instruction was free, undenominational, and under the control of the state, but in 1889, it was partly given over into denominational and private hands. The secondary schools for girls are partly municipal, partly private. Most of the elementary schools are co-educational. In the secondary schools, the sexes are segregated. In the higher institutions of learning, co-education prevails. The right of girls to attend being granted as a matter of course. Girls were admitted to the high schools also without any opposition. These measures were due to Minister Thorbeck. Thirty years ago, the first woman registered at the University of Leiden. Women study and are granted degrees in all departments of the universities of Leiden, Utrecht, Groningen, and Amsterdam. In the elementary, secondary, and higher institution of learning, there are fewer women teachers than men, 
and the salary of the women teachers is lower. Women are now being appointed as science teachers in boys' schools also. The government is planning measures opposed to having married women as teachers and as employees in the postal service. The women's clubs are vigorously protesting against this. Women serve as examination commissioners and as members of school boards, though in small numbers. The city school boards rely almost entirely upon women for supervising the instruction in needlework. Since 1904, two women were appointed as state school inspectors with salaries only sufficient for maintenance. In the Netherlands, there are 20 women doctors, 31 including those in the colonies, 57 women druggists, 5 women lawyers, and 1 woman lecturer in the University of Groningen. There are three women preachers in the Liberal League of Protestants. Since 1899, four women have been factory inspectors, two prison superintendents, two superintendents of rural schools. 34 are in the courts for the protection of wards. Women participate in the care of the poor and the care of dependent children. The care of dependent children is in the hands of a national society, Pro Juventude, which aided in securing juvenile courts in the Netherlands. Especially useful in the education and support of working women has been the Tessel Benefit Society, or Tessel Schadeverein, which is national in its organization. It will be well to state here that the appointment of women factory inspectors was secured in a rather original manner. In 1898, a national exhibition of commodities produced by women was held in The Hague. In a conspicuous place, the women placed an empty picture frame with this inscription. The women inspectors of all these commodities produced by women. This has turned results. The shop assistants of both sexes organized themselves conjointly in Amsterdam in 1898. There are two organizations of domestic servants. The Dutch woman's rights advocates proved by investigation that for the same work, the working women, because they were women, were paid 50% less than men. The Working Women's Information Bureau, which was made into a permanent institution as a result of the exhibition in 1898, has been concerning itself with the protection of working women and with their organization. The women organizers belong to the middle class. The Socialist Party in the Netherlands has been organizing working women into trade unions. In this, the party has encountered the same difficulties as exist elsewhere. To the present time, it can point only to small successes. Two of the Socialist women's rights advocates are Henrietta Roland and Rouge Vos. Henrietta Roland is of middle class parentage, being a daughter of a lawyer. She is the wife of an artist of repute. Rouge Vos, on the contrary, comes from the lower classes. Both of these women played an important part in the strike of 1903. They organized the United Garment Workers Union. In spite of the fact that a woman can be ruler of the Netherlands, the Dutch women possess only an insignificant right of suffrage. In the Dyke associations, they have a right to vote if they are taxpayers or own property adjoining the dikes. In June 1908, the Lutheran Synod gave women the same right to vote in church affairs as the men possess. The Evangelical Synod, on the other hand, rejected a similar measure 
as well as one providing for the ordaining of women preachers. An attempt to secure municipal suffrage of women failed and resulted in the enactment of reactionary laws. In 1883, Dr. Aleta Jacobs, the first woman doctor in the Netherlands, acting on the advice of the well-known jurist and later minister Van Houten, requested an Amsterdam magistrate to enter her name on the list of municipal electors. As a taxpayer, she was entitled to this right. At the same time, she requested Parliament to grant her the suffrage in national elections. Both requests were summarily refused. In order to make such requests impossible in the future, Parliament inserted the word male in the election law. These occurrences aroused in the Dutch women an interest in political affairs, and in 1894, they organized a woman suffrage society, which soon spread to all parts of the country. The liberals, radicals, liberal democrats, and socialists admitted women members to their political clubs and frequently consulted the women concerning the selection of candidates. The clubs of the conservative and clerical parties have refused to admit women. At the general meeting in 1906, a part of the members of the Women's Suffrage Society separated from the organization and formed the Women's Suffrage League. The Bon for Frauen Gisrecht. The older organization was called Vereniging voor Vrouwen Gisrecht. Both carry on an energetic propaganda in the entire country, the older organization being the more radical. In 1908, the older organizations made all necessary preparation for the Amsterdam Congress of the Women's Suffrage Alliance, which resulted in a large increase in its membership from 3,500 to 6,000, and resulted, furthermore, in the founding of a men's league for women's suffrage, modeled after the English organization. The question of women's suffrage has aroused a lively interest throughout the Netherlands. Even the Bond increased its membership during the winter of 1908 and 1909 from 1,500 to 3,500. In September 1908, there were two great demonstrations in The Hague in favor of universal suffrage for both men and women. The right to vote in Holland is based on the payment of a property tax or ground rent. Therefore, numerous proposals in favor of widening the suffrage had been made previously. When a liberal ministry came into power in 1905, it undertook a reform of the suffrage laws. In 1907, the Committee on the Constitution, by a vote of six out of seven, recommended that the Parliament grant active and passive suffrage to men and women. But with the fall of the Liberal Ministry fell the hope of having this measure enacted, for there is nothing to be expected from the present government composed of Catholic and Protestant conservatives. As has already been stated, propaganda is in the meantime being carried on with increasing vigor, and in Java, a women's suffrage society has also been organized. A noted jurist, who is a member of the Dutch Bon Four Frauen Kistrecht, has just issued a pamphlet in which he proves the necessity of granting women suffrage. Man makes the laws. Wherever the interest of the unmarried or the married woman are in conflict with the interest of men, the rights of the woman will be set aside. This is injurious to man, woman, and child, and it blocks progress. 
The remedy is to be found only in woman's suffrage. The granting of woman's suffrage is an urgent demand of justice. End of section 14 Read by Mama Chira, Tangerang Selatan, 2022 Section 15 of the Modern Women's Rights Movement This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard. The Modern Women's Rights Movement by Kathy Schkermaker, translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Section 15. Switzerland. Total population 3,313,870. Women about 1,700,000. Men about 1,616,000. Federation of Swiss Women's Clubs, Women's Suffrage League. Switzerland's existence and welfare depend on the harmony of the German, the French, and the Italian elements of the population. Switzerland is accustomed to considering three racial elements. Out of three different demands, it produces one acceptable compromise. Naturally, the Swiss women's rights movement has steadily developed in the most peaceful manner. No literary manifesto, no declaration of principles of freedom is at the root of this movement. It is supported by public opinion, which is gradually being educated to the level of the demands of the movement. The women's rights movement began in Switzerland as late as 1880. In 1885, the Swiss Women's Club movement was started. The Federation of Women's Clubs is made up of cantonal women's clubs in Zurich, Bernay, Geneva, St. Gallen, Basel, Lausanne, Neuchatel, and in other cities, as well as of intercantonal clubs such as the Swiss Public Utility Women's Club, Schweizer Gemeinnütziger Verein, La Fraternité, the Intercantonal Committee of Federated Women, etc. Recently, a Catholic Women's League was formed. Since 50% of the Swiss women remain unmarried, the women's rights movement is a social necessity. In the field of education, the authorities have been favorable to women in every way. In nine cantons, the elementary schools are co-educational. There are public institutions for higher learning for girls in all cities. In German Switzerland, Zurich, Winterthur, St. Gallen, Bernay, Girls are admitted to the higher institutions of learning for boys, or they can prepare themselves in the girls' schools for the examination required for entrance to the universities, Matura. There are 18 seminaries that admit girls only. The seminaries in Kusnach, Rorschach, and Croy are coeducational. Women teachers are not appointed in the elementary schools of the cantons of Glarus and Appenzel Outer Roads. On the other hand, in the cantons of Geneva, Neuchatel, and Ticino, 59-66% to 66 of the teachers in the elementary schools are women. They are given lower salaries than the men. The canton of Zurich pays, by law, equal wages to its men and women teachers but the additional salary paid by the municipalities and rural districts to the men teachers is greater than that paid to the women. In its elementary schools, the canton of Vaud employs 500 women teachers, some of whom are married. The Swiss universities have been open to women since the early 60s of the 19th century. As in France, the native women use this right far less than foreign women, especially Russians and Germans. The total number of women studying in the Swiss universities is about 700. Most of the Swiss women that have studied in the universities enter their teaching profession. Women are frequently employed as teachers in high schools, as clerks and as librarians. Sometimes these positions are filled by foreign women. The first woman lecturer in a university in which German is the language used has been employed in Bernay since 1898. She is Dr. Anna Tumarkin, 
a native Russian, having the right to teach in universities aesthetics and the history of modern philosophy. In 1909, she was appointed professor. In each of the universities of Zurich, Brne, and Geneva, a woman has been appointed as university lecturer. Women doctors practice in all of the larger cities. There are 12 in Zurich. The City Council of Zurich has decided to furnish free assistance to women during confinement and to establish a municipal maternity hospital. In Zurich, there has been established for women a hospital entirely under the control of women. The chief physician is Frau Dr. Heim. The practice of law has been open to women in the canton of Zurich since 1899 and in the canton of Geneva since 1904. Miss Anna McEnroth, Dr. Jules, a native German, was the first Swiss woman lawyer. Miss Nellie Farver was the second. Miss Dr. Bruce Lyne was refused admission to the bar in Bernay. Miss Farver was the first woman to plead before the federal court in Bernay, the capital. As yet, there are no women preachers in Switzerland. In Lausanne, there is a woman engineer. In the field of technical schools for Swiss women, much remains to be done. The commercial education of women is also neglected by the state, while the professional training of men is everywhere promoted. Women are employed in the postal and telegraph service. The Swiss hotel system offers remunerative positions and thoroughly respectable callings to women of good family. In 1900s, the number of women laborers was 233,912. They are engaged chiefly in the textile and ready-made clothing industries, in lace-making, cabinet-making, and the manufacture of food products, pottery, perfumes, watches and clocks, jewelry, embroidery and brushes owing to french influence laws for the protection of women laborers are opposed especially in geneva the inspection of factories is largely in the hands of men home industry is a blessing in certain regions a curse in others this depends on the intensity of the work and on the degree of industrialism the trade union movement is still very weak among women laborers According to the canton, the movement has a purely economic or a socialist political character. Only a few organizations of working women belong to the Swiss Federation of Women's Clubs. Since 1891, the men's trade unions have admitted women. The first women factory inspectors were appointed in 1908. According to the census of August 9, 1905, 92,136 persons in Switzerland are engaged in home industry. This number is 28.3% of the total number of persons. 325,022 engaged in these industries. The foremost of the home industries is the manufacture of embroidery, engaging a total of 65,595 persons, of whom 53.5% work at home. The next important home industries are silk cloth weaving, engaging 12,478 persons, 41% of the total employed, watchmaking, engaging 12,071 persons in home industry, or 23.7% of the total, silk ribbon weaving, engaging 7,557 persons, or 51.9% of the total, the highest percentage of the home workers is found among the straw platers, 78.8%. Then follow the military uniform tailors, 60.1%, the embroidery makers, 53.5%, the wood carvers and ivory carvers, 52%, the silk ribbon weavers, 51.9%, and the ready-made clothing workers, 49.3%. The International Association for Labour Legislation, as everybody knows, is trying to ascertain whether an international regulation of labour conditions is possible in the embroidery-making industry. The statistics just given indicate the importance of this investigation for Switzerland. The statistics of the home industries in Switzerland 
will be found in the ninth issue of the second volume of the swiss statistical review zeitschrift für schweizerisch statistik the new swiss law for the protection of women laborers has produced a number of genuine improvements for the working women a maximum working day of ten hours and a working week of sixty hours have been established women can work overtime not more than sixty days a year they are then paid at least twenty five per cent extra the most significant innovation is the legal regulation of vacations every laborer that is not doing piecework or being paid by the hour must after one year of continuous service for the same firm be granted six consecutive days of vacation with full pay after two years of continuous service for the same firm the laborer must be given eight days after three years of service ten days and after the fourth year twelve days annually a violation of this law renders the offending employer liable to a fine of two hundred to three hundred francs forty dollars to sixty dollars in nineteen twelve a new civil code will come into force its composition has been influenced by the german civil code the government however regarded the swiss federation of women's clubs as the representative of the women and charged a member of the code commission to put himself into communication with the executive committee of the federation and to express the wishes of the federation and the deliberations of the committee this is better than nothing but still insufficient when the civil code had been adopted every male elector was given a copy the women's club secured copies only after prolonged effort the property laws in the new swiss civil code provide for joint property holding not separation of property rights however even with joint property holding the wife's earnings and savings belong to her a provision which the german cantons opposed on the other hand affiliation cases are admissible the french cantons opposed them the wife has the full status of a legal person before the law and full civil ability and shares parental authority with the father french switzerland through the influence of the code napoleon opposes the pecuniary responsibility of the illegal father toward the mother and child official regulation of the prostitution has been abolished in all the cantons except geneva several years ago a measure to introduce it again was rejected by the people of the canton zurich by a vote of forty thousand to eighteen thousand geneva is the headquarters of the international federation for the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution in nineteen zero nine the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution was again demanded in the city council by a vote of the people the canton board accepted a measure prohibiting the manufacture storage and sale of absinthe recently the swiss women have presented a petition requesting that an illicit mother be granted the right to call herself fro and use this designation mrs before her name the benevolent purpose of this movement is self-evident through this measure the illicit mother is placed in a position enabling her openly to devote herself to the rearing of her child with this purpose in view not less than ten thousand women have signed a petition to the swiss federal council requesting that a law be enacted compelling registrars to use the title frau mrs when requested to do so by the person concerned thirty-four women's clubs have collectively declared in favor of this petition women exercise the right of municipal suffrage only in those localities whose male population is absent at work during a large part of the year as in russia women can be elected as members of school boards and as poor law administrators in the canton zurich as members of school boards in the canton newcastle the question of granting women the right to vote in church affairs has long been advocated in the canton geneva by the rev thomas muller a member of the consistory of the national protestant church and by herr locker 
chief of the department of public instructions of the canton zurich in the canton geneva where there is a separation of church and state agitation in favour of the reform is being carried on the women in the canton ward have exercised the right to vote in the eglise libre since eighteen ninety nine and in the eglise nationale since nineteen zero eight since nineteen zero nine women have exercised the right to vote in the eglise evangelie libre of geneva the women's suffrage movement was really started by the renowned professor hilti of bernay who declared himself in the swiss yearbook of eighteen ninety seven in favour of women's suffrage the first society concerning itself exclusively with women's suffrage originated in geneva association pour les suffrages feminin later other organizations were formed in lausanne choc de france Nuremberg and Alton, the Women's Reading Circle of Bernay had since 1906 demanded political rights for women, and the Zurich Society for the Reform of Education for Girls had worked in favour of women's suffrage. On May 12, 1908, these seven societies organised themselves into the National Women's Suffrage League, and in June affiliated with the international women's suffrage alliance the report of the international women's suffrage congress amsterdam 1908 explains in a very lucid manner the political backwardness of the swiss women switzerland regards itself as the model democracy time has been required to make it clear that politically the women of this model state still have everything to achieve the meeting of the committee of the international council of women in geneva september nineteen zero eight accomplished much for the movement the swiss women's public utility association which had refused to join the swiss federation of women's clubs because the federation concerned itself with political affairs the public utility association wishing to restrict itself to public utilities only was given this instructive answer by professor hilti Public utility and politics are not mutually exclusive. An educated woman that wishes to make a living without troubling herself about politics is incomprehensible to me. The woman ought to take Carlyle's words to heart. We are not here to submit to everything, but also to oppose, carefully to watch, and to win. End of section 15Section 16 of the Modern Women's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richa. The Modern Women's Rights Movement by Kathy Schermager. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckert. Section 16. Germany. Total population. 61 million seven hundred and twenty thousand five hundred and twenty nine women thirty one million two hundred and fifty nine thousand four hundred and twenty nine men thirty million four hundred and sixty one thousand one hundred german federation of women's clubs women's suffrage league in no european country has the women's rights movement been confronted with more unfavorable conditions nowhere has it been more persistently opposed in recent times the women of no other country have lived through conditions of war such as the german women underwent during the thirty years war and from eighteen zero seven to eighteen hundred and twelve such violence leaves a deep imprint on the character of a nation moreover it has been the fate of no other civilized nation to owe its political existence to a war triumphantly fought out in less than one generation every war every accentuation and promotion of militarism is a weakening of the forces of civilization and of women's influence german masculinity is still so young i once heard somebody say a reinforcement of the women's rights movement by a large liberal majority in the national assemblies such as we find in england france and italy is not to be 
thought of in germany the thought of the rights of men and of citizens were never applied by german liberalism to women in a broad sense and the socialist party is not yet in the majority the political training of the german man has in many respects not yet been extended to include the principles of the american declaration of independence or the french declaration of the rights of men his respect for individual liberty has not yet been developed as in england therefore he is much harder to win over to the cause of women's rights hence the struggle against the official regulation of prostitution has been left chiefly to the german women whereas in england and in france the physicians lawyers and members of parliament have been the chief supporters of abolition i am reminded also of the inexpressibly long and difficult struggle that we women had to carry on in order to secure the admission of women to the universities the establishment of high schools for girls and the improvement of the opportunities given to women teachers in no other country were women teachers for girls wronged to such an extent as in germany the results of the last industrial census 1907 give to the demands of the women's rights movement an invaluable support germany has nine and a half million married women that is only one half of all adult women over 18 years of age are married in germany too marriage is not a lifelong means of support for women or a means of support for the whole number of women therefore the demands of women for a complete professional and industrial training and freedom to choose her calling appear in the history of our time with a tremendous weight a weight that the founders of the movement hardly anticipated the german women's rights movement originated during the troublous times immediately preceding the revolution of eighteen forty eight the founders augusta schmidt louise otto peters henrietta goldschmidt ottil b steiber lena morgenstern were forty eighters they believed in the right of women to an education to work and to choose her calling and as a citizen to participate directly in public life only the first three of these demands are contained in the program of the german general women's club founded in eighteen sixty five by four of these women natives of leipzig on the anniversary of the battle of leipzig at that time women's right to vote was put aside as something utopian the founders of the women's rights movement however from the very first included in their program the question of women industrial laborers and attacked the question in a practical way by organizing a society for the education of working women the energies of the middle class women were at this time very naturally absorbed by their own affairs they suffered want material as well as intellectual therefore it was a matter of securing a livelihood for middle-class women no longer provided for at home this was the first duty of a women's rights movement originating with the middle class of special service in the field of education and the liberal professions were the efforts of augusta schmidt henrietta goldschmidt marie leperhausel helena lang maria lishniuska and mrs kettler kindergartens were established also courses for the instruction of adult women for women principals of high schools for women in the gymnasiums and real gymnasiums moreover the admission of women to the universities was secured the general association of german women teachers was founded also the prussian association of women public school teachers and high schools for girls the prussian law of 1908 for the reform of girls high schools providing for the education of girls over 12 years real gymnasiums or gymnasiums for girls from 12 to 16 years women's colleges for women from 16 to 18 years was enacted under pressure from the german women's rights movement both the state and city must now do more for the education of girls the 
Academically trained women teachers in the high schools are given consideration when the appointments of principals and teachers for the advanced classes are made. The women teachers have organized themselves and are demanding salaries equal to those of the men teachers. At the present time, girls are admitted to the boys' schools, gymnasiums, real gymnasiums, etc., in Baden, Hessen, the imperial provinces of Alsage and Lorraine, Oldenburg and Württemberg, the German Federation of Women's Clubs and the Convention of the Delegates of the Rhenish cities and towns have made the same demands for Prussia. The Prussian Association of Women Public School Teachers is demanding that women teachers be appointed as principals and is resisting with all its power the threatened injustice to women in the adjustment of salaries. The universities in Baden and Württemberg were the first to admit women, then followed the universities in Hessen, Bavaria, Saxony, the imperial provinces and finally in 1908, Prussia. The number of women enrolled in Berlin University is 400. About 50 women doctors are practicing in Germany. As yet, there are no women preachers, but there are five women lawyers one of whom in 1908 pleaded the case of an indicted youth before the Altona Juvenile Court. Although there are only a few women lawyers in Germany, women are now permitted to act as counsel for the defendant. There being 60 such women counsellors in Bavaria, recently, 1908, even Bavaria refused women admission to the civil service. In the autumn, there was appointed the first woman lecturer in a higher institution of learning, this taking place in the Mannheim School of Commerce. Within the last five years, many new callings have been opened to women. They are librarians of municipal club and private libraries and have organized themselves into the Association of Women Librarians. They are assistants in laboratories, clinics and hospitals they make scientific drawings and some have specialized in microscopic drawing during the season for the manufacture of beet sugar women are employed as chemists in the sugar factories there is a woman architect in berlin and a woman engineer in hamburg women factory inspectors have performed satisfactory service in all the states of the empire but the future field of work for the german women in the sociological field state, municipal and private aid is demanded by the prevailing destitution. At the present time, women working at the sociological field without pay. In the future, much of this work must be performed by the professional sociological women workers. In about 100 cities, women are guardians of the poor. There are 103 women superintendents of orphan asylums Women are sought by the authorities as guardians. Women's cooperation as members of school committees and deputations promotes the organized women's rights movement. The first woman inspector of dwellings has been appointed in Hessen. Nurses are demanding that state examinations be made requisite for those wishing to become nurses. Some cities of Germany have appointed women as nurses for infant children. In Hessen and Ostmar, the eastern part of Prussia, women are district administrators. There is an especially great demand for women to care for dependent children and to work in the juvenile courts. This will lead to the appointment of paid probation officers. In South Germany, women police matrons are employed. In Prussia, there are women doctors employed in the police courts. There are also women school physicians since 1908. Trained women have entered the midwife's profession. When the German General Women's Club was formed in 1865, there was no German Empire. Berlin had not yet become the capital of the Empire, but since Berlin has become the seat of the Imperial Parliament, Berlin very naturally has become the centre of the women's rights movement. This occurred through the establishment of the magazine Frauenwohl, Women's Welfare, in 1888 by Mrs. Cower. In this manner, the younger and more radical women's rights movement was begun. The women that organized the movement had interested themselves in the educational field. The radicals now entered the sociological and political fields. Women making radical demands allied themselves with Mrs. Cowell, 
they befriended her and cooperated with her this is an undisputed fact though some of these women later left mrs cower and allied themselves with either the conservatives or the socialists in the organization of trade unions for women not exclusively of the middle class mina cower led the way in eighteen eighty nine with the aid of mr julius meyer and mr silberstein she organized the commercial and industrial benevolent society for women employees the society has now twenty four thousand members state insurance for private employees is now nineteen zero nine a question of the day jeanette schwerin founded the information bureau of the ethical culture society which furnished girls and women assistant for social work at the same time janet schwerin demanded that women be permitted to act as poor law guardians the agitation in public meetings and legislative assemblies against the civil code was instituted by dr anita augsburg and mrs Schritt. the opposition to state regulation of prostitution was begun by the radical hannah biber baum and anna papritz lily v gigig was the first to speak publicly concerning the civic duty of women the women's suffrage society was organized in 1901 by mrs cower dr augsburg miss hayman and dr skirmaker in 1894 the radical section of the german federation of women's clubs proposed that women's trade unions be admitted to the federation this radical section had often given offence to the conservatives in the federation for instance by the proposal of this measure but the radicals in this way have stimulated the movement as early as nineteen zero four the berlin congress of the international council of women had shown that the federation being composed chiefly of conservative elements should adopt in its program all the demands of the radicals including women's suffrage the differences between the radicals and the conservatives are differences of personality rather than of principles the radicals move to the time of allegro the conservatives to the time of andante in all public movements there is usually the same antagonism it occurred also in the english and the american women's rights movement in no other country with the exception of belgium and hungary is the schism between the women's rights movement of the middle class and the women's rights movement of the socialists so marked as in germany at the international women's congress of eighteen ninety six which was held through the influence of mrs lena morgenstern and mrs cower two social democrats lily brown and clara zetkin declared that they never would cooperate with the middle class women this attitude of the social democrats is the result of historical circumstances the law against the german socialists has increased their antagonism to the middle class nevertheless this harsh statement by lily brown and clara zetkin was unnecessary it has just been stated that the founders of the german women's rights movement had included the demands of the working women in their program and that the radicals by whom the congress of eighteen ninety six had been called and who for years had been engaged in politics and in the organization of trade unions had in eighteen ninety four demanded the admission of women's labor organizations to the federation of women's clubs hence an alignment of the two movements would have been exceedingly fortunate however a part of the socialists laying stress on ultimate aims regard class hatred as their chief means of agitation and are therefore on principle opposed to any peaceful cooperation with the middle class a part of the women socialist leaders are devoting themselves to the organization of working women a task that is as difficult in germany as elsewhere almost everywhere in germany women laborers are paid less than men laborers the average daily wage is two marks fifty cents but there are many working women that receive less in the ready-made clothing industry there are weekly wages of six to nine marks one point fifty dollars to two point twenty five dollars at the last congress of home workers held at berlin further evidence of starvation in the home industries was adduced but for these wages the german women's rights movement is not to be held responsible 
In the social political field, the women's rights advocates hold many advanced views. Almost without exception, they are advocating legislation for the protection of the working women. They have stimulated the organization of the Home Workers Association in Berlin. They urged the working women to seek admission to the Hirsch Dunker Trades Union, the German National Association of Trade Unions. They have established a magazine for working women and have organized a league for the consideration of the interests of working women. In 1907, Germany had 137,000 organized working women and female domestic servants. Most of these belong to the socialist trade unions. The maximum workday for women is fixed at 10 hours. The protection of maternity is promoted by the state as well as by the women's clubs. Peculiar to Germany is the denominational schism in the women's rights movement. The precedent for this was established by the German Evangelical Women's League, founded in 1899 with Paula Müller of Hanover as president. The organization of the League was due to the feeling that it is a sin to witness with indifference how women that wish to know nothing of biblical Christianity represent all the German women. The organization opposes equality of rights between men and women, but in 1908 it joined the Federation of Women's Clubs. In 1903 a Catholic Women's League was formed, but it has not joined the Federation. There has also been formed a Society of Jewish Women. V. Representatives of the interdenominational women's rights movement deplore this denominational disunion. These organizations are important because they make accessible groups of people that otherwise could not be reached by us. Another characteristic of the German women's rights movement is its extensive and thorough organization. The smallest cities are today visited by women speakers. Our unity of spirit, praised so frequently and now and then ridiculed, is our chief power in the midst of specially difficult conditions in which we must work. With tenacity and patience, we have slowly overcome unusual difficulties to the present without any help worth mentioning from the men. In the Civil Code of 1900, the most important demands of the women were not given just consideration. To be sure, women is legally competent, but the property laws make joint property holding legal, wives control their earnings and savings, and the mother has no parental authority. Relative to the impending revision of the criminal law, the women made their demands as early as 1908 in a general meeting of the Federation of Women's Clubs, when a three days discussion took place. Since 1897, the women have progressed considerably in their knowledge of law. The German women strongly advocate the establishment of juvenile courts such as the United States are now introducing. The Federation also demands that women be permitted to act as magistrates, jurors, lawyers and judges. In the struggle against official regulation of prostitution, the women were supported in the Prussian land tag by Deputy Munsterberg of Danzig. Prussia established a more humane regulation of prostitution but as yet has not appointed the Extra Parliamentary Commission for the study of the control of prostitution a measure that was demanded by the women. The most significant recent event is the admission of women to political organizations and meetings by the imperial law of May 15, 1908. Thereby, the German women were admitted to political life. The Women's Suffrage Society, founded in 1902 and in 1904, converted into a league, was able previous to 1908 to expand only in the South German states, excluding Bavaria. By this imperial law, the northern states of the empire were opened, and a national women's suffrage society was formed in Prussia, in Bavaria, and in Mecklenburg. As early as 1906, after the dissolution of the Reichstag, the women took an active part in the campaign, a right granted them by the Vereinsrecht Law of Association. In Prussia, Saxony, and Oldenburg, the women worked for universal suffrage for women in land tech elections. 
Since 1908, the political women's rights movement has been of first importance in Germany, as the women taxpayers in a number of states can exercise municipal suffrage by proxy, and the women owners of large estates in Saxony and Prussia can exercise the suffrage in elections for the Diet of the Circle, Kristall, by proxy. An effort is being made to attract these women to the cause of women's suffrage. In 1908, the Protestant women of the imperial provinces, Alsace and Lorraine, were granted the right to vote in church elections, a right that had been granted to the women of the German congregations in Paris as early as 1907. End of section 16. Section 17 of the Modern Women's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Women's Rights Movement by Kathy Schirmarker. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Luxembourg. Total population 246,455. Women 120,235. Men 126,220. No Federation of Women's Clubs. No Women's Suffrage League. The Women's Rights Movement in Luxembourg originated in December 1905 with the organization of the Society for Women's Interests, Verein für Fraueninteressen, which has worked admirably. The Society has 300 members and is in good financial condition. Throughout the country, it is now carrying on successful propaganda in the interest of higher education for girls and in the interest of women in the industries. In Luxembourg, after girls have graduated from a convent, they have no further educational facilities. The society has established a department for legal protection and an employment agency. It has published an inquiry into the living conditions in the capital. In the capital city, there is a woman member of the Poor Law Commission. Ten women are guardians of the poor. One woman is a school commissioner. And there is a woman inspector of the municipal hospital. The society is well supported by the liberal elements of the government and the public. Its chief object must be the establishment of a secular school that will prepare women for entrance to the universities. End of section 17. Section 18 of The Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in January 2022. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Käthe Schirmacher, translated by Karl Konrad Eckhardt. German Austria. Total population, about 7 million. Women, about 3,750,000. Men, about 3,250,000. Federation of Austrian Women's Clubs. No Women's Suffrage League. The Austrian women's right movement is based primarily on economic conditions. More than 50% of the women in Austria are engaged in non-domestic callings. This percentage is a strong argument against the theory that women's sphere is merely domestic. Unfortunately, this non-domestic service of the Austrian women is seldom very remunerative. Austria itself is a country of low wages. This condition is due to a continuous influx of Slavic workers, to large agricultural provinces, to the tenacious survivals of feudalism, etc. 
Therefore, women's wages and salaries are lower than in Western Europe, and low living expenses do not prevail everywhere. Vienna is one of the most expensive cities to live in. The Women's Industrial School Society, founded in 1851, attempted to raise the industrial ability of the girls of the middle class. In accordance with the views of the time, needlework was taught. Free schools for the instruction of adults were established in Vienna. The economic misery following the War of 1866 led to the organization of the Women's Industrial Society, which enlarged women's sphere of activity, as did the Lettes Society in Berlin. Since 1868, the women's rights movement has secured adherents from the best educated middle class women, namely women teachers. In that year, the Catholic woman teachers organized a Catholic woman teachers society. In 1869 was organized the interdenominational Austrian Woman Teachers Society. This society has performed excellent service. The women teachers who since 1869 had been given positions in the public schools were paid less than the men teachers having the same training and doing the same work. Therefore, the women teachers presented themselves to the provincial legislatures, demanding an increase in salary and, in spite of the opposition of the male teachers, secured the increase by the law of 1891. In 1876, a society devoted its efforts to the improvement of the girls' high schools, which had been greatly neglected. In 1885, the women writers and the women artists organized, their male colleagues having refused to admit women to the existing professional societies. In 1888, the women music teachers likewise organized themselves. At the same time, the question of higher education for women was agitated. In Vienna, a Lyceum class, the first of its kind, was opened to prepare girls for entrance to the universities, Abiturienten examen. Admission to the boys' high schools was refused to girls in Vienna, but was granted in the provinces, Troppau and Mährisch Schönberg. Girls were at all times admitted as outsiders, extranee, to the examinations held on leaving college, abiturienten examen. In this way, many girls passed the leaving examination before they began their studies in Switzerland. Until 1896, the Austrian universities remained closed to women. The law faculties do not as yet admit women. The women's clubs are striving to secure this reform. Those women that had studied medicine in Switzerland previous to 1896 and wished to practice in Austria required special imperial permission, which was never withheld from them in their noble struggle. In this way, Dr. Kerschbaumer began her practice as an oculist in Salzburg. However, the Countess Possana, M.D., after passing the Swiss state examination, also took the Austrian examination. She is now practicing in Vienna. As the Austrian doctors have active and passive suffrage in the election to the Board of Physicians, Ärztekammer, Dr. Possana also requested this right. Her request was refused by the magistrate in Vienna because, as a woman, she did not have the suffrage in municipal elections, and the suffrage for the Board of Physicians could be exercised only by those doctors that were municipal electors. Thereupon, Dr. Possana appealed her case to the government, to the Minister of the Interior, and finally to the Administrative Court. The court decided in favor of the position. It must be emphasized, however, that the Board of Physicians favored the request from the beginning. Women preachers and women lawyers are as yet unknown in Austria. As in former times, the teaching profession is still the chief sphere of activity for the middle-class women of German Austria. According to the law of 1869, they can be appointed not only as teachers in the elementary schools for girls, but also as teachers of the lower classes in the boys' schools. Their not being municipal voters has two results. If the municipality is seeking votes, it appoints men teachers that are favorably disposed. If the municipality is politically opposed to the male teachers, it appoints women teachers in preference. But to be the plaything of political whims is not a very worthy condition to be in. 
if women teachers marry, they need not withdraw from the service, except in the province of Styria. More than 10% of the women teachers in the whole of Austria are married, more than 2% are widows. The women comprise about one-fourth of the total number of elementary school teachers, of whom there are 9,000. Their annual salaries vary from 200 to 1,600 goldens, $96.40 to $771.20. The ordinary salary of 200 goldens is so insufficient that many elementary school teachers actually starve. The competition of the nuns is feared by the whole body of secular school teachers. In Tyrol, instruction in the elementary schools is still almost wholly in the hands of the religious orders. The sisters work for little pay, they have a community life and consume the resources of the dead hand. Of the secondary schools for girls, some are ecclesiastic, some are municipal, and some private. The lyceums give a very good education, mathematics is obligatory, but as yet there are no ordinary secondary schools whose leaving examinations are equivalent to the examen of the gymnasiums. The Academic Women's Club in Vienna is demanding this reform, and the Federation of Austrian Women's Clubs is demanding the development of the municipal girl schools into Realschulen. The state subsidizes various institutions. The girls' gymnasiums were privately founded. Dr. Cecilia Wendt, upon whom the degree of Doctor of Philosophy was conferred by Vienna University, and who took the state examination for secondary school teachers in mathematics, physics, and German, was the first woman appointed as a teacher in a gymnasium, being appointed in the Vienna Gymnasium for Girls. Since 1871, women have been appointed in the postal and telegraph service. Like most of the subordinate state officials, they receive poor pay and dare not marry. The women telegraph operators in the central office in Vienna are paid 30 guldens, $14.46 a month. The women telegraph operator can lay no claims to the pleasures of existence. These girls starve spiritually as well as physically. During the past 28 years, salaries have not been increased. Every two years, a two-week vacation is granted. Since 1876, there has existed a relief society for women postal and telegraph employees. The woman stenographer, today so much sought after in business offices, was in 1842 absolutely excluded from the courses in Gabelsberger stenography by the Ministry of Public Instruction. In the course of Chancery, Advokatenkanzlein, women stenographers are paid 20 to 30 guldens, $9.64 to $14.46 a month. They are given the same pay in the stores and offices where they are expected to use typewriters. They are regarded as subordinates, though frequently they are thorough specialists and masters of languages. In the governmental service, the women subordinates that work by the day, 1.50 guldens, 73 cents, have no hope for advancement or pension. The first woman chief of a government office has been appointed to the sanitary department of the Ministry of the Labor Department, in which there is also a woman librarian. It is not easy to imagine the deplorable condition of working women when women public school teachers and women office clerks are expected to live on a monthly salary of $9.64 to $14.46. The Vienna inquiry into the condition of working women in 1896 disclosed frightfully miserable conditions among working women. Since then, especially through the efforts of the socialists, the conditions have been somewhat improved. In Vienna, efforts to organize women into trade unions have been made, especially among the bookbinders, hatmakers, and tailors. Outside Vienna, Organization has been affected chiefly among the women textile workers in Silesia, as well as among the women employees of the state tobacco factories. The most thorough organization of women laborers is found in northern and western Bohemia, among the glass workers and bead makers. In Styria, Salzburg, Tyrol and Carinthia, the organization of women is found only in isolated cases. 
everywhere the organization of women is made difficult by domestic misery which consumes the energy time and interest of the women the organized social democratic women laborers of german austria have a permanent representation in the women's imperial committee of the fifty thousand women organized in trade unions five thousand belong to the social democratic party the magazine for working women arbeiterinnen zeitung has thirteen thousand four hundred subscribers women industrial inspectors have proved themselves efficient it is to be expected as a result of the wretched economic conditions of the working women that prostitution with its incidental earnings should be widespread in german austria vienna is the refuge of those seeking work and seclusion verschwiegenheit the number of illicit births in vienna is as in paris one-third of the total number of births for these and other reasons the general women's club of austria allgemeine österreichische frauenverein founded in eighteen ninety three under the leadership of miss augusta fickert has frequently concerned itself with the question of prostitution of women's wages and of the official regulation of prostitution always being opposed to the last the international federation for the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution internationale abolinistische föderation was however not represented in german austria before 1903 the austrian branch of this organization being established in 1907 in vienna the middle class women are doing much as leaders of the charitable industrial educational and women's suffrage societies to raise the status of woman in austria the most prominent members of these societies are augusta fickert marianne heinisch mrs von sprung miss herzfelder von wolfring mrs von listrow rosa mayreda maria lang editor of the excellent documente der frauen which unfortunately were discontinued in 1902 mrs schwietland elsie federn the superintendent of the settlement in the laborers district in north vienna mrs jella herzka mrs dr goldmann superintendent of the cottage lyceum and others these women frequently cooperate with the leaders of the socialistic women's right movement mrs schlesinger mrs pop and others the disunion of the two forces of the movement is much less marked in austria than in germany the circumstances much more resembling those in italy in these lands it is expected that the women's right movement will profit greatly through the growth of socialism this is explained by the fact that the austrian liberals are not equal to the assaults of the conservatives universal equal suffrage which does not as yet exist in austria has its most enthusiastic advocates among the socialists with the austrian socialists universal suffrage means women's suffrage also during the liberal era two rights were granted to the austrian women since 1849 the women taxpayers vote by proxy in municipal elections and since 1861 for the local legislatures provincial landtagen in lower austria the landtag in 1888 deprived them of this right and in 1889 an attempt was made to deprive them of their municipal suffrage but the women concerned successfully petitioned that they be left in possession of their active municipal suffrage since 1873 the austrian women owners of large estates vote also for the imperial parliament through proxy the austrian women supported by the socialist deputies pernastorfer kronawetter adler and others have on several occasions demanded the passive suffrage in the election of school boards and poor law guardians they have also demanded a reform of the law of organization so that women can be admitted to political organizations to the present these efforts have been fruitless when universal suffrage was granted in 1906 creating the fifth class of voters the women were disregarded in the previous year a woman's suffrage committee had been established with headquarters in vienna it is endeavoring especially to secure the repeal of paragraph 30 of the law regulating organizations and public meetings this law 
like that of Prussia and Bavaria previous to 1908, excludes women from political organization, thus making the forming of a woman's suffrage society impossible. For this reason, Austria cannot join the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. During the consideration of the new municipal election laws in Troppau, Austrian Silesia, it was proposed to withdraw the right of suffrage from the women taxpayers. They resisted the proposal energetically. At present, the matter is before the Supreme Court. In Vorarlberg, the unmarried women taxpayers were also given the right to vote in elections of the Landtag. The legal status of the Austrian woman is similar to that of the French woman. The wife is under the guardianship of her husband. The property law provides for the amalgamation of property, not joint property holding as in France. But the wife does not have control of her earnings and savings, as in Germany under the civil code. The father alone has legal authority over the children. Here the names of two women must be mentioned. Bertha von Suttner, one of the founders of the peace movement, and Marie von Ebner-Eschenbach, the greatest living woman writer in the German language. Both are Austrians, and their country may well be proud of them. In Austria, the authorities are more favorably disposed towards the women's right movement than in Germany, for example. End of section 18 Section 19 of The Modern Woman's Rights Movement This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in January 2022. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Käthe Schirmacher, translated by Karl Konrad Eckhart. Hungary. Total population. 19,254,559. Women, 9,672,407. Men, 9,582,152. Federation of Hungarian Women's Clubs. Women's Suffrage League. At first, the Hungarian women's rights movement was restricted to the advancement of girls' education. The attainment of national independence gave the women greater ambition. Since 1867 they have striven for the establishment of higher institutions of learning for girls. In 1868, Mrs. von Veres, with 22 other women, founded the Society for the Advancement of Girls' Education. In 1869, the first class in a high school for girls was formed in Budapest. An esteemed scholar, P. Gulai, undertook the superintendence of the institution. Similar schools were founded in the provinces. In 1876, the Budapest Model School was completed. In 1878, it was turned over to a woman superintendent, Mrs. von Janisch. A seminary for women teachers was established, a special building being erected for the purpose. Then, the admission of women to the university was agitated. A special committee for this purpose was formed with Dr. Koloman von Chiki as chairman. In the meantime, the society gave domestic economy courses and courses of instruction to adults in its girls' high school. The Minister of Public Instruction, von Vlasic, secured the imperial decree of November 18, 1895, by which women were admitted to the universities of Klausenburg and Budapest to the philosophical and medical faculties. It was now necessary to prepare women for the entrance examinations, abiturienten examen. This was undertaken by the General Hungarian Women's Club, Allgemeine Ungarische Frauenverein. With the aid of Dr. Beotti, a lecturer at the University of Budapest, the club formulated a program that was accepted by the Minister of Public Instruction. By the rescript of July 18, 1896, he authorized the establishment of a girls' gymnasium in Budapest. It is evident that such reforms, when in the hands of intelligent authorities, are put into working order as easily as a letter passes through the mails. 
In the professional callings we find 15 women druggists, 10 women doctors, and one woman architect. Erika Paulus, who has chosen the calling of architect, which elsewhere in Europe has hardly been opened to women, is a Transylvanian. Among other things, she has been given the supervision of the masonry, the glasswork, the roofing, and the interior decoration of the buildings of the Evangelical Reformed College in Klausenburg. A second woman architect, trained in the Budapest Technical School, is a builder in Bestace. Higher education of women was promoted in the cities. The home industries of the Hungarian rural districts were fostered. This was taken up by the Rural Women's Industry Society, Landesfrauen Industrieverein. Aprons, carpets, textile fabrics, slippers, tobacco pouches, whip handles and ornamental chests are made artistically according to antique models. This movement is analogous to that in Scandinavia. Large expositions arouse the interest of the public in favor of the national products, for the disposal of which the women of the society have labored with enthusiasm. These home industries give employment to about 750,000 women and 40,000 men. Hungary is preeminently an agricultural country and its wages are low. The promotion of home industry, therefore, had a great economic importance, for Hungary is a center of traffic in girls. A great number of these poor, ignorant country girls, reared in oriental stupor, congregate in Budapest from all parts of Hungary and the Balkan states to be bartered to the brothels of South America as Majarli and Hungara. An address that Miss Kut of the International Vigilance Society delivered in Budapest resulted in the founding of the Society for Combating the White Slave Trade. The committee was composed of Countess Czaki, Baroness Wenkheim, Dr. Ludwig Gruber, Royal Public Prosecutor, Professor Vamberi, and others. The recent draconic regulation of prostitution in Pest, 1906, caused the Federation of Hungarian Women's Clubs to oppose the official regulation of prostitution and to form a Department of Morals which is to be regarded as the Hungarian branch of the International Federation for the Abolition of the Official Regulation of Prostitution. Since then, public opinion concerning the question has been aroused. The laws against the white slave traffic have been made more stringent and are being more rigidly enforced. A new development in Hungary is the women's suffrage movement, since 1904, represented in the feminist society, Feministenverein. During the past five years, the society has carried on a vigorous propaganda in Budapest and various cities in the provinces, in Budapest also with the aid of foreign women speakers. Recently, the society has also roused the country women in favor of the movement. Women's suffrage is opposed by the clericals and the social democrats, who favor only male suffrage in the impending introduction of universal suffrage. On March 10, 1908, a delegation of women's suffrage advocates went to the parliament. During the suffrage debates, the women held public meetings. From the work of A. von Maclay, Le droit de femme au travail, I take the following statements. According to the industrial statistics of 1900, there were 1,819,517 women in Hungary engaged in agriculture. Industry, mining, and transportation engaged 242,951. State and municipal service and the liberal callings engaged 36,870 women. There were 109,739 women day laborers, 350,693 domestic servants, 24,476 women pursued undefined or unknown callings. 83,537 women lived on incomes from their property. Since 1890, the number of women engaged in all the callings has increased more rapidly than the number of men, 26.3 to 27.9 percent being the average increase of the women engaged in gainful pursuits. In 1900, the women formed 21 percent of the industrial population. They were engaged chiefly in the manufacture of pottery, 29%, 
bent wood furniture, 46%, matches, 58%, clothing, 59%, textiles, 60%. In papermaking and bookbinding, 68% of the laborers are women. In the state mints, 25% of the employees are women. The state tobacco factories employ 16,720 women, these being 94% of the total number of employees. Of those engaged in commerce, 23% are women. The number of women engaged in the civil service, as private secretaries, and in the liberal callings has increased even more than the number of women engaged in industry. The women engaged in office work have organized. In 1901, the number of women public school teachers was 6,529, there being 22,840 men, that is, 22.22% were women. In the best public schools there are more women teachers than men, the proportion being 62 to 48. In the girls' high schools, there are 273 women teachers to 145 men teachers. In 1903, the railroads employed 511 women. In 1898, the postal service employed 4,516 women. In 1899, the telephone system employed 207 women and 81 men. These women employees, unlike those of Austria, are permitted to marry. End of section 19. Section 20 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kathy Schermacher, translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Chapter 2. The Romance Countries. In the Romance Countries, the woman's rights movement is hampered by romance customs and by the Catholic religion. The number of women in these countries is in many cases smaller than the number of men. In general, the girls are married at an early age, almost always through the negotiations of the parents. The education of women is in some respects very deficient. France. Total population, 38,466,924. Women, 19,346,327. Men, 18,922,651. Federation of French Women's Clubs, Women's Suffrage League. The European Women's Rights Movement was born in France. It is a child of the Revolution of 1789. When a whole country enjoys freedom, equality and fraternity, women can no longer remain in bondage. The Declaration of the Rights of Man apply to woman also. The European woman's rights movement is based on purely logical principles, not as in the United States on the practical exercise of woman's right to vote. This purely theoretical origin is not denied by the advocates of the woman's rights movement in France. It ought to be mentioned that the principles of the woman's rights movement were brought from France to England by Mary Wollstonecraft, and was stated in her pamphlet, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. But enthusiastic Mary Wollstonecraft did not form a school in England, and the organised English woman's rights movement did not cast its lot with this revolutionist. What Mary Wollstonecraft did for England, Olympe de Gouges did for France in 1789. At that time, she dedicated to the Queen her little book, The Declaration of the Rights of Women. La Déclaration des Droits des Femmes. It happens that the Declaration of the Rights of Man, La Déclaration des Droits de l'Homme, of 1789, referred only to the men. The National Assembly recognised only male voters and refused the petition of October 28, 1789, in which a number of Parisian women demanded universal suffrage in the election of national representatives. Nothing is more peculiar 
than the attitude of the men advocates of liberty towards the women advocates of liberty. At that time, women's struggle for liberty had representatives in all social groups. In the aristocratic circles, there was Madame de Stael, who, as a Republican, her father was Swiss, never doubted the equality of the sexes, but by her actions showed her belief in women's right to secure the highest culture and to have political influence. Madame de Stael's social position and her wealth enabled her to spread these views of women's rights. She was never dependent on the men advocates of freedom. Madame Roland was typical of the educated Republican bourgeoisie. She participated in the revolutionary drama and was a political woman. On the basis of historical documents, it can be asserted that the men advocates of freedom have not forgiven her. The intelligent people of the lower classes are represented by Olympe de Gouges and Ferronia de Mericourt. Both played a political role. Both were women's rights advocates. Of both, it was said that they had forgotten the virtues of their sex, modesty and submissiveness. The men of freedom still thought that the home offered their wives all the freedom they needed. The populace finally made demonstrations through women's clubs. These clubs were closed in 1793 by the Committee of Public Safety because the clubs disturbed public peace. The public peace of 1793. What an idyll. In short, the regime of liberty, equality and fraternity regarded woman as unfree, unequal, and treated her very unfraternally. What harmony between theory and practice. In fact, the revolution even withdrew rights that the women formerly possessed. For example, the old regime gave a noblewoman, as a landowner, all the rights of a feudal lord. She levied troops, raised taxes, and administered justice. During the old regime in France, there were women peers, Women were now and then active in diplomacy. The abbesses exercised the same feudal power as the abbots. They had unlimited power over their convents. The women owners of large feudal lands met with the provincial estates. For instance, Madame de Sevigny in the Estate Générale of Brittany, where, where there was autonomy in the provincial administration. In the guilds, the women masters exercised their professional right as voters. All of these rights ended with the old regime. Beside the politically free man stood the politically unfree woman. Napoleon confirmed this lack of freedom in the civil and criminal codes. Napoleon's attitude towards all women, excepting his mother, Madame Mère, was such as we still find among the men in southern Italy, in Spain, and in the Orient, his sisters and Josephine Bohane, the Creole, could not give him a more just opinion of women. His fierce hatred for Madame de Stael indicates his attitude towards the woman's rights representatives. The great Napoleon did not like intellectual women. The Code Napoleon places the wife completely under the guardianship of the husband. Without him, she can undertake no legal transaction. The property law requires joint property holding, except real estate, but most of the women are neither landowners nor owners of houses. The married woman has had independent control of her earnings and savings only since the enactment of the law of July the 13th, 1907. Only the husband has legal authority over the children. Such a legal status of woman is found in other codes. But the following provisions are peculiar to the Code Napoleon. If a husband kills his wife for committing adultery, the murder is excusable. An illicit mother cannot file a paternity suit. In practice, however, the courts, in a roundabout way, gave the illicit mother an opportunity to file an action for damages. No other code, above all, no other Germanic or Slavic code, has been disgraced by such paragraphs. In the first of the designated paragraphs, we hear the Corsican, a cousin of the Moor of Venice. In the second, we hear the military emperor and general of an unbridled and disciplined troop of soldiers. No one will be astonished to learn that this same lawgiver in 1801 supplemented the code with a despotic state regulation of prostitution. 
What became of the women's rights movement during this arbitrary military regime? Full of fear and anxiety, the women's rights advocates concealed their views. The restoration was scarcely a better time for advocating women's rights. The philosopher of the epoch, de Bonal, spoke very pompously against the equality of the sexes. Man and woman are not and never will be equal. It was not until the July Revolution of 1830 and the February Revolution of 1848 that the question of woman's rights could gain a favourable hearing. The Saint-Simonians, the Fourierists and Georges Sand preached the rights of man and the rights of woman. During the February Revolution, the women were found, just as in 1789, in the front ranks of the socialists. The French woman's rights movement is closely connected with both political movements. Every time a sacrifice of Republicans and Democrats was demanded, women were among the banished and deported. Jeanne de Rouen in 1848, Louise Michel in 1851 and 1871. Marie de Reims, belonging to the wealthy Parisian middle class, appeared in the 60s as a public speaker. She was a woman's rights advocate. However, in a still greater degree, she was a tribune of the people, a republican and a politician. Marie de Rheims and her excellent political adherent, Léon Richet, were the founders of the organized French woman's rights movement. As early as 1876, they organized the Society for the Amelioration of the Condition of Woman and for Demanding Woman's Rights. In 1878, they called the first French Woman's Rights Congress. The following features characterize the modern French Woman's Rights Movement. It is largely restricted to Paris. In the provinces, there are only weak and isolated beginnings. Even the Parisian Woman's Rights Organizations are not numerous the greatest having 400 members. Thanks to the Republican and Socialist movements, which for 30 years have controlled France, the women's rights movement is for political reasons supported by the men to a degree not noticeable in any other country. The Republican majority in the Chamber of Deputies, the Republican press, the Republican literature effectively promote the women's rights movement. The Federation of French Women's Clubs founded in 1901 and reputed to have 73,000 members, is at present promoting the movement by the systematic organization of provincial divisions. Less kindly disposed, sometimes indifferent and hostile, are the church, the Catholic circles, the nobility, society, and the liberal, capitalistic bourgeoisie. A sharp division between the women's rights movement of the middle class and the movement of the socialists, such as exists, for example, in Germany, does not exist in France. A large part of the bourgeoisie, not the great capitalists, are socialistically inclined. On the basis of principle, the republicans and socialists cannot deny the justice of the women's rights movement. Hence, everything now depends on the opportuneness of the demands of the women. The French woman has still much to demand. However enlightened, however advanced the French man may regard himself, he has not yet reached the point where he will favour woman's suffrage. What the National Assembly denied in 1789, the Republic of 1870, has also withheld. Nevertheless, conditions have improved, insofar as measures in favour of woman's suffrage and the reform of the civil rights of women have since 1848 been repeatedly introduced and supported by petitions. As for the civil rights of women, the principles of the Code Napoleon, the minority of the wife and the husband's authority over her, are still unchanged. However, a few minor concessions have been made. Today a woman can be a witness to a civil transaction, e.g. a marriage contract. A married woman can open a savings bank account in her maiden name and, as in Belgium, her husband can make it impossible for her to withdraw the money. A wife's earnings now belong to her. 
the severe law concerning adultery by the wife still exists, and affiliation cases are still prohibited. That is not exactly liberal. Attempts to secure reforms of the civil law are being made by various women's clubs, the Group of Women Students, Le Groupe d'Etudes Féministes, Madame Odo de Flou, and the Committee on Legal Matters of the Federation of French Women's Clubs, Madame d'Abadie. In both the legal and the political fields, the French women have hitherto, in spite of the Republic, achieved very little. In educational matters, however, the Republican government has decidedly favoured the women. Here the wishes of the women harmonised with the Republican hatred for the priests. What was done perhaps not for the women was done to spite the church. Elementary education has been obligatory since 1882. In 1904 to 1905, there were 2,715,452 girls in the elementary schools and 2,726,944 boys. State schools, or lycées, for girls have existed since 1880. The program of these schools is not that of the German gymnasiums, but that of a German high school for girls. Foreign languages, however, are elective. In the last two years, in which the ages of the girls are 16 to 18 years, the curriculum is that of a seminary for women teachers. In 1904 to 1905, these institutions were attended by 22,000 girls, as compared with 100,000 boys. The French woman's rights movement has as yet not succeeded in establishing gymnasium for girls. At present, efforts are being made to introduce gymnasium courses in the girls' lycée. The admission of girls to the boys' lycée, which has occurred in Germany and in Italy, has not even been suggested in France. To the present, the preparation of girls for the universities has been carried on privately. The right to study in the universities has never been withheld from women. From the beginning, women could take the abiturienten examen, the university entrance examinations, with the young men before an examination commission. All departments were open to women. The number of women university students in France is 3,609. The male students, number 38,288. Women's school teachers control the whole public school system for girls. In the French schools for girls, most of the teachers are women. The superintendents are also women. The ecclesiastical education system, which still exists in secular guise, is naturally, so far as the education of girls is concerned, entirely in the hands of women. The salaries of the secular women teachers in the first three classes of the elementary school are equal to those of the men. The women teachers in the lycée, agrégé, are trained in the seminary of Sèvres and in the universities. Their salaries are lower than those of the men. In 1907, the first woman teacher in the French higher institutions of learning was appointed, Madame Curie who holds the chair of physics in the Sorbonne in Paris. In the provincial universities, women are lecturers on modern languages. There are no women preachers in France. Dr. Jure Jeanne Chauvin was the first woman lawyer, being admitted to the bar in 1899. Today, women lawyers are practicing in Paris and in Toulouse. In the government service, there are women postal clerks, telegraph clerks, and telephone clerks, with an average daily wage of three francs, 60 cents. Only the subordinate positions are open to women. The same is true of the women employed in the railroad offices. Women have been admitted as clerks in some of the administrative departments of the government and in the public poor law administration. Women are employed as inspectors of schools, as factory inspectors, and as poor law administrators. There is a woman member of each of the following councils, the Superior Council of Education, the Superior Council of Labour, and the Superior Council of Public Assistance, Conseil Supérieur d'Education, Conseil Supérieur du Travail, Conseil Supérieur de l'Assistance Publique. 
The first woman court interpreter was appointed in the Parisian Court of Appeals in 1909. The French woman is an excellent businesswoman. However, the women employed in commercial establishments being organized as yet to a small extent earn no more than women laborers. 70 to 80 francs, about $14 to $16 a month. In general, greater demands are made of them in regard to personal appearance and dress. There is a law requiring that chairs be furnished during working hours. There is a consumer's league in Paris, which probably will affect reforms in the labouring conditions of women. The women in the industries, of whom there are about 900,000, have an average wage of 2 francs 50 cents a day. Hardly 30,000 are organised into trade unions. All women tobacco workers are organised. As elsewhere, the French ready-made clothing industry is the most wretched home industry. A part of the French middle-class women oppose legislation for the protection of women workers on the ground of equality of rights for the sexes. This attitude has been occasioned by the contrast between the typographers and the women typesetters the men being aided in the struggle by the prohibition of night work for women. It is easy to explain the rash and unjustifiable generalization made on the basis of this exceptional case. The women that made the generalization and opposed legislation for the protection of women laborers belong to the bourgeois class. There are about 1,500,000 women engaged in agriculture, the average wage being 1 franc 50 about 37 cents. Many of these women earn one franc to one franc 20, 20 to 24 cents a day. In Paris, women have been cab drivers and chauffeurs since 1907. In 1901, women formed 35% of the population engaged in the professions and the industries, 6,805,000 women, 12,911,000 men. Total, 19,716,000. There are three parties in the French women's rights movement. The Catholic, Le Féminisme Chrétien, the Moderate, predominantly Protestant, and the Radical, almost entirely socialistic. The Catholic party works entirely independently. The two others often cooperate and are represented in the National Council of Women, Conseil National des Femmes while the feminisme chrétien is not represented. The views of the Catholic Party are as follows. No one denies that man is stronger than woman, but this means merely a physical superiority. On the basis of this superiority, man dare not despise woman and regard her as morally inferior to him. But from the Christian point of view, God gave man authority over woman. This does not signify any intellectual superiority, it is simply a fact of hierarchy. The Feminist Chrétien advocates a thorough education for girls according to Catholic principles, a reform of the marriage law, the wife should control her earnings, separate property holdings should be established, the same moral standard for both sexes, abolition of the official regulation of prostitution, the same penalty for adultery for both sexes, However, there should be no divorce. The authority of the mother, autorité maritale, should be maintained, for only in this way can peace prevail in the family. A high-minded woman will never wish to rule. It is her wish to sacrifice herself, to admire, to lean on the arm of a strong man that protects her. In the moderate group, President Miss Sarah Monod, these ideas have few advocates. Protestantism, which is strongly represented in this party, has a natural inclination towards the development of individuality. This party is more concerned with a woman that does not find the arm of a strong man to lean on, or who detected him leaning upon her. This party is entirely opposed to the husband's authority over the wife, and to the dogma of obligatory admiration and sacrifice. The leaders of the party are Madame Bonneville, Madame Eau Claire, and others. During the five years' leadership of Madame Marguerite Durand, 
the Fronde was the meeting place of the party. The Radicals demand absolute co-education, anti-military instruction in history, schools that prepare girls for motherhood, the admission of women to government positions, equal pay for both sexes, official regulation of the work of domestic servants, the abolition of the husband's authority, municipal and national suffrage for women. A member of the Radical Party presented herself in 1908 as a candidate in the Parisian elections. In November 1908, women were granted passive suffrage for the arbitration courts for trade disputes. They already possessed active suffrage. The founding of the National Council of French Women, Conseil National des Femmes Françaises, has aided the women's rights movement considerably. Stimulated by the progress made in other countries, the French women have systematically begun their work. They have organised two sections in the provinces, Touraine and Normandy. They have promoted the organisation of women into trades unions. They have studied the marriage laws and have organised a women's suffrage department. Since 1907, the women's magazine La Française, published weekly, has done effective work for the cause. The place of publication, 49 Rue Lafitte, Paris, is also a public meeting place for the leaders of the women's rights movements. La Française arouses interest in the cause of women's rights among women teachers and office clerks in the provinces. Recently, the management of the magazine has been converted to the cause of women's suffrage. In the spring of 1909, the French Women's Suffrage Society, Union Française pour le Suffrage des Femmes, was organised under the presidency of Madame Schmal, a native of England. Madame Schmal is also to be regarded as the originator of the law of July 13, 1907, which pertains to the earnings of the wife. The Union has joined the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. In the House of Deputies, there is a group in favour of women's rights. The French women's rights movement seems to be spreading rapidly. Emile de Morsier organised the French movement favouring the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution. Through this movement, an extra parliamentary commission, 1903 to 1907, was induced to recognise the evil of the existing official regulation of prostitution. This is the first step towards abolition. End of chapter 2, Romance Languages, section France. Read by Bertha Mason in Nottingham, 2021. Section 21 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kata Schirmacher, translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Belgium. Total population, 6,815,054. Women, 3,416,057 men three million three hundred ninety eight thousand nine hundred ninety seven federation of belgian women's clubs woman suffrage league it is very difficult for the woman's rights movement to thrive in belgium not that the movement is unnecessary there on the contrary the legal status of women is regulated by the code napoleon hence there is decided need for reform the number of women exceeds that of the men hence part of the girls cannot marry industry is highly developed the question of wages is a vital question for women laborers accordingly there are reasons enough for instituting an organized woman's rights movement in belgium but every agitation for this purpose is hampered by the following social factors catholicism belgium is ninety nine per cent catholic clericalism in parliament and the indifference of the rich bourgeoisie the woman's rights movement has very few adherents in the third estate and it is exactly the women of this estate that ought to be the natural supporters of the movement 
in the fourth estate in which there are a great many socialists the woman's rights movement is identical with socialism since the legal status of woman is determined by the code napoleon we need not comment upon it here by a law of nineteen hundred the wife is empowered to deposit money in a savings bank without the consent of her husband the limit of her deposit being three thousand francs six hundred dollars the wife also controls her earnings if however she draws more than one hundred francs twenty dollars a month from the savings bank the husband may protest women are now admitted to family councils they can act as guardians they can act as witnesses to a marriage affiliation cases were made legal in nineteen o six on december nineteenth nineteen o eight women were given active and passive suffrage in arbitration courts for labor disputes the belgium secondary school system is exceptional because the government has established a rather large number of girls high schools however these schools do not prepare for the university entrance examinations arbiturient and examen women contemplating entering the university must prepare for these examinations privately this was done by miss marie popelin of brussels who wished to study law the universities of brussels ghent and liege have been open to women since eighteen eighty six hence miss popelin could execute her plans in eighteen eighty eight she received the degree of doctor of laws she made an attempt in eighteen eighty eight eighteen eighty nine to secure admission to the bar as a practicing lawyer but the brussels court of appeals decided the case against her miss marie popelin is the leader of the middle-class woman's rights movement in belgium she is in charge of the Women's Rights League, Ligue du Droit de Femmes, founded in 1890. With the support of Mrs. Dennis, Mrs. Parent, and Mrs. Fontaine, Mrs. Popelin organized, in 1897, an International Women's Congress in Brussels. Many representatives of foreign countries attended. One of the German representatives, Mrs. Anna Simpson, was astonished by the indifference of the people of Brussels. In her report, she says where were the women of brussels during the days of the congress they did not attend for the middle class is not much interested in our cause it was especially for this class that the congress was held dr popelin is also president of the league that has since nineteen o eight taken up the struggle against the official regulation of prostitution the schools and convents are the chief fields of activity for the middle-class belgian women engaged in non-domestic callings and yet there are only a few women doctors one of these mrs derscheid delcour has been appointed as chief physician at the brussels orphans home mrs delcour graduated in eighteen ninety three at the university of berlin summa cum laude in eighteen ninety five she was awarded the gold medal in the surgical sciences in a prize contest for the students of the belgian universities in belgium two hundred sixty eight thousand three hundred thirty seven women are engaged in the industries the socialist party has recognized the organizations of these women it was instrumental in organizing two hundred fifty thousand women into trade unions elsewhere this would be impossible madame van der velde the wife of the socialist member of parliament and madame gatti de gamond the publisher of the cahier feministe were the leaders of the socialist woman's rights movement which is organized throughout the country in committees councils and societies madame gatti de gamond died in nineteen o five and her publication the cahier feministe was discontinued the secretary of the federation of socialist women federation de femmes socialistes is madame tillmans vouroit of ghent publishes a woman's magazine the stem de vrouw the women are demanding the right to vote the belgian women possessed municipal suffrage till eighteen thirty they were deprived of this right by the constitution of eighteen thirty one a measure favoring universal suffrage for men and women was introduced into parliament in eighteen ninety four this bill however provided also for plural voting by which the property owning and the educated classes were given one or two additional votes the socialists opposed this and demanded that each person have one vote un homme un vote the clerical majority then replied that it would not bring the bill to a vote in this way the clericals remained assured of a majority 
for tactical purposes the socialists adopted the expression un homme un vote it harmonized with their principles and ideals at a meeting of the party in which the matter was discussed it was shown that universal suffrage would be detrimental to the party's interests for the socialists were convinced that woman suffrage would certainly ensure a majority for the clericals hence in meeting the women were persuaded to withdraw their demand for woman suffrage on the grounds of opportuneness and in the meantime to work for the inauguration of universal male suffrage without the plural vote in the fronde audrey terre summarized this situation in the following dialogue the man emancipate yourself and i will enfranchise you the woman give me the franchise and i shall emancipate myself the man be free and you shall have freedom in this manner concludes audrey terre this dialogue can be continued indefinitely recently the middle-class women have begun to show an interest in woman suffrage a woman suffrage organization was formed in brussels in nineteen o eight one in ghent in nineteen o nine together they have organized the woman suffrage league which is affiliated with the international woman suffrage alliance woman's lack of rights and her powerlessness in public life are shown by the fact that in antwerp in nineteen o eight public aid to the unemployed was granted only to men to unmarried as well as to married men as for the unmarried women they were left to shift for themselves end of section twenty one section twenty two of the modern woman's rights movement this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the modern woman's rights movement by kata schirmacher translated by carl conrad eckhart italy total population thirty two million four hundred forty nine thousand seven hundred fifty four women about sixteen million one hundred ninety thousand men about sixteen million two hundred sixty thousand federation of italian women's clubs woman suffrage league national unification raised italy to the rank of a great power italy's political position as a great power her modern parliamentary life and the liberal and socialist majority in her parliament give italy a position that spain for example does not possess in any way catholicism clericalism and roman custom are no match for these modern liberal powers and are therefore unable to hinder the woman's rights movements in the same degree as do these influences in spain however the italian woman in general is still entirely dependent on the man see the discussion in alademo's una donna and in the unenlightened classes woman's feeling of inferiority is impressed upon her by the church the law the family and by custom naturally the woman attempts as in spain to take revenge in the sexual field in italy there is no strict morality among married men moreover the opposition to divorce in italy comes largely from the women who accustomed to being deceived in matrimony fear that if they are divorced they will be left without means of support boys make love to girls to mere unguided children without any will of their own and when these boys marry be they ever so young they have already had a wealth of experience that has taught them to regard woman disdainfully with a sort of cynical authority even love and respect for the innocent young wife is unable to eradicate from the young husband the impressions of immorality and bad examples the wife suffers from a hardly perceptible but unceasing depression of mind innocently without suspicion uninformed as to her husband's past the wife persists in her belief in his manly superiority until this belief has become a fixed habit of thought and then even a cruel revelation cannot take him from her in southern italy especially in sicily arabian oriental conceptions of woman still prevail during her whole life woman is a grown-up child no woman not even the most insignificant woman laborer can be on the street without an escort on the other hand the boys are emancipated very early 
with pity and arrogance the sons look down on the mother who must be accompanied in the street by her sons close intellectual relations between man and woman cannot as yet be developed owing to the generally low education of woman to her subordination and to her intellectual bondage while still in school the boy is trained for political life the average italian woman participates in politics even less than the german woman her influence is purely moral if the italian woman wishes to accept any office in a society she must have the consent of her husband attested by a notary just as in ancient times the non-professional interests of the husband are in great part elsewhere than at home the opportunity daily to discuss political and other current questions with men companions is found by the german man in the smaller cities while taking his evening pint of beer the italian man finds this opportunity sometimes in the cafe sometimes in the public places where every evening the men congregate for hours so the educated man in italy even more than in germany has no need of the intellectual qualities of his wife moreover his need for an educated wife is the less because his misguided precocity prevents him from acquiring anything but an essentially general education the restricted intellectual relationship between husband and wife is explained partly by the fact that the chichis beo still exists this relation ought to be and generally is platonic and publicly known the wife permits her friend the chichis beo to escort her to the theatre and elsewhere in a carriage the husband also escorts a woman friend so husband and wife share the inwardly moral unsoundness of the medieval service of the minnedienst at any rate this custom reveals the fact that after the honeymoon the husband and wife do not have overmuch to say to each other in this way there takes place to a certain extent an open relinquishment of the postulate that in accordance with the external indissolubility of married life there ought to be permanent intellectual bonds between man and wife a postulate that is the source of the most serious conscience struggles but which has caused the great moral development of the northern woman naturally under such circumstances the woman's rights movement has done practically nothing for the masses in the circles of the nobility the movement with the consent of the clergy has until recently confined itself to philanthropy the forming of associations and insurance societies the founding of homes asylums etc and the higher education of girls in a private audience the pope has expressed himself in favor of women's engaging in university studies except theology but he was opposed to woman suffrage the daughters of the educated liberal but often poor bourgeoisie are driven by want and conviction to acquire a higher education and to engage in academic callings the material difficulties are not great as in france the government has during the past thirty-five years promoted all educational measures that would take from the clergy its power over youth elementary education is public and obligatory the laws are enforced rather strictly co-education nowhere exists the number of women teachers is sixty two thousand six hundred forty three the secondary school system is still largely in the hands of the catholic religious orders there are about one hundred thousand girls and nuns enrolled in these church schools only twenty five thousand girls are in the secondary state and private schools other than the catholic schools which cannot give instruction as cheaply as the religious schools the efforts of the state in this field are not to be criticized it has given women every educational opportunity girls wishing to study in the universities are admitted to the boys classical schools ginasi and to the boys technical schools this experiment in co-education during the plastic age of youth has not even been undertaken by france to be sure at present the girls sit together on the front seats and when entering and leaving class they have the school porter as bodyguard in spite of all fears to the contrary co-education has been a success in northern italy milan as well as in southern italy naples the universities have never been closed to women in recent years three hundred women have attended the universities and have graduated 
during the renaissance there were many women teachers in italy this tradition has been revived at present there are ten women university teachers doctor of jurisprudence teresa labriola whose mother is a german is a lecturer in the philosophy of law at rome doctor of medicine rina monti is a university lecturer in anatomy at pavia there are many practicing women doctors in italy doctor of medicine maria montessori a delegate to the international congress of women in berlin in eighteen ninety six is a physician in the roman hospitals the minister of public instructions has authorized her to deliver a course of lectures on the treatment of imbecile children to a class of women teachers in the elementary schools the legal profession still remains closed to women although doctor of jurisprudence laidi poet has succeeded in being admitted to the bar in turin in government service in nineteen o one there were one thousand women telephone employees one hundred eighty three women telegraph clerks and one hundred sixty one women office clerks these positions are much sought after by men the number of women employed in commerce is eighteen thousand the total number of persons employed in commerce being fifty seven thousand eighty seven recently women have been appointed as factory inspectors the beginnings of the modern woman's rights movement coincide with the political upheavals that occurred between eighteen fifty nine and eighteen seventy when the kingdom of italy had been established jesse white mario demanded a reform of the legal political and economic status of woman whatever legal concessions have been made to women are due as in france to the liberal parliamentary majority since eighteen seventy seven women have been able to act as witnesses in civil suits women even married women can be guardians the property laws provide for separation of property even in cases of joint property holding the wife controls her earnings and savings the husband can give her a general authorization allgemeine authorization thus giving her the full status of a legal person before the law these laws are the most radical reforms to which the code napoleon has ever been subjected reforms which the french did not venture to enact the liberal majority made an attempt in eighteen seventy seven to emancipate the women politically but the attempt failed bills providing for municipal woman suffrage were introduced and rejected in eighteen eighty eighteen eighty three and eighteen eighty eight however since eighteen ninety women have been eligible as poor law guardians the elite among the italian men loyally supported the women in their struggle for emancipation since eighteen eighty one the women have organized clubs at first these were unsuccessful free and courageous women were in the minority in rome the woman's rights movement was at first exclusively benevolent in milan and turin on the other hand there were women's rights advocates under the leadership of doctor of medicine pauline schiff and emilia mariani the leadership of the national movement fell to the more active more educated and economically stronger northern italy here also the movement of the working women had progressed to the stage of organization as for example in the case of the lombard women workers in the rice fields there are one million three hundred seventy one thousand four hundred twenty six women laborers in italy their condition is wretched in agriculture as well as in the industries they are given the rough poorly paid work to do they are exploited to the extreme women straw platers have been offered twenty centimes even as little as ten centimes four to two cents for twelve hours work the average daily wage for women is eighty centimes to one franc sixteen to twenty cents the maximum is one franc fifty centimes thirty cents the law has fixed the maximum working day for women at twelve hours and prohibits women under twenty years of age from engaging in work that is dangerous and injurious to health there are maternity funds for women in confinement financial aid being given them for four weeks after the birth of the child under all these circumstances the organization of women is exceedingly difficult even the socialists have neglected the organization of working women socialist propaganda among women agricultural workers was begun in nineteen o one 
in bologna in the autumn of nineteen o two there was held a meeting of the representatives of eight hundred agricultural organizations having a total membership of one hundred fifty thousand men and women agricultural laborers the constitution of the society is characteristic many of its clauses are primitive and pathetic the society is intended to be an educational and moral organization women members are exhorted to live rightly and to be virtuous and kind-hearted mothers women and daughters it is to be hoped that the task of the women will be made easier through the efforts of the society's male members to make themselves virtuous and kind-hearted fathers husbands and sons or are moral duties in this case also meant only for woman the movement favoring the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution was introduced into italy by mrs butler a congress in favor of abolition was held in eighteen ninety eight in genoa recently thanks to the efforts of dr agnes mclaren and miss buckner the movement has been revived and urged upon the catholic clergy the italian branch of the international federation for the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution was founded in nineteen o eight in the same year was held in rome the successful congress of the federation of women's clubs this congress representing the nobility the middle class and working women brought the woman's suffrage question to the attention of the public a number of woman suffrage societies had been organized previously in rome as well as in the provinces they formed the national woman suffrage league which in nineteen o six joined the international woman suffrage alliance through the discussions in the women's clubs woman suffrage became a topic of public interest the amsterdam report of the congress of the international woman suffrage alliance says the women of the aristocracy wish to vote because they are intelligent they feel humiliated because their coachman or chauffeur is able to vote the working women demand the right to vote that they may improve their conditions of labor and are able to support their children better a parliamentary commission for the consideration of woman's suffrage was established in nineteen o eight in the meantime the existence of this commission enables the president of the ministry to dispose of the various proposed measures with the explanation that such measures will not be considered until the commission has expressed itself on the whole question women have active and passive suffrage for the arbitration courts for labor disputes End of section 22. Section 23 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kata Schirmacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Spain total population eighteen million eight hundred thirteen thousand four hundred ninety three women nine million five hundred fifty eight thousand eight hundred ninety six men nine million two hundred seventy two thousand five hundred ninety seven no federation of women's clubs no woman's suffrage league whoever has travelled in spain knows that it is a country still living as it were in the seventeenth century nay in the middle ages the fact has manifold consequences for woman in all cases progress is hindered woman is under the yoke of the priesthood and of a catholicism generally bigoted the church teaches woman that she is regarded as the cause of carnal desire and of the fall of man by law woman is under the guardianship of man custom forbids the respectable woman to walk on the street without a man escort the spanish woman regards herself as a person of the second order a necessary adjunct to man such a fundamental humiliation and subordination is opposed to human nature as the spanish woman has no power of open opposition she resorts to cunning by instinct she is conscious of the power of her sex this she uses and abuses a woman's rights advocate is filled with horror quite as much as with pity when she sees this mixture of bigotry coquetry submissiveness cunning and hate that is engendered in woman by such tyranny and lack of progress the spanish woman of the lower classes receives no training for any special calling she is a mediocre laborer 
she acts as a beast of burden carries heavy burdens on her shoulders carries water tills the fields and splits wood she is employed as an industrial laborer chiefly in the manufacture of cigars and lace the wages of women says professor posada are incredibly low being but ten cents a day as tailors women make a scanty living for many of the spanish women do their own tailoring the mantilla makes the work of milliners in general superfluous in commercial callings women are still novices recently there has been talk of beginning the organization of women into trade unions women are employed in large numbers as teachers teaching being their sole non-domestic calling elementary instruction has been obligatory since eighteen seventy however only in theory in eighteen eighty nine twenty eight per cent of the women were illiterate in many cases the girls of the lower classes do not attend school at all when they do attend they learn very little for owing to the lack of seminaries the training of women teachers is generally quite inadequate a reform of the central seminary of women teachers in madrid took place in eighteen eighty four this reform was also a model for the seminaries in the provinces the secondary schools for girls are convent schools in france there are complaints that these schools are inadequate what then can be expected of the spanish schools the curriculum includes only french singing dancing drawing and needlework but the society for female education is striving to secure a reform of the education for girls preparation for entrance to the university must be secured privately the number of women seeking entrance to universities is small most of them so far as i know are medical students however the spanish women have a brilliant past in the field of higher education donna galinda was the latin professor of queen isabella isabella losa and sigia aloisia of toledo were renowned for their knowledge of latin greek and hebrew sigia aloisia corresponded with the pope in arabic and syriac isabel de rosores even preached in the cathedral of barcelona in the literature of the present time spanish women are renowned of first rank is emilia pardo bazan who is called the spanish zola she is a countess and an only daughter two circumstances that facilitated her emancipation and together with her talent assured her success she characterizes herself as a mixture of mysticism and liberalism at the age of seven she wrote her first verses her best book portrayed a liberal monk father fequet pasquale loper a novel was a great success she then went to paris to study naturalism here she became acquainted with zola goncourt daudet and others a study of francis of assisi led her again to the study of mysticism in her recent novels liberalism is mingled with idealism emilia pardo bazan is by conviction a woman's rights advocate in the madrid athenaeum she filled with great success the position of professor of french literature at the pedagogical congress in madrid in eighteen ninety nine she gave a report on woman her education and her rights in spain there are a number of well-known women journalists authors and poets dr posada enumerates a number of women's rights publications on pages two hundred to two hundred two of his book el feminismo concepcion arenal was a prominent spanish woman and woman's rights advocate she devoted herself to work among prisoners and wrote a valuable handbook dealing with her work she felt the oppression of her sex very keenly concerning woman's status which man has forced upon her concepcion arenal expressed herself as follows man despises all women that do not belong to his family he oppresses every woman that he does not love or protect as a laborer he takes from her the best paid positions as a thinker he forbids the mental training of woman as a lover he can be faithless to her without being punished by law as a husband he can leave her without being guilty before the law the wife is legally under the guardianship of her husband she has no authority over her children the property laws provide for joint property holding in spite of these conditions concepcion arenal did not give up all hope women said she are beginning to take interest in education and have organized a society for the higher education of girls 
the pedagogical congresses in madrid eighteen eighty two and eighteen eighty nine promoted the intellectual emancipation of women catalina d'alcala delegate to the international congress of women in chicago in eighteen ninety three closed her report with the words we are emerging from the period of darkness however he who has wandered through spanish cathedrals knows that this darkness is still very dense nevertheless the woman suffrage movement has begun the woman laborers are agitating in favor of a new law of association a number of women teachers and women authors have petitioned for the right to vote in march nineteen o eight during the discussion of a new law concerning municipal administration an amendment in favor of woman suffrage was introduced but was rejected by a vote of sixty five to thirty five the senate is said to be more favorable to woman suffrage than is the chamber of deputies the fact that women of the aristocracy have opposed divorce and that women of all classes have opposed the enactment of laws restricting religious orders is made to operate against the political emancipation of women a deputy in the cortez senor p e arzuaga who introduced the measure in favor of the right of women taxpayers to vote in municipal elections argued that the suffrage of a woman who is head of a family seems more reasonable to him than the suffrage of a young man twenty-five years old who represents no corresponding interests portugal total population five million six hundred seventy two thousand two hundred thirty seven women two million five hundred eighty three thousand five hundred thirty five men two million five hundred twenty thousand six hundred two no federation of women's clubs no woman's suffrage league portugal is smaller than spain its finances are in better condition therefore the compulsory education law introduced in eighteen ninety six is better enforced as yet there are no public high schools for girls but there are a number of private schools that prepare girls for the university entrance examinations arbiturient and examen the universities admit women women doctors practice in the larger cities the women laborers are engaged chiefly in the textile industry their wages are about two-thirds of those of the men end of section twenty three section twenty four of the modern woman's rights movement this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the modern woman's rights movement by kathy schermacher translated by carl conrad eckhart the latin american republics of central and south america mexico and central america the condition prevailing in mexico and central america is one of patriarchal family life the husband being the master of the wife there are large families of ten or twelve children the life of most of the women without property consists of endless routine and domestic tyranny the life of the property-owning woman is one of frivolous coquetry and indolence there is no higher education for women there are no high ideals the education of girls is generally regarded as unnecessary there are public elementary schools for girls with women teachers the higher education of girls is carried on by convent schools and comprises domestic science sewing dancing and singing in the mexican public high schools for girls modern subjects in literature are taught the work is chiefly memorizing technical schools for girls are unknown women do not attend the universities women teachers in mexico are paid good salaries two hundred and fifty francs fifty dollars a month women are engaged in commerce only in their own business establishments and then in small retail businesses the rest of the working women are engaged in agriculture 
domestic service, washing, and sewing. Their wages are from 40 to 50 percent lower than those of men. The legal status of women is similar to that of the French women. In Mexico only does the wife control her earnings. Divorce is not recognized by law, though separation is. By means of foreign teachers, the initiative of the people has been slightly aroused. It will take long for this stimulus to reach the majority of the people. South America In South America, there are the same patriarchal forms of family life, the same external restrictions for women. She must have an escort on the streets, even though the escort be only a small boy. Just as in Central America, the occupations of the women of the lower and middle classes are agriculture, domestic service, washing, sewing, and retail business. But women's educational opportunities in South America are greater, although through public opinion everything possible is done to prevent women from desiring an education and admission to a liberal calling. Elementary education is compulsory, often in coeducational schools. Secondary education is in the hands of convents. In Brazil, Chile, Venezuela, Argentine Republic, Paraguay, and Colombia, the universities have been opened to women. As yet, there are no women preachers or lawyers, although several women have studied law. Women practice as physicians, obstetrics still being their special field. The beginnings of a woman's rights movement exist in Chile. The Chilean women learn readily and willingly. They have proved their worth in business and in the liberal callings. They have competed successfully for government positions. They have founded trade unions and cooperative societies. Many women are tramway conductors, etc. In all the South American republics, women have distinguished themselves as poets and authors. In the Argentine Republic, there is a federation of women's clubs, which in 1901 joined the International Council of Women. End of section 24. Section 25 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Cathay Schirmacher, translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Chapter 3. The Slavic and Balkan States. Russia. The Slavic and Balkan States. In the Slavic countries, there is a lack of an ancient, deeply rooted culture like that of Western Europe. Everywhere, the Oriental point of view has had its effect on the status of woman. In general, the standards of life are low. Therefore, the wages of the women are especially wretched. Political conditions are in part very unstable, in some cases wholly antique. All of these circumstances greatly impede the progress of the woman's rights movement. Russia. Total population. 94,206,195. Women. 47,772,455. Men. 46,433,740. Federation of Russian Women's Clubs. National Women's Suffrage League. The Russian woman's rights movement is forced by circumstances to concern itself chiefly with educational and industrial problems. All efforts beyond these limits are, as a matter of course, regarded as revolutionary. Such efforts are a part of the forbidden political movement. Therefore, they are dangerous and practically hopeless. Some peculiarities of the Russian woman's rights movement are its individuality, its independence of the momentary tendencies of the government, and the companionable cooperation of men and women. 
All three characteristics are accounted for by the absolute government that prevails in Russia, in spite of its Duma. Under this regime, the organization of societies and the holding of meetings are made exceedingly difficult, if not impossible. Individual initiative therefore works in solitude. Discussion or the expression of opinions is not very feasible. When individual initiative ceases, progress usually ceases also. Corporate activity, such as educates women adherents, did not exist formally in Russia. The lack of united action wastes much force, time, and money. Unconsciously, people compete with each other. Without wishing to do so, people neglect important fields. The absolute regime regards all striving for an education as revolutionary. The educational institutions for women are wholly in the hands of the government. These institutions are tolerated, but a mere frown from above puts an end to their existence. It is the absolute regime that makes comrades of men and women struggling for emancipation. The oppression endured by both sexes is, in fact, the same. The government has not always been an enemy of enlightenment, as it is today. The first steps of the women's rights movement were made through the influence of the rulers. Although polygamy did not exist in Russia, the country could not free itself from certain oriental influences. Hence, the women of the property-owning class formerly lived in the harem, called Terum. The women were shut off from the world. They had no education, often no rearing whatever. They were victims of deadly ennui, ecstatic piety, lingering diseases, and drunkenness. With a strong hand, Peter the Great reformed the condition of Russian women. The Terum was abolished. The Russian woman was permitted to see the world. In rough, uncivilized surroundings, in the midst of a brutal, sensuous people, Woman's release was not in all cases a gain for morality. It is impossible to become a woman of Western Europe upon demand. Catherine II saw that there must be a preparation for this emancipation. She created the Institut de Demoiselles for girls of the upper classes. The instruction, borrowed from France, remained superficial enough. The women acquired a knowledge of French, a few accomplishments, polished manners, and an aristocratic bearing. For all that, it was then an achievement to educate young Russian women according to the standards of Western Europe. The superficiality of the Institutka was recognized in the middle of the 19th century. Alexander II, the Tsarina, and her aunt, Helene Pavlovna, favored reforms. The emancipator of the serfs could also liberate women from their intellectual bondage. Thus, with the protection of the highest power, the first public lyceum for girls was established in 1857 in Russia. This was a day school for girls of all classes. What an innovation! Today, there are 350 of these lyceums, having over 10,000 women students. The curriculums resemble those of the German high schools for girls. None of these lyceums, except the humanistic lyceum for girls in Moscow, are equivalent to the German gymnasiums or real gymnasiums, nor even to the ubi Realschulen or Realschulen. This explains and justifies the refusal of the German universities to regard the leaving certificates of the Russian lyceums as equivalent to the Abiturienten certificate of the German schools. The compulsory studies in the girls' lyceums are Russian, French, religion, history, geography, geometry, algebra, a few natural sciences, dancing, and singing. The optional studies are German, English, Latin, music, and sewing. The lyceums of the large cities make foreign languages compulsory also, but these institutions are in the minority. In the natural sciences and in the mathematics, much depends on the teacher. A Russian woman wishing to study in the university must pass an entrance examination in Latin. The first efforts to secure the higher education of women were made by a number of professors of the University of St. Petersburg in 1861. They opened courses for the instruction of adult women in the town hall. Simultaneously, the Minister of War admitted a number of women to the St. Petersburg School of Medicine, this school being under his control. However, the reaction began already in 1862. Instruction in the School of Medicine, as well as in the town hall, was discontinued. Then began the first exodus of Russian women students to Germany and Switzerland. But in St. Petersburg in 1867, there was formed a society under the presidency of Mrs. Conradi, 
to secure the reopening of the Corps for adult women. The Society appealed to the First Congress of Russian Naturalists and Physicians. This Congress sent a petition with the signatures of influential men to the Minister of Public Instruction. In two years, Mrs. Conradi was informed that the minister would grant a two-year course for men and women in Russian literature and the natural sciences. The Society accepted what was offered. It was little enough. Moreover, the Society had to defray the cost of instruction, but it was denied the right to give examinations and confer degrees. All the teachers, however, taught without pay. In 1885, the Society erected its own building in which to give its courses. The instruction was again discontinued in 1886. Once more, the Russian women flocked to foreign countries. In 1889, the courses were again opened. Swiss influence on Russian youth was feared. The number of those enrolled in the courses was limited to 600. Of these, only 3% could be unorthodox, i.e. Jewish. These courses are still given in St. Petersburg. Recently, the Council of Ministers empowered the Minister of Public Instruction to forbid women to attend university lectures, but those who have already been admitted and find it impossible to attend other higher institutions of learning for girls have been allowed to complete their course in the university. The present number of women hearers in Russian universities is 2,130. A Russian woman doctor was admitted as a lecturer by the University of Moscow, but her appointment was not confirmed by the Minister of Public Instruction. She appealed thereupon to the Senate, declaring that the Russian laws nowhere prohibited women from acting as teachers in the universities. Moreover, her medical degree gave her full power to do so. The decision of the Senate is still pending. A recent law opens to women the calling of architect and of engineer. The work done on the Trans-Siberian Railroad by the woman engineer has given better satisfaction than any of the other work. A bill providing for the admission of women to the legal profession has been introduced but has not yet become law. The Russian women medical students share the vicissitudes of the Russian university life for women. After 1862, they studied in Switzerland, where Miss Suslova in 1867 was the first woman to be given the doctor's degree in Zurich. However, since the lack of doctors is very marked on the vast Russian plains, the government in 1872 opened special courses for women medical students in St. Petersburg. In another institution, courses were given for midwives and for women regimental surgeons. The women completing the courses in St. Petersburg were not granted the doctor's degree, however. The Russian women earned the doctor's degree in the Russo-Turkish War, 1877-1878. For 10 years after this war, women graduates of the St. Petersburg medical courses were granted degrees. Then these courses were closed in 1887. They were opened again in 1898. Under these difficult circumstances, the Russian women secured their higher education. In the elementary schools, for every 1,000 women inhabitants, there are only 13.1 women public school teachers. Of the 2 million public school children, only 650,000 are girls. The number of illiterates in Russia varies from 70 to 80 percent. The elementary school course in the country is only three years. It is five years in the cities. The number of women public school teachers is 27,000, as compared with 40,000 men teachers. An attempt has been made by the women village school teachers to arouse the women agricultural laborers from their stupor. Organization of women laborers has been attempted in the cities. For the present, the task seems superhuman. When graduating from the Lyceum, the young girl is given her teaching diploma, which permits her to teach in the four lower classes in the girls' lyceums. Those wishing to teach in the higher classes must take a special examination in a university. The higher classes in the girls' lyceums are taught chiefly by men teachers. When a Russian woman teacher marries, she need not relinquish her position. In Russia, the women doctors have a vast field of work. For every 200,000 inhabitants, there is only one doctor. However, in St. Petersburg, there is one doctor for every 10,000 inhabitants. According to the most recent statistics, there are 545 women doctors in Russia. Of these, eight have ceased to practice, 
245 have official positions, and 292 have a private practice. Of the 132 women doctors in St. Petersburg, 35 are employed in hospitals, 14 in the sanitary department of the city, 7 are school physicians, 5 are assistants in clinics and laboratories, 2 are superintendents of maternity hospitals, 2 have charge of foundling asylums, 5 have private hospitals, and the rest engage in private practice. Of the 413 women doctors not in St. Petersburg, 173 have official positions, the others have a private practice. The local governments, Zemst, Vos, have appointed 26 women doctors in the larger cities, 21 in the smaller, and 55 in the rural districts. There are 18 women doctors employed in private hospitals on country estates, 8 in hospitals for Mohammedan women, 16 in schools, 9 in factories, 4 are employed by railroads, 4 by the Red Cross Society, etc. The practice of the woman doctor in the country is naturally the most difficult and the least remunerative. Therefore, it is willingly given over to the women. Thanks to individual ability, the Russian woman doctor is highly respected. There are 400 women druggists in Russia. Their training for the calling is received by practical work. This is true of the men druggists also. According to the latest statistics, 1897, there were 126,016 women engaged in the liberal professions. There are a number of women professors in the state universities. Women engage in commercial callings. The schools of commerce for women were favored by Vita in his capacity of Minister of Finance. They have since been placed under the control of the Minister of Instruction and Religion. This will restrict the freedom of instruction. Instruction in agriculture for women has not yet been established. Commerce engages 299,403 women. Agriculture and fisheries, 2,086,169. Women have been appointed as factory inspectors since 1900. The Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Communication employ women in limited numbers without entitling them to pensions. The government of the province of Moscow has appointed women to municipal offices and has appointed them as fire insurance agents. The Zemstvo of Kiev had done this previously, but suddenly it discharged them from the municipal offices. For the past nine years, an institution founded by the Princess Lywin has trained women as managers of prisons. The names of two prominent Russian women must be mentioned, Sonia Kowaluska, the winner of a contest in mathematics, and Madame Sklodovska Curie, the discoverer of radium. Both prove that women can excel in scientific work. It must be emphasized that the woman student in Russia must often struggle against terrible want. Whoever has studied in Swiss, German, or French universities knows the Russian-Polish students who, in many cases, must get along for the whole year with a couple of 10-ruble bills, about $10. They are wonderfully unassuming. They possess inexhaustible enthusiasm. Many Russian women begin their university careers poorly prepared. To unfortunate, divorced, widowed, or destitute women, the university appears to be a golden goal, a promised land. Of the privatations that these women endure, the people of Western Europe have no conception. In Russia, the facts are better known. Wealthy women endow all educational institutions for girls with relief funds and with loan and stipend funds. Restaurants and homes for university women have been established. The Society for the Support of University Women in Moscow has done its utmost to relieve the misery of the women students. The economic misery of the industrial and agricultural women who are almost wholly unorganized is somewhat worse than that of the university women. The statements concerning women's wages in Vienna might give some idea of the misery of the Russian women. In Bialystok, which has the best socialistic organization of women, the women textile workers earn about 18 cents a day. Under favorable circumstances, $1.25 to $1.50 a week, a skillful woman tobacco worker will earn 32 and a half cents a day. The average daily wages for Russian women laborers are 18 to 20 cents. 
Hence, it is not astonishing that in the South American houses of ill fame, there are so many Russian girls. The agents in the white slave trade need not make very extravagant promises of good wages to find willing followers. A working woman's club has existed since 1897 in St. Petersburg. There are 982,098 women engaged in industry and mining, 1,673,605 in domestic service, there being 1,586,450 men domestic servants. Of the women domestic servants, 53,283 are illiterate. Of the men, only 2,172. In 1885, the women formed 30% of the laboring population. In 1900, the number had increased to 44%. Of the total number of criminals in Russia, 10% are women. The legal status of the Russian woman is favorable insofar as the property law provides for property rights. The Russian married woman controls not only her property, but also her earnings and her savings. As survival of village communism and the feudal system, the right to vote is restricted to taxpayers and to landowners. In the rural districts, the wife votes as head of the family if her husband is absent or dead. Then she is also given her share of the village land. She votes in person. In the cities, the women that own houses and pay taxes vote by proxy. The women owners of large estates, as in Austria, vote also for the provincial assemblies. Although constitutional liberties have a precarious existence in Russia, they have now and then been beneficial to women. With great effort and in the face of great dangers, women's suffrage societies were formed in various parts of the empire. They united into a national Women's Suffrage League. The brave Russian delegates were present in Copenhagen and in Amsterdam. They belonged to all ranks of society and were adherents to the progressive political parties. Since the dissolution of the First Duma, June 9, 1906, the work of the women's suffrage advocates has been made very difficult. In rural districts especially, all initiative has been crippled. In Moscow and St. Petersburg, the work is continued by organizations having about a 1,000 members. 10,000 pamphlets have been distributed, lectures have been held, a newspaper has been established, and a committee has been organized, which maintains a continuous communication with the Duma. The best established center of the Russian woman's rights movement is the Women's Club in St. Petersburg. Through the tenacious efforts of the leading women of the club, Mrs. V. Philosophal, Mrs. Dr. Med Shabanov, and others, the government granted them, in the latter part of December 1908, the right to hold the first National Congress of Women. The stipulation was made that foreign women should not participate and that a federation of women's clubs should not be formed. The discussions concerned education, labor problems, and politics. Publicity was much restricted. Police surveillance was rigid. Addresses on the foreign woman's suffrage movement were prohibited. Nevertheless, this progressive declaration was made. Only the right to vote can secure for the Russian women a thorough education and the right to work. Moreover, the Congress favored better marriage laws, a wife cannot secure a passport without the consent of her husband, the abolition of the official regulation of prostitution, the abolition of the death penalty, the struggle against drunkenness, etc. The Congress was opened by the Lord Mayor of St. Petersburg and was held in the St. Petersburg Town Hall. This was done in a sense of obligation to the women school teachers of St. Petersburg and to those women who had endeared themselves to the people through their activity in hospitals and asylums. The Lord Mayor stated that these activities were appreciated by the municipal officers and by all municipal institutions. Although the Congress was opened with praise for the women, it ended with an intentional insult to the highly talented and deserving leader, Mrs. V. Philosophal. Mr. Purichkewicz, the reactionary deputy of the Duma, wrote a letter in which he expressed his pleasure at the adjournment of her Congress of Prostitutes, Bordel Congress. Mrs. V. Philosophal surrendered this letter and another to the courts, which sentenced the offender to a month's imprisonment against which he appealed. After this, 
Congress has worked over the whole field of the women's rights movement. A special Congress on the Education of Women will be held in the autumn of 1909. Since the Revolution of 1905, the women of the provinces have been astir. It has been reported that the Mohammedan women of the Caucasus are discarding their veils, that the Russian women in the rural districts are petitioning for greater privileges, etc. An organized woman's rights movement has originated in the Baltic provinces. Its organ is the Baltic Women's Review. Baltisch Frauenrundschau, the publisher being a woman, E. Schutze Rega. End of section 25. Section 26 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Julie Johnsrud. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Keita Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Czechish Bohemia and Moravia. Total population, about 5,500,000. The women predominate numerically. No federation of women's clubs, no women's suffrage league. The women's rights movement is strongly supported among the Czechs. Woman is the best apostle of nationalism. The educated woman is the most valuable ally. In the national propaganda, woman takes her place beside the man. The names of the Czechish women patriots are on the lips of everybody. Had the liberals of German Austria known equally well how to inspire their women with liberalism and Germanism, their cause would today be more firmly rooted. In inexpensive but well-organized boarding schools, the Czechish girls, especially country girls, the daughters of landowners and tenants, are being educated along national lines. An institute such as the Vesna, springtime, in Brunn, is a center of national propaganda. Prague, like Brunn, has a Czechish gymnasium for girls as well as the German gymnasium. There is also a Czechish university besides the German university. The first woman to be given the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at the Czechish university was Fraulein Babor. The industrial conditions in Czechish Bohemia and in Moravia differ very little from those in Galicia. The lot of the working women, especially in the coal mining districts, is wretched. According to a local club doctor, Kassenarts, a doctor employed by a working men's association, life is made up of hunger, whiskey, and lashes. Although paragraph 30 of the Austrian Law of Association, Vereinsgesetz, prevents the Czechish women from forming political associations, the women of Bohemia, especially of Prague, show the most active political interest. The women owners of large estates in Bohemia voted until 1906 for members of the imperial parliament. When universal suffrage was granted to the Austrian men, the voting rights of this privileged minority were withdrawn. The government's resolution providing for an early introduction of a woman's suffrage measure has not yet been carried out. The suffrage conditions for the Bohemian Landtag, provincial legislature, are different. Taxpayers, office holders, doctors and teachers vote for this body. The women, of course, voting by proxy. The same is true in the Bohemian municipal elections. In Prague only are the women deprived of the suffrage. The Prague Women's Suffrage Committee, organized in 1905, has proved irrefutably that the women in Prague are legally entitled to the suffrage for the Bohemian Landtag. In the Landtag election of 1907, the women presented a candidate, Ms. Tumava, who received a considerable number of votes but was defeated by the most prominent candidate, the mayor. However, this campaign aroused an active interest in women's suffrage. In 1909, Ms. Tumava was again a candidate. The proposed reform of the election laws for the Bohemian Landtag, 1908, which provides for universal suffrage, although not equal suffrage, would disfranchise the women outside Prague. The women are opposing the law by indignation meetings and deputations. End of section 27.
End of Section 26「Section 27 of the Modern Women's Rights Movement」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Hope Bloom. The Modern Women's Rights Movement by Cathay Schirmacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Galicia. Total population, about 7 million. Poles, about 3,500,000. Ruthenians, about 3,500,000. The women predominate numerically. No federation of women's clubs, no women's suffrage league. The conditions prevailing in Galicia are unspeakably pathetic, medieval, oriental, and atrocious. Whoever has read Emil Franzo's works is familiar with these conditions. The Vienna official inquiry into the industrial conditions of women led to a similar inquiry in Lemberg. This showed that most of the women cannot live on their earnings. The lowest wages are those of the women engaged in the ready-made clothing industry, two to two and a half goldens, 96 cents to $1.10 a month as beginners, eight to 10 goldens, $3.85 to $4.82 later. The wages, including board and room of servant girls living with their employers, are 20 to 25 cents a day. The skilled seamstress that sews linen garments can earn 40 cents a day if she works 16 hours. As a beginner, a milliner earns two to four goldens, 96 cents to $1.93 a month, Later, 10 goldens, $4.82. In the mitten industry, a home industry, a week's hard work brings six to eight goldens, $2.89 to $3.88. In laundries, women working 14 hours earn 80 kreuzer, 30 cents a day without board. In printing works and in book binderies, women are employed as assistants. For nine and a half hours work a day, they are paid a monthly wage of from two to 14 and 15 goldens, 96 cents to $7.23. In the book binderies, women sometimes receive 16 goldens, $7.71 a month. In Lemberg, as in Vienna, women are employed as brickmakers and as bricklayers assistants, working 10 to 11 hours a day. Their wages are 40 to 60 kreuzer, 19 to 29 cents a day. No attempt to improve these conditions through organizations has yet been made. The official inquiry thus far has confined itself to the Christian women laborers. What miseries might not be concealed in the ghettos? An industrial women's movement in Galicia is not to be thought of as yet. There is a migration of the women from the flat rural districts to the cities, i.e. into the nets of the white slave agents. Women earning 10, 15, or 20 cents a day are easily lured by promises of higher wages. The ignorance of the lower classes, Ruthenians and Poles, is, according to the ideas of Western Europe, immeasurable. In 1897, 336,000 children between 6 and 12 years, in a total of about 923,000, had never attended school. Of 4,164 men teachers, 139 had no qualifications whatever. Of the 4,159 women teachers, 974 had no qualifications. The minimum salary is 500 kroinen. $101.50. The women teachers in 1909 demanded that they be regarded on an equality with the men teachers by the provincial school board. There are gymnasiums for girls in Krakow, Lemberg, and Przemysl. Women are admitted to the universities of Krakow and Lemberg. In one of the universities, Mrs. Dr. Dushinska is a lecturer on political economy. In Krakow, there is a women's club, 
Propaganda is being organized throughout the land. A society to oppose the official regulation of prostitution and to improve moral conditions was organized in 1908. The Galician woman taxpayer votes in municipal affairs. The women owners of large estates vote for members of the Landtag. Mrs. Dr. Dushinska and Mrs. Kushkaska Reinschmidt of Krakow are champions of the women's rights movement in Galicia. Mrs. Kushkaska lives during parts of the year in Warsaw. She publishes the magazine Stir. In Russian Poland, her activities are more restricted because the forming of organizations is made difficult. In spite of this, the Equal Rights Society of Polish Women has organized local societies in Kiev, Radom, Lubin, and other cities. The formation of a federation of Polish women's clubs has been planned. In Warsaw, the Polish branch of the International Federation for the Abolition of Prostitution was organized in 1907. An asylum for women teachers, a loan fund for women teachers, and a commission for industrial women are the external evidences of the activities of the Polish women's rights movement in Warsaw. The field of labor for the educated woman is especially limited in Poland. Excluded from government service, many educated Polish women flock into the teaching profession. There they have restricted advantages. The University of Warsaw has been opened to women. End of section 27. Section 28 of the Modern Women's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Hope Bloom. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Cathay Schiermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. The Slovene Woman's Rights Movement. Total Population. 1,176,672. The women preponderate numerically. The Slovene Women's Rights Movement is still incipient. It was stimulated by Zafka Kaveder's The Mystery of Woman, Mysterium der Frau. Zafka Kaveder's motto is to see, to know, to understand. Woman is a human being. Zafka Kaveder hopes to transform the magazine Slovenka, into a woman's rights review. A South Slavic social democratic movement is attempting to organize trade unions among the women. The women lace makers have been organized. 70% of all women laborers cannot live on their earnings. In agricultural work, they earn 70 hellers, 14 cents a day. In the ready-made clothing industry, they are paid 30 hellers, 6 cents, for making 36 buttonholes, 1 krona, 20 hellers, 25 cents for making one dozen shirts. End of section 28. Section 29 of the Modern Women's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Modern Women's Rights Movement by Kath Schermacher. Translated by Karl Konrad Eckhart. Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania. Serbia. Total population, 2,850,000. The number of women is somewhat greater than that of the men. Serbian Federation of Women's Clubs. Serbia has been free from Turkish control hardly 45 years. Among the people, the oriental conception of woman prevails, along with patriarchal family conditions. The women's rights movement is well organized. It is predominantly national, philanthropic, and educational. Elementary education is obligatory and is supported by the National Society for Public Education, Nationalen Verein für Volksbildung. The girls and women of the lower classes are engaged chiefly with domestic duties. In addition, they work in the fields or work at excellent home industries. These home industries were developed as a means of livelihood by the efforts of Mrs. E. Subotish, the organizer of the Serbian women's rights movement. The Serbian women are rarely domestic servants. Under Turkish rule, they were not permitted to serve the enemy. Most of the domestic servants are Hungarians and Austrians. All educational opportunities are open to the women of the middle class. In all of the more important cities, there are public as well as private high schools for girls. 
The boys' gymnasiums admit girls. The university has been open to women for 21 years. Women are enrolled in all departments. Recently, law has attracted many. For medical training, the women, like the men, go to foreign countries. France, Switzerland. Servia has 1,020 women teachers in the elementary schools, the salary being 720 to 2,000 francs, $144 to $500 a year with lodging. There are 65 women teachers in the secondary schools, the salary being 1,500 to 3,000 francs, $300 to $600. To the present, no woman has been appointed as a university professor. There are six women doctors, the first having entered the profession 30 years ago. There are two women dentists, but as yet there are no women druggists. There are no women lawyers. There is a woman engineer in the service of the government. In the liberal arts, there are three well-known women artists, seven women authors, and ten women poets. There are many women engaged in commercial callings, as office clerks, cashiers, bookkeepers, and saleswomen. Women are also employed by banks and insurance companies. A woman merchant is given extensive credit, is stated in the report of the Secretary of the Federation. In the Postal and Telegraph Service, 108 women are employed, the salaries varying from 700 to 1,260 francs, $140 to $252. There are 127 women in the Telephone Service, the salaries varying from 360 to 960 francs, $72 to $192. Servia is just establishing large factories. The number of women laborers is still small. 1,604 are organized. Prostitution is officially regulated in Serbia. Its recruits are chiefly foreign women. Each vaudeville singer, barmaid, etc. is ex officio placed under control. The oldest women's club is the Belgrad Women's Club, founded in 1875. It has 34 branches. It maintains a school for poor girls, a school for weavers in Pirat, and a student's kitchen, Studentenkuch. The Society of Serbian Sisters and Society of Queen Lubica are patriotic societies for maintaining and strengthening the Servian element in Turkey, Old Servia, and Macedonia. The Society of Mothers takes care of abandoned children. The Housekeeping Society trains domestic servants. The Servian women's clubs within the kingdom have 5,000 members. In the Servian colonies without the kingdom, they have 14,000 members. The property laws provide for joint property holding. The wife controls her earnings and savings only when this is stipulated in the marriage contract. In 1909, the Federation of Servian Women's Clubs inserted women's suffrage in its program and joined the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. In the struggle for national existence, the Servian woman demonstrated her worth and effected a recognition of her right to an education. Bulgaria. Total population, 4,035,586. Women, 1,978,457. Men, 2,057,111. Federation of Bulgarian Women's Clubs. Like Servia, Bulgaria was freed from Turkish control about 40 years ago. The liberation caused very little change in the life of the peasant women, but it opened new educational opportunities for the middle classes. The elementary schools naturally provide for the girls also. In 1905 to 1906, there were 1,800 men teachers and 800 women teachers in the villages. In the cities, 415 men and 355 women. High schools for girls have been established, but not all of them prepare for the abiturientin examen. The first women entered the University of Sofia in 1900. There are now about 100 women students. Since 1907, through the work of a reactionary ministry, the university has excluded women. Married women teachers have been discharged. Women attend the schools of commerce, the technical schools, and the agricultural schools. Women are active as doctors, there being 56, midwives, journalists, and authors. The men and women teachers are organized jointly. Women are employed by the state in the postal and telegraph service. The wages of these women, like those of the women laborers, are lower than those of the men. There is a factory law that protects women laborers and children working in the factories. The trade unions are socialistic and have men and women members. The laws regulating the legal status of women have been influenced by German laws. The wife controls her earnings. Politically, the Bulgarian woman has no rights. The Federation of Bulgarian Women's Clubs was organized in 1899. In 1908, it joined the International Council of Women. Women's suffrage occupies the first place on the program of the Federation. In 1908, it joined the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. The Bulgarian women, too, have recognized women's suffrage as the key to all other women's rights. To the present time, their demands have been supported by radicals and Democrats, who are not very influential. A meeting of the Federation in 1908 demanded active and passive suffrage for women in school administration and municipal councils, the reopening of the university to women, this has been granted, the increase of the salaries of women teachers, they are paid 10% less than the men teachers. 
the same curriculum for the boys' and girls' schools, an enlargement of women's field of labor, better protection to women and children working in factories. The president of the Federation is the wife of the president of the ministry, Malinoff. Because the Federation, led by Mrs. Malinoff, did not oppose the reactionary measures of the ministry of Stambolovich, Mrs. Anna Karima, who had been president of the Federation to 1906, organized the League of Progressive Women. This league demands equal rights for the sexes. It admits only confirmed women's rights advocates, men and women. It will request the political emancipation of women in a petition which it intends to present to the national parliament, which must be called after Bulgaria has been converted into a kingdom. In July 1909, the Progressive League will hold a meeting to draft its constitution. Romania. Total population, 6,585,534. No federation of women's clubs. No women's suffrage league. The status of the Romanian women is similar to that of the Serbian and Bulgarian women, but the legal profession has been open to the Bulgarian women. A discussion of Romania must be omitted, since my efforts to secure reliable information have been unsuccessful. End of section 29. Section 30 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Kathy Schermacher. Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Greece. Footnote. Greek conditions are analogous to conditions prevailing in Slavic countries. Hence, Greece will be treated here. Greece was liberated from Turkish control in 1827. End of footnote. Total population 2,433,806. Women. 1,166,990. Men. 1,266,816. Federation of Greek Women. No Women's Suffrage League. The Greek Woman's Rights Movement concerns itself for the time being with philanthropy and education. Its guiding spirit is Madame Kellerhoe Perrin, who acted as delegate in Chicago in 1893 and in Paris in 1900. Madame Perrin succeeded in 1896 in organizing a federation of Greek women, which has belonged to the International Council of Women since 1908. The presidency of the Federation was accepted by Queen Olga. The Federation has five sections. 1. The National Section. This acts as a patriotic women's club. In 1897, it rendered invaluable assistance in the Turco Creek War, erecting four hospitals on the border and one in Athens. The nurses belonged to the best families. The work was superintended by Doctor of Medicine Marie Kalapathaki and Doctor of Medicine Vasiliades. 2. The Educational Section This section establishes kindergartens. It has opened a seminary for kindergartners and courses for women teachers of gymnastics. Footnote. There are elementary schools for boys and girls. The secondary schools for girls are private. The first of these was founded by Dr. Hill and his wife, who were Americans. Preparation for entrance to the university is optional and is carried on privately. Athens University has admitted women since 1891. End of footnote. 3. The Section for the Establishment of Domestic Economy Schools and Continuation Schools. This section is attempting to enlarge the non-domestic field of women and, at the same time, 
to prepare women better for their domestic calling. The efforts of this section are quite in harmony with the spirit of the times. The Greek woman's struggle for existence is exceedingly difficult. She must face a backwardness of public opinion such as was overcome in Northern Europe long ago. This section has also founded a home for working women. 4. The Hygiene Section Under the leadership of Dr. Kalapothaki, this section has organized an orthopedic and gynecological clinic. This section also gives courses on the care of children and provides for the care of women in confinement. 5. The Philanthropic Section This provides respectable but needy girls with trousseaus a steward. Mrs. Perrin has for 18 years been editor of a woman's magazine in Athens. Miss Doctor of Medicine Panajotatu has since 1908 been a lecturer in bacteriology at Athens University. At her inaugural lecture, the students made a hostile demonstration. Miss Basiliades acts as physician in the women's penitentiary. Miss Lascarides and Miss Ionitis are respected artists. Mrs. V. Kupnist represents women in literature, especially in poetry. Mrs. Perrin has written several dramatic works, some advocating women's rights, which have been presented in Athens, Smyrna, Constantinople, and Alexandria. Mrs. Perrin is a director of the Society of Dramatists. Government positions are still closed to women. As late as 1909, after great difficulties, the first women telephone clerks were appointed. End of section 30. Section 31 of the Modern Women's Right Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Keitha Schirmacher, translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart. Chapter 4 The Orient and the Far East. In the Orient and the Far East, woman is almost without exception a plaything or a beast of burden, and to a degree that would incense us Europeans. In the uncivilized countries and in the countries of non-European civilization, the majority of the women are insufficiently nourished, in all cases more poorly than the men. Early marriages enervate the women. They are old at 30. This is especially true of the lower classes. Among us, to be sure, such cases occur also, unfortunately without sufficient censure being given when necessary. But we have abolished polygamy and the harem. Both still exist almost undisturbed in the Orient and the Far East. End of section 31 Read by Mama Chira, Tangerang Selatan. Section 32 of the Modern Woman's Rights Movement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Modern Woman's Rights Movement by Keitha Schirmacher Translated by Carl Conrad Eckhart Turkey and Egypt Total Population 34 million A federation of women's club has just been founded in each country. 
In all the Mohammedan countries, the wealthy woman lives in the harem with her slaves. The woman of the lower classes, however, is guarded or restricted no more than with us. Apparently, the Turkish and the Arabian women of the lower classes have an unrestrained existence, but because they are subject to the absolute authority of their husbands, their life is, in most cases, that of a beast of burden. They work hard and incessantly. For the Mohammedan of the lower classes, polygamy is economically a useful institution. Four women are four laborers that earn more than they consume. Domestic service offers working women in the Orient the broadest field of labor. The woman slaves in the harem are usually well treated and they have sufficient to live on. They associate with women shopkeepers, women dancers, midwives, hairdressers, manicurists, pedicures, etc. These are in the pay of the wives of the wealthy. Thanks to this army of spies, a Turkish woman is informed without leaving her harem or every step of her husband. The oppression that all women must endure and the general fear of the infidelity of husbands have created among Oriental women an esprit de corps that is unknown to European women. Among the upper classes, polygamy is being abolished because the country is impoverished and large estates has been squandered. Moreover, each wife is now demanding her own household, whereas formerly the wives all lived together. Through the influence of the European women educators, an emancipation movement has been started among the younger generation of women in Constantinople. Many fathers, often through vanity, have given their daughters a European education. Elementary schools, secondary schools, and technical schools have existed in Turkey and Egypt since 1839. The women graduates of these schools are now opposing Oriental marriage and life in the harem. At present, this is causing tragic conflicts. To the present, two Turkish women have spoken publicly at international congresses of women. Selma Riza, sister of the young Turkish general Ahmed Riza, spoke in Paris in 1900, and Mrs. Hairi Binaid spoke in Berlin in 1904. The Mohammedan women have a legal supporter of their demands in Qasim Amin Bey, Councillor of the Court of Appeals in Cairo. In his pamphlet of the women's rights question, he proposes the following program. Legal prohibition of polygamy. Woman's right to file a divorce suit. Hitherto, a woman is divorced if her husband, even without cause, says three times consecutively, you are divorced. Women's freedom to choose her husband. The training of women in independent thought and action. A thorough education for women. In 1910, a Congress of Mohammedan Women will be held in Cairo. I may add that the Koran, the Mohammedan Code of Laws, gives a married woman the full status of a legal person before the law and full civil ability. It recognizes separation of property as legal and grants the wife the right to control and to dispose of her property. Hence the Koran is more liberal than the Code Napoleon or the German Civil Code. Whether the restriction of the harem make the exercise of these rights impossible in practice, I am unable to say. European schools, as well as the newly founded Université Populaire, are in Turkey and in Egypt, the centers of enlightenment among the Mohammedans. The European women doctors in Constantinople, Alexandria, and Cairo are all disseminators of modern culture. 
a woman lawyer practices in the Cairo court and has been admitted to the lawyer society. The Young Turk movement and the reform of Turkey on a constitutional basis found hearty support among the women. They expressed themselves orally and in writing in favor of the liberal ideas. They spoke in public and held public meetings. They attempted to appear in public without veils and to attend the theater in order to see a patriotic play. They sent a delegation to the Young Turk Committee requesting the right to occupy the spectator's gallery in Parliament, and finally they organized the Women's Progress Society, which comprises women of all nationalities but concerns itself only with philanthropy and education. As a consequence, the government is said to have resolved to erect a humanistic gymnasium for girls in Constantinople. The leader of the Young Turks, the present president of the Chamber of Deputies, is, as a result of his long stay in Paris, naturally convinced of the superiority of harem life and legal polygamy when compared with Occidental practices. The freedom of action of the Mohammedan women, especially in the provinces, might be much hampered by traditional obstacles. Nevertheless, the restrictions placed on the Mohammedan woman have been abolished, as it proved by the following. In Constantinople, there has been founded a young Turkish woman's league that proposes to bring about the same great revolutionary changes in the intellectual life of women that have already been introduced into the political life of man. Knowledge and its benefits must in the future be made accessible to the Turkish women. This is to be done openly. Formerly, all strivings of the Turkish women were carried on in secret. The women revolutionists were anxiously guarded as far as possible. Information concerning their movements were secured before they left their homes. The Turkish women wished to prove that they, as well as the women of other countries, have human rights. When the constitution of the Young Turkish Women's League was being drawn up, and Fair Bay was present. He was thoroughly in favor of the demands of the new women's rights movement. The Young Turkish Women's League is under the protection of Princess Revia Sultana, daughter of the Sultan. Princess Revia, a young woman of 21 years of age, has striven since her 18th year to acquire a knowledge of the sciences. She speaks several languages. The enthusiasm of the young Turkish women is great. Many of them appear on the streets without veils, a thing that no prominent Turkish woman could do formerly. Women of all classes have joined the league. The committee daily receives requests for admission to membership. End of section 32 Read by Mama Chira, Tangerang Selatan